Good. Welcome. Uh, welcome to everyone. So, we have a special planning meeting today, <coughs> 23rd of March, and the first thing I want to do is to ask uh, if I could have authorisation to sign the minutes of the meeting of the 16th of March. Thank you. Thank you. Excuse me. Excuse me. Pass that over. Uh, so, uh, Louise, could we have apologies and substitutes, please? Thanks, Chair. Um, apologies received from Councillors Curtis, Mia, Norton and Prochak. Councillor um, John Barnes is substituting for Councillor Curtis and Councillor Cook for um, Councillor Norton. Where is Councillor? Where is Councillor Cook? She is online. Oh, she is right in front of me. I'm Morning, Councillor Cook. <laughs> Good morning, Councillor Van Hall. As long, uh, uh, just if, if for any reason I, you put your hand up, I don't see it, do yell at me. <laughs> okay, I will do. <laughs> okay. I don't believe we have any additional items and we don't have any withdrawn applications. Do we have any disclosures of interest today, please? Uh, yes, Councillor Jason. A member of Bessel Town Council, specifically the Planning and Development Advisory Committee. All right, thank I, you very much. Shall I, I was just going to carry on, because the Town Council has made representations on all three of these matters before us today. Uh, I am quite happy that I have not predetermined my decision. Good. Thank you very much for that. Any others? No others? Well, as you see, we have uh, three <coughs> applications on today, uh, and there's not a great change to the format of the meeting, but I'll just go through a couple of changes. I think we only have one speaker for the applications, that is the, um, uh, the applicant and, uh, represented by Sean Gulliver. Uh, for the second two applications, we have three against the application, and on the um, last one we have two. And I've had a discussion with, with those speakers, and the plan is this. They will come up and do their, the, 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 uh, their presentation, whatever they want to say in their five minutes, and then when each three have spoken, they will come up together to take questions as a group so that you know, we don't have a repeat of questions or, you know, or the right person answers the question. And I gave them the option of doing it the normal way or doing it this way, and they were quite happy to do that. So that's, that's what we'll do. Uh, and just to, to remind everyone to try and avoid asking those people who don't have the technical expertise questions that are of a technical nature, they can be reserved for the, for the officers but we'll certainly cover those off um, with, the, with the hope that I won't have brick bats thrown at me when I, when I say this or any other form of bat. Um, so there, there are two applications here which are allocated sites. So they are policies within the DASA. And we just need to remember that um, as a result of that, they are, there is a presumption in favour of development for those sites. They are allocated and... Our job as a committee for those applications specifically is more one of ensuring that they meet policy because if a, if, a, if a site is allocated, it's effectively a policy and it has a number of requirements. And if it's policy compliant, we have to take a positive view to approval. And you've seen a couple of examples over the last couple of years where uh, perhaps the committee has moved away from that without a substantially good enough reason uh, at considerable cost. So just keep that in mind when looking at those applications. You know, our, our job largely in those applications is to challenge officers to make sure that they are policy compliant or, or raise any other issues that you feel that, that haven't been uh, properly covered uh, by officers and, uh, and have them respond to those and determine whether they have responded appropriately. Uh, we did want to have a highways officer here today uh, uh, unfortunately, because of the short notice of the meeting, the, they, they couldn't supply an officer. There was a meeting with the officers, which I attended on, on Tuesday, with uh, two highways officers and uh, our legal representative, uh, uh, Kirsty Cameron, was, was at that meeting, as well as, well as ja Jasper e. Lyle, who you see on the screen, um, and, uh, and the, the planning officers to, to try and run through the, the many things that have been um, brought uh, to the um, planning application in the last week. Everyone received a fairly large pack of uh, responses from highways 
and uh, to really try and thrash out, and also uh, for me to sort of raise questions that, that, that I'd heard the committee raise you know, during the, the site visit to try and make sure that they were prepared to answer questions or uh, appropriately about, uh, about the highways aspects of these, because these are applications for, for access. And that's a really important thing to remember. These are for access only to establish that principle. And so the highways aspects of these are very important and all other matters are reserved. So whilst they're quite detailed in what's uh, been presented, they, we are considering access only, not the, the absolute detail. So if something says 250 houses, it might end up as 220 houses or whatever the figure is at some later time, or, or, or there could be other changes or other, other things that come up at reserve matters. Uh, so we just have to keep that in mind at, at all times. Uh, so that's quite a long introduction. And the other thing that, uh, the, the other element of today's applications, because these are three sites in North Bexhill and part of that whole North Bexhill uh, program, I've asked uh, Jeff Pyra to come along, who's sitting beside me here, who is the planning policy manager now. But before that, he was uh, manager for, the, for North Bexhill as, a, as the senior planner, team leader. I apologise if I... Don't quite get the, right? the exact title you had at that time, <coughs> right? And but, so he he has a very good understanding of of the whole of the the concept of North Bex Hill, and will be able to explain it. Now he'll do a short um, presentation on that, for, and I think it's okay to ask him some questions at this point. But I just ask you to ask questions which are specific to the whole concept, as opposed to the specific sites, if you like because we can, he can answer those questions as we go through the applications. So I'm sorry that's been a very long introduction, but I think just for the sake of, of trying to understand this, hopefully that will help. And uh, on that basis, I'm going to ask Jeff to speak. Did you, oh, you didn't want to say anything beforehand, Matthew, did you? No, Okay. It was, it was enough. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just waiting for some slides to be shown help me, but I want to talk you through uh, the local plan policy and, and its journey to, to adoption. So you'll know that the local plan is in two parts. We have a, a core strategy from 2014 and the development and site allocation plan from 2019, and they're both, they're both relevant to these applications. Um, so the core strategy, that, that, sets, that sets the targets for many things. It sets the targets for housing across the district, and it sets the targets for housing uh, across Bexhill. And that went through a process of consultation, it went through public examination and was, was adopted, adopted by the council. Uh, the, the number that it set for Bex Hill was 3,100 new dwellings from between 2011 and 2028. You can move on to the next slide, Matthew. Okay, so, that, so at that time, this was strategically, um, conceptually showing how these, these numbers would be delivered. So... The, 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 red, the, the, the big red dots on there, they show the Bexhill Hastings Link Road. Uh, and you might recall that, uh, that that was funded by the government and that funding was announced, I think, late 2012, maybe 2013. And before that, Bexhill was pretty much at, at capacity in terms of highways and no new big development would happen. So the government granted money for that road on the basis that it would deliver regeneration and growth. And at the time of the core strategy when this was published, it was, under, it was under construction. The land that's shown in orange, it, you might not be able to see, but that's northeast Bexhill, that had already been planned for through the 2006 local plan uh, for uh, around 1,300 dwellings, uh, significant amount of employment land, new school, <coughs> open space, and a new suburb effectively for Bexhill. And that was part of the uh, offer, I suppose, to the government in order to, to, fund, to fund the road. Uh, what I think that also shows is how, how difficult how Bexhill is. In terms, it's quite constrained in terms of opportunities for new development. You've got the sea to the south, so you can't have new development there. Uh, you've got the Pevensey Levels, which is the grey uh, vertical dash lines to the west. You've, got, you've also got Hastings to the east, and we've designated a country park there as a recreational area to, to uh, partly to, um, to allow more recreational areas because of growth in, in the district. So we're pretty limited. Uh, but what the core strategy put forward and recognised was there was an opportunity for further 
uh, new housing to the north of Sidley, so to the west of North East Bex Hill, and that's that yellow area that's shown on, on the diagram there, and it also showed a potential further area to the west in, in West Bex Hill. The, the smaller red dotted lines are additional distributor roads that it, that it proposed were necessary to open up uh, traffic from the lead. So the road that goes to the left, that goes to the top of North East Bex Hill and through the North Bex Hill yellow area, um, that became an application for the, what was called the North Bex Hill Access Road, NBAR, which you, you, those of you on committee will remember that. I was the planning officer for that application. Uh, sea Change Sussex developed that road, working with the county. They were able to um, gain funding in order, in order to deliver that road. And you might remember at the time, it was very much recognition that that road would help to open up this land this land for development and also, um, as I say, help to distribute that traffic. I remember at the time we talked about how that road was a distributor road. It was really for through traffic and to spread that through traffic around, around Bex Hill rather than a road for access for, for housing development. So that was the scene. Uh, if you go to the next scene, the next slide, please. So... Um, we commissioned consultants to help us understand that land better and whether, it, whether and how it should be allocated for housing. So you've got different colours on this map, but you've got the link road uh, in, in blue, and you hopefully can see the, the dashed, uh, the dashed the, uh, spaces either side of that is the northeast site. And then to the west of that, you've got a study area, which is the North Bex Hill site. So you can see it's north of Sidley. We were looking at land either side of the Ninfield Road, which is, which is the red the red road going to the top left of, of the picture. So it looked at that area, and you may be able to see on there, by that stage, the NBAR had been uh, granted permission, so the route of that road is also shown on that plan. So we looked at that, that wide area. We knew this was new greenfield development. It is agricultural land, but it's recognised that that was necessary in order to meet the housing targets. Um, and and the, the permission for the road and the, the building of the road changed that landscape. There's no doubt about that. You, know, you couldn't move through that before in the same way that you can with, with the road there. Next slide, please. So there was, there was, this looked at landscape and ecological issues. This diagram is a, is a summary of the um, conclusions on landscape capacity, the ability of this land to take change and to accept development. It was all considered to be of uh, moderate capacity on a sort of a national scale. So if it was a, had a high capacity for change, it would be a more urban area, probably less on the edge of the town. If it had a low capacity for change, it would be more rural, rural isolated. So it all had a moderate capacity, but had a different level of capacity. So the darker colour, the orange, showed a, a sort of a higher level of moderate capacity for, for, uh, for development. The mid-yellow, the mid-level, and the lighter yellow a lower level. So, that, so the lower level is to the north, closer to the edge of the study area, mainly and to, and to the west as well. Particularly worth looking at, there's um, the, the letters B and C, which you may or may not be able to see. I don't know if you can move your cursor, Matthew. You want. So that's the area to the west of Watermill Lane, and that's relevant because that, that's where the unallocated um, site proposal is B and C. B and C. Um, D is one of the allocated sites. Yes. So D is uh, B E X three B. Thank you. So that that, that land there is is B E X three B, which is one of the applications we're looking at. That's BEX3A, which is one of the other applications you're looking at. And the area there is where the land that wasn't allocated for housing at that time, that's the third application you're looking at today. Thank you. Um, so that's the landscape side. Ecologically, it, it was broadly similar in terms of its ecological value. It's, it's, agri it's agricultural land, mainly grazed, not that intensively. You know, there are hedges through that. There are areas of ancient woodland. Um, the most ecologically interesting and, and diverse is the valley, which sits in the, goes um, east-west in the middle of in the middle of the study area. Uh, that's got the most values and opportunities to increase uh, biodiversity in there and use it as a green corridor that connects connects across and also for amenity as well. And you, you'll see you'll see that later. 
that area B and C that we've talked about was recognised or considered at that point to be the most ecologically diverse, mainly because it's got a slightly smaller field structure. You can see there's more, maybe you can't see, but there, it's a slightly smaller field structure. There's more hedges, there's woodland to the north. It was being used less intensively for agriculture, so it was less improved grassland, so it had a higher biodiversity value. Not that that precluded development necessarily, but it was noted at that time it was a higher value. So if you go on to the next slide. So that led to these allocations being derived, which were proposed through the, the DASA, the Development and Site Allocations Plan, that went, went through public consultation, went through public examination, was adopted by this council in 2019. So that's the orange areas are the areas of proposed for housing. So in a similar way as, as you were shown before, it might help be helpful, thank you. The top left, the top left, uh, yeah, go on. The top left there is BEX3A, which we'll be looking at. You can see the orange area for housing. You can see a dark green, which is woodland to be retained. You can see a mid green, which is for, for sports facilities to serve all of the allocations. Uh, a bit more woodland. You've got the mint green, which goes east west across all the sites, which is a, um, identified as a place for a. a um, amenity area. You've got BX3B, which is off Watermill Lane and, and, and uh, to the rear of Mayo Lane, to be proposed for housing. And then you've got the 3C, which we're not looking at today, but it's the third parcel of land that was allocated at that time off water, to the Watermill Lane. You can see how all the housing is south of NBAR. So the NBAR, and this is explained in the, in the DASA, was considered to be a defensible boundary for development. Um, and that the, the development should sit, sit below, below that. Yep, and then we've got an area that wasn't allocated for housing at that time, because for the, the reasons I've explained, it was, it was similarly, uh, similar, had a similar landscape capacity in some of the other land, but it was slightly more biodiversity rich. It wasn't necessary to meet the housing targets in the core strategy uh, at, at that time, that could be met through these other three sites and allocations elsewhere, both in West Bexhill and within Bexhill. So at that time, uh, and I wasn't the policy manager then, but I remember this, and um, you can read about this in the court in the DASA. It was felt that it wasn't necessary to allocate that site, and it could be retained um, as agricultural land at that point. Things have shifted since then, as you know. The, the, the government's expectations and targets for housing have got much higher. The objectively assessed need figure that the government sets is much higher than we set in the core strategy. This puts a lot more pressure, pressure on us and, and tilts the balance in terms of, in terms of um, expectation for, for how we consider planning applications for housing. Uh, it also means our next local plan, which we're working on at the moment, will need to look for more land for housing. And we're going through a process of that at the moment, looking at as many sites as possible to understand their capacity and availability and suitability and looking at the other opportunities for sites, and I've shown you all that on the overall diagram, there's no doubt that that land is suitable for housing um, and much more suitable than, than other, other land in parts of the district, particularly taking in mind a large part of the district is in the A O and B and is in small uh, rural settlements which have less capacity and um, suitability for, for change if you're going to create a sustainable, sustainable district. Um, what was important as part of to be regeneration for the town was that, that those sites and the people who lived in, the, lived in those sites in the future feel part of Sidley and part of Bexhill. So you can see in, in blue near the bottom, that's Sidley town, town centre. So the, the expectation is that Watermill Lane would, add as the act, would act as the access for those sites, both for, uh, for, for vehicles and pedestrians and cycles, in order that people feel connected and are pulled into the town and part of it. Whilst if those accesses were on the edge and onto, onto N-Bar, then they wouldn't feel part of the town. They'd be quite isolated communities and they'd be likely to, more likely to drive off used cars and drive off to you know, Hastings um, Eastbourne. So it's very much about them focusing in and being pulled into the town. It was recognised, and you can see that in, in, the, in the policy um, text, that um, there would be there were challenges in terms of making uh, Watermill Lane work for, for all those different groups. And it was important that there would be um, a 
additional accesses for pedestrians and cyclists through through the site. So you could move through the site um, and in towards in towards Sidley and, and to the bus routes as well. If you want to the next one, I've got a few comments just on each individual site. So this is BEX3A, which is the one closest to Ninfield Road, closest to the roundabout. This site does propose an access off uh, N bar, and you can see that top there's a dotted line in from the top. When that was looked at in more detail, it, it was it just wasn't possible to provide an access through onto Ninfield Road to the south for vehicles. It isn't considered appropriate to link this with the other orange sites that you've seen because of the um, we want to keep vehicles away from the uh, amenity land and the most ecologically diverse along the, on the, along the river valley, plus there's bits of woodland, as you can see on there, that sort of contain this site. So the proposal is that the, um, that the <coughs> access could be off Envir on this site, but this site is closest, because it's close to the roundabout, it still is going to feel more connected in, into Sidley. Uh, and that's partly about design. So we, I'd expect that in the future, we're not looking at this today, but the houses around, around the edge of this site would be outward facing and it would be setting an, an urban style edge to Bexhill. So this would feel connected in that sense into, into, into Sidley and Bexhill as a whole. Um, next slide. So this is, this is uh, BEX3B. This is the land behind Mayo Lane. The expectation here was that the access would be off Watermill Lane, as you can see in that bottom corner, and it was recognised that would require some uh, careful design in, in order to make that access work and also to allow pedestrian and cycle access up Watermill Lane into Sidley. And you might see it on here, but there's a, there's a dotted line shown parallel to the, to the, to the bend on Watermill Lane to, to highlight that necessity and that applications would need to demonstrate that pedestrian and cycle access as well as vehicle access could be achieved. And you can see it shows uh, there wouldn't be housing at the north of that <coughs> site closest to, the, closest to the stream to allow that connection between the sites. And then if you go to the, the next one. So you're not looking at this site today, but this is the third of those three sites. And although they have three separate allocations because they're sort of distinct, there's one overriding policy, BEX3, to guide the development on these sites because it's, it's important that overall these feel like a connected community and they feel like a, an addition and a connection to Sidley. So there's overall policy criteria, which, which, which Matthew and Peter will talk through later, um, to in order that these sites are considered as a whole, are connected as a whole through, through uh, pedestrian cycle movement and, and, green, and green corridors. So it's, and it's worth bearing that in mind because that, that site is also proposed to access onto Watermill Lane in the future. Uh, and if you look at, look at the policy, it explains why it wouldn't be appropriate for that site to access onto the end bar because it talks about that being creating an isolated community would, feel, would not feel part of Bexhill at all. It would feel very separate. Um, also on this, the, the unallocated site, the third application you're considering today, that's the land the left to the west of Watermill Lane to the, to the west of this site. Um, in my view, I think I'm pretty sure this is what it says in the, recommend, in the advice, is that because the, the applicant is proposing this site as well, uh, it should be considered as part of the overall North Bexhill allocations, the North Bexhill community, uh, and the same conditions and policy expectations should, be, should apply. So it should also provide uh, the Amenity Wildlife Corridor East-West. Its access should be on to, to Watermill Lane and it should provide that connectivity for cyclists and pedestrians um, and, and, and access to bus routes as well. So that, there's a lot of challenges there. There's a lot of expectation for these policies. But it was recognised at the time what these challenges were and overall it was considered that these sites needed to, to be developed and should be developed and could be developed successfully as, as a new community uh, north of Bexhill to respond to the need for additional housing, affordable housing, of course, um, and for the regeneration of Sidley and Bexhill as a whole. So that's my overview. Thank you very much for that, Jeff. Um, so as I said, just some questions which 
to Jeff, which deal with the overall rather than the specific applications. Yes, <coughs> Councillor Gray. Thank you, Chair. Um, Jeff, one of the many things that worries me is the lack of infrastructure. As you know, Councillor Maidley and I are the ward councillors for um, Old Town and Walsham. Um, can I just take you to the DASA um, page 118, <coughs> um, paragraph 9.10? Are you there? Yes. Uh, towards the end of that paragraph, it says a mixed development providing 1,050 dwellings and associated facilities, including a primary school based on Warsham Farm. Well, I know the houses are all there because, you know, it's part of my ward. I've yet to see a primary school. Uh, well, I mean, at the moment, they're only, all... they're only they're on the first phase of development there. So the whole site has got an outline planning permission that's still, that's still live, and that permission plans for around 1,050 houses uh, and, and, the, and the primary school. And it's, it's controlled by a legal agreement, Section 106, and um, the trigger for the... So the, the, the applicant has to release the school site to the county once 350 houses are, are built and occupied. That's 350 out of the total of over 1,000. <coughs> That was the advice and through discussions with the county because if the school was built too early, it would, it would, it would, it would, they advised it would fill up with people from elsewhere, children from elsewhere. If it goes in too late, then, yeah, you've got lots of housing and no school. So it was planned to come forward partway through the development. So uh, when they finish this first phase, 200 dwellings will have been built. Uh, the second phase is also around 200 dwellings, which there's an application in at the moment. So... When they move forward and build that phase out as well, when, it, when they get to 350, they will provide the school site, and it has to be a service ready to go plot, and then uh, it will be over to the county to deliver the school. So it has been properly planned for. It's, it's all taking a lot longer than we all hoped, and I think the developer hoped. The developer expected the whole site would be built out by 2023 with the school, but it's moved a lot more slowly. You know, we can all blame COVID perhaps and other things, but it is it is ongoing and. As you can see, it's only the first phase of housing currently being built. Sorry, Jeff. Can I just add the other thing, as you know, that worries me is these houses are totally unsustainable. There's no water capture. There's no solar panels. There's, they've got gas boilers. Can, can we be assured that the new houses will be much more sustainable? Yeah, we're, not, we're not into the detail on, on, on that. Yeah, and as, as you know, I'm more than anyone want, want us to be building houses sustainably. We're looking to, to do that through our new, our new local plan. What we are seeing, uh, and, and I know from the discuss, discussions with the applicant at North East Bexhill, is that because of um, increasing building regs, because of the, the increasing mainstream media understanding and response and need to respond to the climate emergency, the market wanting to buy houses that are more sustainable, the next phases will certainly be um, a lot more sustainable features than they're currently building. And they've, they've certainly said in um, uh, and, and informally that they won't be putting gas, gas boilers in the new houses. And I, I'm, and I'm sure when, by the time we get to the point when these houses would come forward, we'd be, they'd be far more sustainable in that sense than currently. But, you know, we rely on the government as much as ourselves in order to ensure those standards are as high as possible. Uh, Depending on, it depends, you know, assuming these, these are approved and reserve matters come forward, it really would depend when those reserve <coughs> matters came forward. Depending on when, how it's judged against the current local plan or the next local plan. Uh, uh, Mary Barnes. Yes, thank you. Actually, Councillor Gray has beat me to it because I was going to ask about the school. But is there a forward plan for the impact of this on Bex Hill, given that you want to see a, a, um, a link between the new development and Bexhill, uh, is there going to, uh, have you taken into account that there could be um, an impact on Bexhill itself? Impact on what, everything? Um, particularly things like parking, enough shops, are there plans for um, a, a new um, uh, commercial centres? Um, uh, all the sort of infrastructure that goes um, with the building of a huge new estate. Yes, I mean, absolutely. I mean, that, 
the, the plan has to do that. When it proposes numbers and sets out the concepts, it has, has to demonstrate that it meets those issues. It has, has to consult with all the, the right consultees. So from a school's point of view, whilst the new school is expected to be at North East Bex Hill, it's, it's, uh, it's also serving the North... I mean, it's, it, it's providing enough capacity for the whole of Bex Hill, including all the other developments that were being considered at, at North and West, West Bex Hill. Um, yeah, so, you know, the marginal powers at North East Bex Hill to fill that school... So that, that would be its location, but it, it adds more than, more than enough capacity for all the development that was proposed through the core strategy. Can I just, it, it's not just talking about it, it's actually making certain that it's done. Do we have a, a forward plan? Well, the, it, the county has the forward planning on schools, and, it, and, it, and it's, it's, its job is to provide schools in relation to plan for development, and we, we do talk to them regularly, and that, that's for them to deliver. But we've set that up through the planning process in terms of ensuring that a site has got permission and it has to be released to the county. Uh, in terms of doctors, I, I definitely recall they were consulted as well in terms of uh, what was necessary. Uh, they didn't put forward, they, they, they didn't advise that there was a need for further doctor surgeries in response to the amount of development we, we were planning in the core strategy. Uh, How is it? Um, traffic's obviously a very big issue. Uh, and um, we had to have the uh, agreement, acceptance, the no objection from, from National Highways. And they were one of the last objectors in terms of, in terms of our DASA, in terms of the development. Um, and they had concerns about whether, they, at first, they had concerns about whether the uh, amount of traffic that was generated by all the development could be accommodated, uh, particularly uh, there's a common roundabout, uh, the... Um, the junction at the bottom of the link road where the um, leisure centre site is and, and, and the Ravenside site as well. Uh, but over, but, but by when the DASA went to examination, they were confident that it could be delivered because of uh, improvements to those junctions that were recognised could be delivered. And I'm sure Matthew will talk about this later, but National Highways, through these applications, are requiring additional works to the um, leisure centre link road junction which were planned for through the DASA in order to ensure that there's sufficient highway capacity in the town. Uh, John Barnes, yeah. Yes, I've, I've, it's very difficult approaching this when all you have in front of you is access. Um, because the crucial questions around this, uh, some of them, as uh, Councillor Graham, my wife, have already outlined around infrastructure. I'm less worried about the education one because um, <coughs> you're absolutely right. <laughs> a house produces about 0.2 of a child spread over all the years of education. You don't want to build your school too soon or it simply won't be large enough or it'll draw people in uh, from a much wider area and then when you need it uh, the places aren't there. So I, I think so long as the school site is allocated and there is an absolute binding condition that it's made available to county at the right time, that one's okay. The one which always gets neglected to my mind, and I speak as a former chairman of the PCT, um, is health. Uh, because everybody in the house is going to need the health service at one time or another. And I cannot see with the stretch on the medical facilities in Bexhill, uh, that this has been properly addressed in the infrastructure. The other thing that worries me, and I speak as somebody who used to use Watermill Lane to access Bexhill uh, quite a lot, is uh, that road really was not built for traffic. Uh, I, I think, John, I, I think we've got a... We'll deal with the highways issues with the applications. Uh, yes, but I'm making a general point um, in relation to the overall planning. In terms of the overall planning of this, um, given we want Sydney to become the host community, was anything put into the plan about the improvement of the existing lane? And is it possible? I mean, yeah, it's pro it probably needs to look at that in terms of detail of the applications, but yeah, it's, as, as I've said, it was, it was recognised through, the, through the, the, the 
policies in, in the plan that um, changes in works will be required to Watermill Lane to ensure it could work with, with, the, with the development. And it's, it sets some expectations for that, which will be talked through in terms of, in terms of the app applications itself. Um, of course, the big, big, big change to Watermill Lane, it was a, it was a through road, and an end bar cut, cut it off, it became a cul-de-sac. But that, you know, and at the moment, it, it's fantastic. It's, you know, it's, it's a lovely place because it doesn't have any through traffic. But part of the reason for that happening was, was for this reason, was because it, you know, it, it was, the area was going to change and it would be the access for future development. That was what was planned. I just, and just an overall point, I'm happy to answer questions about the infrastructure needs and all those issues, but you know, those decisions were, were made, and you know when when the plan was adopted, you know that that work was done, and it and the plan was adopted, and there's no point us interrogating whether that was the right decisions or not. And I'm not, I think it is the right decision, by the way. I'm not saying it isn't, but there's no point interrogating that because those decisions have been made, the sites have been allocated, the principle of development has been established. There's no doubt about that, and nothing has changed in that reason. So really, you know. It's about whether these applications, which, are, as you say, are purely for access at this stage, which is difficult, you know, that's planning for you, but it's about access. So it's moving on one step, really, from principle of development to is the access acceptable in relation to those policies that have, have been set. So we shouldn't be interrogating the policy background. We should be interrogating whether the applications meet that policy framework. Thank, uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, Councillor Ganley. Chairman, actually, since putting my hand up, uh, uh, Jeff and the other speakers have addressed some of the issues that I, I wanted to speak about, about infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> I'm surprised, though, that you say that the doctors reckon that they won't need any additional doctors, ad additional number of doctors in there, uh, when we're talking about several thousand new residents in, t in time with 3,100 dwellings, there's going to be thousands of new residents, literally. Uh, I've said that, and, you know, I'm saying these in quite short, shortcut sort of ways, but there was no identified need uh, for allocating additional doctor surgeries to meet the amount of development that was being planned, planned for. And I think there already have been changes in terms of the doctors, hasn't there? There's a new doctor surgery, I'm not sure it's open yet, on, on, on Beaching Road. You know, there, there are changes. Hebsham was oversized when it was built to meet expectations for housing that have been expected to happen there for many, many years. But as I say, those are decisions that uh, have been made and these sites that are allocated. This, this is the, the challenge of uh, allocated sites within a policy, an examined policy document, which are, can be quite unpalatable when they come to planning committee and things, time has moved on and you can see things have changed, but you can't really change plan or the, the policy, you know, and, and we've, we've met these unpalatable decisions before uh, where you can see things aren't quite right, but you're, you, know, you know that they won't um, succeed on that <coughs> basis in an appeal situation. Uh, Councillor Errington. Very quickly, Havenbrook Avenue, has that been adopted by East Sussex Highways? No, not yet. I, I, I'm, I'm going to say a bit more. Uh, it's a short question. Just, uh, got well, no, well, just just, just to highlight. I mean, I, if you've got, you may have concerns about that. But um, the Gateway Street, which goes the other way from the same same roundabout that was also um, uh, constructed by Sea Change Sussex, that is now adopted. It took a very long time for it to become adopted. It wasn't adopted when the North East Bexhill applications were considered. When that outline permission outline application came to committee. Uh, but you know, that, that shouldn't affect the consideration on this. Um, it, 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 was, it has been adopted and that allows that connection. But even if it's not adopted, connections can still take place. It's just that the, the, the risk, the liability currently sits with Sea Change Sussex as the owner of that road rather than the county. But it will be adopted and those discussions are, um, are ongoing between Sea Change and the county. Okay. So I think um, Jeff will be here, so it will still be available to answer questions if the, uh, uh, if the, the uh, planning officer can't. You know, sort of swap, swap seats, eh? All right, good day. Uh, so we're going to move on to the first application, which is uh, Kaitai Farm, and that's uh, 2022 
2364 stroke P. Uh, and I'm going to ask the uh, planning officer, uh, Matt Worsley, to take us through that. And then we have uh, the uh, representative from the applicant uh, here to speak about that whenever you're ready. Morning. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for, this, for taking this as a special planning committee. That has been appreciated. Um, we have been in dialogue with the applicant through a PPA for the last several months, which is a joint PPA with the county to resolve the issues. Um, and I think it's important to understand that as case officers, Matthew and I have looked both at the collective sites because there is an overriding policy regarding cumulative impact. So we've had to look at the sites collectively, including for the potential bringing forward of site 3C, which is not here for determination, but it has an impact on the overall policy and the, the local surrounds. And then we've had to look at each individual site. And I think that has framed the way we have set up the process of our planning uh, assessment. Um, I think it's important to note two things. One, as the chair has noted, it is an outline planning application, but that doesn't mean that we haven't drilled down into the detail because you can only really understand an outline if you understand the nature of development. So while you are asked to determine on an outline application, we have worked with both the applicant and statutory consultees to understand the nature of the detail. Um, and it's important to note that it is a land promotion agreement, so there are conditions to ensure that the delivery is included within the outline recommendations, uh, because this is ultimately about addressing a housing shortage and the, la the land supply issue. So we, uh, if I may, just take you through our planning assessment process, because it is both at the big picture and then dropping down to the detail level. Um, we're going to do a twin act if I just effectively take through the broad assessment and then Matthew will drop down into the detail of each application in terms of what you've been asked to determine in terms of the outline. Um, in terms of our assessment, it is a stepped process of looking at, as Jeff noted, is the application, I collectively and individually, is it in according with planning policy? Um, as you know, you have heard, two sites have been allocated. One has not been allocated, but we would argue that the reasons why that site has, wasn't allocated originally, um, and in light of further discussions, we believe that it could come forward as a site for development, as Jeff has indicated. Um, it is important to note that we do not have a five-year land supply issue. And therefore, in terms of the bigger picture of determination, we need significant reason to refuse the scheme because that could be challenged in terms of the land supply issue. As two sites have been allocated, the presumption in favour of development stands, and that's important in terms of any challenge to a decision made today. Um, it is reasonable to assume that the unallocated site uh, which we've called Windmill Lane, the applicant, or Watermill Lane, sorry, uh, by the applicant, um, while it is unallocated, would fit within the intent of the policy BEX3, which is the cumulative policy. So we have taken our deliberations in terms of that overriding policy. That position has been accepted by the applicant, which has made our determination a lot easier. Um, we have no objection or originally the original objection from Highways England regarding <coughs> BEX 3A, the one that takes access off the end bar, has been removed. We have no statutory consultee objections to any of the applications. Um, we need to note, as again, in terms of future assessment, BEX 3A, or 3C, which is about 120 units, will have an impact on the lane and again, we've taken that in our determination. So in terms of planning, we feel confident that it accords with planning policy, both collectively and individually. 
In terms of the highways issues, we've had detailed consultations with um, East Sussex County County Highways. Um, in terms of the uh, policy requirements of taking access, and I think it's important that too often when we use the word access, we only talk about vehicular access, and the policy requires of us that we see access in the broader sense of vehicle, pedestrian, and cycling accessibility. And in that case, the policy and the outline applications accord with policy in providing access of Watermill Lane, Mayo Lane, and pedestrian access of Mayo Rise. Further than that, there is a proposal for a network of pedestrian and cycling routes that would connect the three sites and the broader environment collectively. And that accessibility doesn't just stop at the river, it goes to identified bus stops or future bus stops to promote that modal shift and sustainability or sustainable development that we are obliged to deliver. Um, in terms of Watermill Lane, um, we are very, very conscious that it's, the, it's quite a narrow lane. It's a charming lane. There are ancient woodlands abutting the site, um, and that has created restrictions. But we have to divorce ourselves from what the policy is allowing for the applicant, which is that these sites take access off that lane, and what is physically actually able to be delivered on that lane. We have worked with the applicant and with the county to come up with a, a, a solution to all those three sites that take access off that. Um, we have to accept it is a compromised solution for vehicles. And for that very reason, we have worked particularly hard to ensure that there is absolute safety addressed in terms of pedestrian and cycle movement between these sites. And therefore, you'll see on the... On the um, the development framework plan, which is just illustrative, that there are links across 3B to access the, um, uh, the Mayo Rise and onto Ninfield Road, so that pedestrian movement goes through the sites and doesn't necessarily have to take access along the lane and Mayo Lane itself. So we'll try to create that shift to ensure safety. And the applicant has worked hard in order to try and deliver those aspects of that requirement. Um, we note that um, the applicant has further given commitments as part of the discussions to improve bus stops and links to bus stops, including crossings at roads, providing bus stops, etc. So that that whole remit of accessibility doesn't mean that you walk to a point where there's a flagpole and you wait in the rain. It is about really creating that modal shift and a comfortable alternative to using a private car. We've worked very hard to ensure that our remit of sustainable development is actually addressed in each of these outline applications. Um, we have created a travel plan which has been endorsed by the county, which sets further requirements in terms of sustainable transport options, including a car sharing scheme, bicycle vouchers, um, pro providing bicycle sheds, etc., so that alternative form of mobility is convenient and attractive. Um, we also need to note from our discussions with the county and yesterday's discussions that the county acknowledges that there are compromises solutions in terms of Windmill Lane, but they have no further objections and are supportive of the scheme as tabled. In terms of the next part of our uh, assessment, we've looked at landscape setting and the environmental issues. Um, all applications, collectively and individually, they make ecological, landscape, and suds contributions. They enhance the natural habitat of the stream and the surrounding areas. They have a long-term commitment in terms of the ancient woodlands and creating management strategies to those various areas. In terms of their um, biodiversity net gain, they comply with what we would require from these sites. Um, and we would argue that the change to the setting was accepted in planning policy and therefore is compliant. Addressing all of those various aspects, we then need to look at the weight of, of the, the three schemes in terms of an assessment of harm against collective benefit. Um, we acknowledge that the harm to setting and the increase of traffic to the local area is identified and is accepted in the allocation and the planning policy originally set against which the applicant is addressing the outline application. 
We acknowledge that there is an impact on Mayo Lane and that significant optioneering aspects have been tabled and discussed with the county in order to try and minimise that as a rat run to the scheme um, and encouraging alternatives in both pedestrian movement through the site and possible changes to Mayo Lane itself in order to prevent that rat running occurring. Um, against that, and we need to then weigh up the benefits of the scheme, it's delivering in terms of planning policy, circa 400 units, that generates local investment, it adds to the social and economic benefits of the scheme, both primary, secondary and induced in terms of income and investment in the area and local employment. It gives affordable housing in compliance with policy and it makes a significant contribution to the housing land supply case that we currently have to address in terms of planning policy, that we do not have a sufficient land supply. Um, further to policy, um, there is a delivery either through the land or financial contributions to the outdoor sports facilities. It's undefined what those are in policy, but the applicant has committed, and we've got an indicative plan that you might have seen, indicating the possibility of sports fields, a clubhouse and others. That was done simply to show the possibilities of the site, but that is further for, for, for reserved matters. But there is an allocation of funding to bring forward that outdoor facility. In terms of Councillor Barnes's comment, I believe that bringing forward sporting facilities is part of well-being, as part of that social infrastructure, and we've worked hard with the applicant to ensure that something comes forward on that site. Um, the applicant has addressed all the requirements set in the three policies and in the overriding policy of BEX3. We have worked with the applicant currently to set out the conditions and we are looking at the section 106. This has been informed by discussions with the county um, and we would be very in a very strong position to effectively engross those with the applicant going forward. Um, we note that, and it, it is a bittersweet point, but I think it's worth pointing out that we have, with the applicant, gone through a public inquiry on Friot's Way. Um, I think there were mutual lessons to be learned from that in terms of challenge. That has informed our working with the applicant in a very constructive manner, and um, it has in agreement that it will be a tight program of delivery to ensure that this is taken forward, because we do need housing and investment in Rother. And on that basis, we feel that it complies with policy and our requirements in terms of the determination. Um, I'm going to hand over to Matthew now to take each site forward individually to show at a more detailed level, in terms of the outline planning application, how we've de determined our uh, recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. So the first site for consideration is the BEX 3A allocation, which um, is to the west, west side of the sites, all of the sites. Um, you will note from this site plan that not all of the allocated land is included. Um, on the far west side, um, there's a semicircular piece of land that is excluded. This is in separate ownership and is subject to a separate application um, for 32 houses. However, the proposal before us does, does include housing up to 250, which is the allocation. Um, we've got to acknowledge that um, adding the smaller site on that would take us to just over 280 houses, which is um, a bit above the, the, the allocation. Um, however, this is in outline only, and the description of development is up to 250. So um, the indicative plans show one possible layout. Um, 
but that is subject to change and further consideration at Reserve Matters stage. Um, what we, the detail that we're looking at in this application really relates to the access, um, and we have got plans um, that I'm going to show you relating to that. Um, in terms of the infrastructure policy, so BEX 3, um, which applies to all of these sites, we've obviously consulted with statutory <coughs> consultees, Southern Water, the Lead Local Flood Authority, um, the Environment Agency, County Ecologist. All of them raise no objection subject to appropriate conditions. Um, in terms of infrastructure like drainage, foul sewage, Southern Water acknowledge there is a requirement to upgrade. Um, but that, that requires further work between them and the developer um, to provide upgrade works. Um, how, how that works usually is that they allow a certain number of houses to connect and then there will be a trigger point where they provide um, extra capacity or improvement works. Foul drainage, um, there is an overall strategy for the site, um, being informed by monitoring, groundwater monitoring and the like. Um, as with most um, sites in Rodda, infiltration isn't going to be possible here, um, or very, very unlikely. Um, however, we have got a stream um, to the south of the site, which is suitable to take. Um, surface water um, that would be uh, accommodated by suds um, so uh, sustainable um, drainage systems um, yeah pollution would be prevented from entering it entering the stream um, and flow rates would also be controlled so they'd be, be be limited to the greenfield rate but that's that will be subject to further detail um, uh, reserve matter stage. However, we are suggesting a condition. Um, another part of the infrastructure policy is um, the highway issues. Um, so it's acknowledged that providing these additional houses will put additional traffic onto the road network. Um, in terms of the strategic road network, so the A259, um, I think it's probably all conscious that it's near capacity um, and improvements are required at um, various junctions. In terms of Bex, the BEX3A allocation, um, National Highways, who are in charge of the strategic road network, um, they, they required the applicant to do more um, modelling work and uh, research into what um, improvements were required. The applicant's done that during the course of the application um, and came back with an improvement scheme to the, the um, A259 junction by Bexhill Leisure Centre. So um, I've got a plan to show you on that later on, but just briefly, um, it's going to provide a lane to eastbound traffic going up the North Bexhill, uh, sorry, the Link Road. Um, so instead of queuing at the lights now, there will be a separate lane that goes around which will relieve some pressure at that junction. Um, moving on from the highway stuff, um, also on, on, under infrastructure is this network, green network corridor, which I think is, um, well, it is shown on this overarching development framework plan. So BEX, BEX 3A is to the left-hand side. To the south, you can see more or less through the centre of the site, this green corridor where the stream is. Um, you've got hedges, trees. Um, on BEX 3A to the northeast, there is an area of ancient woodland, um, a wooded area, a large wildlife area is indicated um, to the north of the um, sports facilities. Um, you can probably just about make out that 
the three small pitches indicated on the plan, but that is indicative only. Um, so o overall, in terms of the infrastructure policy, we've got, um, we, we feel there is a potential to provide this green, green corridor. County Ecologist is okay with, with this approach. And conditions and legal um, planning obligations would be required to provide it and um, future maintenance of ancient woodland and the like. Link to um, the Green Corridor, I would say, is also the accessibility um, improvement. So at the moment, there is a public footpath that um, runs through the centre of the site. Um, I don't know if any of you have walked it, but it is it's uneven. Um, uh, yeah, quite, quite poor access at the moment, narrow in places. Um, and as, as part of this application and the others, um, significant improvements are proposed. Um, again, highways and footpaths officer have been consulted the county. They're on board with it in broad terms um, and are recommending conditions. Um, lead, uh, Section 106 contributions to fund upgrade works and there's a bridge as well, um, which crosses the stream, future maintenance of the bridge. So, again, that, that will be secured by a legal agreement, which the developers, um, we're in discussions with, but we're, you know, there's broad agreement to, to, to that. So, moving on to the BETS 3A policy, um, there are criteria-based policy whereby a certain number of houses, so 250 houses are proposed, 30% have to be affordable. Um, that, that is all proposed, um, including affordable, which would be secured by legal agreement. Um, some, some of the requirements are repeated. Um, in terms of biodiversity and stuff, and it refers back to the infrastructure policy. But I think of most, the focus for this application probably is the access, which um, I am going to move on to. So access for BEX 3A is to the north, northeast of the site. <coughs> um, those of you at the site visit, um, will recall there's the current agricultural access um, in the position of the proposed formal vehicular access, um, which is a good marker. Um, so that's the only vehicular access for the site. Pedestrian and cycle access, we've got um, a few, well, there are, there are accesses surrounding the site. So there's one at the the western end um, going on to the North Beck Hill access road. So that's a pedestrian. Oh, yeah, thank you, Peter. So that's the vehicular access. If we move west, indicative uh, and up, um, there will be another pedestrian access in, in that corner going north. Um, to the south, so southwest, um, there's the existing footpath, and there will be upgrades to that, including the bridge. Um, and that the footpath will lead through the valley towards Watermill Lane and link in with the 3B allocation site. So moving into more detail on the vehicular access. This... Um, Got, you've got an access here proposed for 5.5 metres in width. It will be set back from the road slightly in terms of the existing setup. You've got, um, at the moment, you've got fencing proposed, but that would be removed. Um, this Diagram, although it's a larger, well, smaller scale, sorry, um, it does 
include visibility displays on it. So the pink, purple lines show 120 metre visibility displays, which is the requirement for this, this road. Um, I seem to recall some concerns were raised about visibility in the dip to the east on site. Um, I have revisited that and taken measurements from our mapping system. Um, and the lowest part of the dip is around 200 metres away to the east. That's where it gets lowest. I don't know if any of you recall, there's, a set, there's another sort of agricultural access. That's around... 200 metres away, um, which is far beyond the required visibility. Um, if you, it, the, the pink line you see here is towards the end line with the end of the woodwork. If you, if you stand there, you can clearly see the, clearly see the proposed access. Um, on top of that, Highways, the highways officer from county has visited the site, made observations um, and had no concerns over this access. Um, so they're happy with the provision of this subject to conditions about construction, provision of visibility displays, um, the actual setup of the width um, and the radiuses and things. Um, which is positive, and we, we, we are, uh, yeah, Robber officers are of the same view as highways, that this is an appropriate and safe access, um, safe for vehicles, pedestrians, and cyclists. And in terms of cyclists, you'll see, well, possibly not, but there is an annotation on this plan um, that provides visibility space for, to see, cycles um, travelling on the footpath. And another point on cyclists, which I think is very important in terms of, um, well, modal shift and encouraging people to use bikes, public tra transport and um, the like, this gives priority to cyclists. There's actually a stop. There will be road markings there that require vehicles to stop, um, and that gives cyclists the right of way, which I think is an important, important point to note. So this is the final slide, um, and this is the junction by the leisure centre on the A259, which I mentioned earlier. So... Part of this proposal, the junction is route <coughs> will provide a separate lane um, to join <coughs> with the um, link road, and that that should thank you that should um, improve well improve the queuing at this junction um, and yeah given the improved capacity. So, um, Peter, Peter did um, provide a very useful summary of the process we've been through. Hopefully my presentations address some of the detail. Um, but, yeah, as always, um, feel free to ask questions. Are we, are um, are we going through the other applications? No. Okay. We'll, we'll have the um, applicant first to, to speak and then the board members. Uh, we have the applicant first and we'll have... Questions, yeah? Sean Gulliver, yeah? Well, coming forward. Thank you very much. Patiently waiting. <laughs> Speaking for the applicant. 
have five minutes time. I'm sure you're probably quite used to these sort of presentations. So, and then the um, committee can ask you questions after that. And uh, you just yes, you have to remember to turn it on and off when you're speaking or not speaking. Otherwise, the camera won't move to you. Whenever you're ready. <coughs> Thank you very much. Good morning, members. My name is Sean Gulliver, and I am a planning manager at Gladman. Um, I'd like to start by thanking you for the chance to speak in support of the application today. And I would also like to thank officers for their invaluable input into this application and their professional consideration of it. As you know, the application site forms the lion's share of the site allocated under policy BEX 3A for the development of some 250 dwellings, including 30% affordable housing. The delivery of the allocated sites in North Bex Hill is recognised in the Council's recent housing land supply report as key to significantly boosting housing supply and delivery in the district, which currently suffers from a chronic five-year housing land supply shortfall. As set out in the officer's report, and as explained by Peter previously, there are no objections to the application from statutory consultees. We have li liaised extensively with the local highway authority, and they are satisfied that the proposed site access arrangements from Havenbrook Avenue are safe and suitable for the development proposed. County highways and national highways have also comprehensively assessed the effects of the proposals on junction capacity and performance in the wider settlement, concluding that they would not have an unacceptable impact on the operation of the local highway network when considered alongside other developments. Overall, the proposals are not deemed to give rise to any highways-related harms subject to conditions. Regarding other matters, the Lead Local Flood Authority has stated that subject to conditions, it does not object to the proposals on drainage and flooding grounds, and there are also no objections from consultees in respect of landscape, heritage, archaeology or ecology. Whilst currently submitted in outline form, future detailed applications will provide the Council with a mechanism to secure appropriate levels of amenity for existing and future residents and comfort that an appropriate scale, mix and layout of homes will be achieved. Our proposals include a plethora of benefits for both new and existing residents in North Bexhill, including improvements to public right-of-way 56 and the existing track to Kitai Farm, as well as improvements to two existing bus stops on Ninfield Road. A pedestrian crossing point will also be introduced to improve connectivity to the bus stops from the northern side of Ninfield Road. A particular benefit of the proposed scheme is the provision of land for outdoor sports facilities as required by BEX 3A. Sports facilities are just one element of substantial green infrastructure provision, including public open space, a children's play area, recreational routes through the site, and the enhancement of existing trees and hedgerows to create important wildlife corridors and green connections through the site. Other benefits of the proposals include a commitment to providing each household with a cycle voucher to be spent locally, a financial contribution of circa £92,000 towards a fully serviced eight-vehicle electric vehicle car club scheme, and charging facilities for electric vehicles on all properties. These measures support the Council's pledge to become carbon neutral by 2030. The provision of a substantial amount of green infrastructure will also offer mitigation against climate change and the development would be delivered to achieve the relevant building regulations. New housing would lead to the creation of jobs <coughs> during the construction phase of the development and increased expenditure within and patronage for local services. Based on census data and official labour market statistics, we estimate that the development would create around 500 direct and indirect jobs in construction and related industries. In further support of job creation and growth, we have also offered a financial contribution of around £50,000 towards the Council's input, support and monitoring of a local employment and skills plan, which will enable a coordinated approach to achieving the best employment and training outputs from the development for the local community. Given the extent of collaboration with officers, both from Rother District Council and East Sussex County Council, and the comprehensive suite of evidence that has informed our application, we have the utmost confidence that the plans before you are deliverable, and we have agreed to conditions that require future applications to accord with the principles set out in this submission. Should you resolve to grant planning permission for this application, it is our intention to make swift progress with the completion of a Section 106 agreement to secure the developer contributions and obligations set out in Draft one, Section 106 <coughs> terms. This would ensure that the development of the site would be accompanied by proportionate mitigation for any impacts of the proposals on local services and facilities, many of which I have just spoken about. The application proposals represent sustainable development and the principle of development has been established through the allocation of the site. 
Officers have carefully considered all relevant technical matters and concluded that there are no unacceptable impacts or harms that would justify withholding <coughs> permission on this allocated site. We have worked collaborative, collaboratively with officers to bring you this application today and fully endorse their recommendation and hope you can too. Thank you. Practice down to the second. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, knew, I knew that would be the case. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm sure there are going to be questions for you, so I open the floor to some questions. Yes, Councillor Gray. Thank you very much. Um, I don't think I misheard you. I think you said that this would help the council reach its aim of carbon neutral by 2030. So my question is, how does building 250 houses help us to become carbon neutral? I think Jeff um, covered this quite well during his presentation during the, the beginning of this um, meeting. Um, I think, obviously, you've got new building regulations coming in, into play. The government are really raising standards in terms of sustainability of the, of the housing. Um, so all new houses, and all new houses, as I said, would have electric vehicle charging points um, and more detailed measures to ensure sustainability would be secured at reserve matters <coughs> application stage. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Yeah, Councillor Mary Barton. Thank you. Um, <coughs> did you mention a £92,000 car, car sharing scheme, or car scheme? Can you just explain if I've heard that right and how it's implemented? Yes, yeah, so we're offering a contribution. I said circa £92,000 because it would be based on a per dwelling contribution. So that, that would be based on up to 250 units. Um, and that would be towards a, it's an electric vehicle car club scheme. Um, it's something that's relatively new, but we, ha we have included it on some other applications, not in this district, but um, elsewhere. Um, and essentially, it's, it's a, a way of trying to encourage people to maybe not have the second car. Um, so there's a scheme that's going to be based on site. We fully service. Um, so if someone wants to use a car, for example, to go to the shops, they can just prepay. Um, and take that car and just sort of effectively borrow it for a certain amount of time. So we're looking at making a contribution um, to, to, to secure that scheme through this application. Continue to just ask, and in the future, how will that continue? I mean, it's nice to have it at the beginning, but what happens when the cars wear out or, you know, you have to replace? Who's going to do that? Is my mic still on? Yep. Um, effectively, um, evidence shows from, uh, we've been speaking uh, quite extensively with an operator called Hire Car, um, and their, their um, evidence from other schemes around the country is that after a period of around three years, it effectively becomes a self-funding service, so there's no need to sort of have further input in terms of funding. Councillor Gray, because I think she had an add-on question. Sorry. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to add that there is a very successful electric car share scheme in Hastings. And I do have the name of the person that runs it, if, if you want more details. Barnes, I just recognise that Councillor Cook, just so she knows that I've seen her. Councillor John Barnes. Yes, I'm struggling to understand why, given the principle of development has already been established, um, why we're not moving to detail at this stage, why we've got this intervening stage, where you're simply tackling the access problem. Can you explain that? Um, yep, uh, we are promoting the land on behalf of the landowners at the moment, and typically we only deal with outline planning applications to secure the principle of development on the site. Um, and once we have planning permission, um, our model is that we then market the site on the open market to house builders, um, and they, they go on to then later submit the detailed reserve matters application. Yeah, it's not something that we, we do ourselves. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Dre. Yeah, thank you. That partly went towards answering my first question, which was, just confirmed, Gladmans do not build houses themselves. They pass on the land to somebody who built it. Yes, that's correct. So, as I said, once... Yeah. So, when you talk about prompt delivery, you're meaning getting it oven ready for another developer who may take years to deliver those houses. Uh, as we've got experience now, because they they take control of the sales and rather give them to estate agents who could probably sell them at 10 a week, sell them at one a week. But you pass it on. And I just want to touch on the buses that you talk about, £1,100 per dwelling towards a bus. 
Buses are run by private companies. You have no control over what they do to the bus service for this development, do you? Um, if I could start with the buses point, um, we are going to contribute uh, £1,100, as you correctly said, um, per dwelling towards a new service. Um, I understand that East Sussex County Council have received £41 million in funding <coughs> from the government um, in order to be able to provide new services as set out in their bus service improvement plan. So our contribution would be in addition to that £41 million. Um, sorry, and then the answer to your other question, which was about um, timings um, for delivery. Um, we have achieved outline permission on uh, hundreds of sites across the country and typically um, from outline permission stage to first occupation is around 24 months in general. Um, we do have quite a, a big evidence database on that if, if you would like to see that. Um, but we can assure you that um, the housing will be brought forward as quickly as possible. It's in our interest, in our landowners' interest, and in your interest for that to happen. And there are um, draft conditions on the planning application to require, I think, reserve matters to be submitted within one year of outline planning permission. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I'll go to Councillor Cook online. Can, uh, Councillor Dickie Cook. Thank you very much indeed. Um, having driven along Havenbrook Avenue, I am aware of a very good wide shared use path, which is adjacent to the road. It's not a part of the road. It's adjacent to the road, which continues a short distance along Linfield Road from the roundabout. However, there it stops. So are there plans uh, to extend this to Sidley, enabling school children and residents with mobility scooters to be able to access Sidley uh, without having to dice with death on the road? So that's my first question. Um, my second question, shared car use, wonderful, because one of the big problems with a big um, building scheme like this is that there are far too many cars and vans being used. Will this uh, be extended to the construction workers, I wonder? And then thirdly, the funding that you've promised, um, especially for the buses, um, will this be provided as the construction is going ahead or only when the construction is completed? Thank you. Um, I'll take those in reverse order, if you don't mind. Um, the funding for the bus service will um, be provided in accordance with the agreement that we will reach with, rather through the Section 106 process. Um, I imagine the bus service would, would contribution would be made prior to the full occup occupation of the development, but it will be in discussion with East Sussex County Council as to, I mean, it's in their control as to when the bus service on Havenbrook Avenue is up and running. Um, Please, could you remind me of your previous questions? Sorry, I don't have the shared car use. Sorry, the shared car use. Will that be extended and encouraged to the constructors to also share car use? Um, one of the planning conditions on the application will be for a construction environment management plan and a construction management plan, which are fairly standard conditions and will control the, the movement of vehicles um, into and out of the site during the construction phase. OK, thank you. Um, and the um, I know this really isn't sort of, you know, part of your, your planning application, but I'm just concerned that we've got all these wonderful shared use paths for cyclists and for walkers, but then we abandon them. And I just wonder if there's, you know, any opportunities for funding to be able to extend this uh, shared use path towards Sydney for school children and residents with mobility scooters. Thank you. I'd say on that, if, if it's the land outside of control, um, that I'm not sure there's much we can do. Could I just clarify which, uh, do you mean towards the west or the east of of the site? You, um, <laughs> I don't do west, east, north and south, I'm afraid. Um, it's, it's, where the, it's where the roundabout is, um, opposite St Mary's Lane. There's a roundabout there, Havenbrook comes into that. Am I, am I in the right place? I, I think we might have to keep that question for the officers uh. Councilor. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. We've got uh, Councillor Ganley. We've got a couple more questions. This is a very minor point and probably should be dealt with a detailed uh, application. But I am absolutely intrigued by paragraph one point seven, which uh, speaks of a um, biannual visit by a bank doctor. What on earth is that? What? Chelsea. Call a midwife. <laughs> Good point. Who would, who's answering that? Sorry. 
<laughs> I was going to say, I think I may direct this question to the, the case officer, if that's okay, as it is uh, principally yeah. their, their suggestion. It, it, it's known that a lot of people have the intent of cycling, but don't cycle because the bicycles have a flat tyre and they don't know how to fix that. Um, successful schemes in creating... It's a doctor, it's a doctor for bikes. It's a doctor for bikes. So, yeah. so the intent is, if we are going to try to create modal shift, we should try and facilitate as many obstacles to that as possible. And one of them is ensuring that the boat bikes are roadworthy and repairable. And some people don't know how to repair bicycles. So the, part of the travel voucher scheme of allowing people to purchase a bicycle is then to encourage that once a year a bike doctor, as it says, comes with a kit of parts and has a, in, in London we call it a surgery, where if you have a broken bicycle or it doesn't work, they will repair it as part of that process for a day throughout the year. They'll allocate a day to come and have your bike fixed so you can use it again. Huh? It's part of extending that idea of giving no reason not to use your bicycle. I'm amazed that I was repairing bike tyres when I was eight. So I mean, it was right. You might have to go in with the local employment and skills plan <laughs> rather, rather than what's because you're going to have to wait for six months to get fixed. Sorry, we're intervening in your... In your. Um, Councillor Maylie, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, morning to you. Um, thank you for, the, for your presentation. Um, can I have clarification of one word near the end of your presentation, and that was that you... You called it an allocated site, I believe. And in fact, <coughs> it's an unallocated no, site. It's okay. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. <coughs> I do apologise. Councillor Byrne. Thank you, Chair. Um, in all the, all the discussion we had so far, uh, you've presented the fact that access to the site was obviously seen as a potential problem and you've, you've, you've tackled very many of those issues with your car share schemes, electric vehicle schemes. So access was always seen as, as going to be a problem for this site? Um, no, I don't think I have suggested that access is a problem. Um, we have discussed it with, extensively with East Sussex and they're satisfied with the proposed access. <laughs> Uh, Councillor Byrne, just to, to clarify, it, if it's an access only, so the one thing you have to achieve is uh, acceptable access, and the job of the applicant is to do that, because if they, don't, if they can't do that, then the scheme won't move forward. It doesn't suggest there was a problem. It's a, it is a requirement or a bar that they have to get over. So, so but, you're happy with that? But yeah. it, is, it is a problem that has been addressed in several well, ways it, by these various schemes. It's not a problem that's been addressed. It well, is a, it's a requirement. It's an issue it's a requirement that's been addressed. Been but this particular site, we've seen far more, um, far more of the policy to address the increased amount of traffic, or and um, well, to address the traffic problem and therefore reduce the amount of traffic in and out of this site. Let's wait for the discussion on that one, Terry. Just you know, okay. it's rather than a, it's, a, it's a question for the applicant at this point, Councillor Barnes. Yes, I, it's, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, um, I'm not sure whether this question is really for the, this applicant. Uh, this applicant is for two sites out of the three. This is a, this is a question for the, the application we're looking at now. Yep. Yes, I, we had, uh, rule me out of order if I'm wrong. Just ask the question. Yeah, <laughs> we... Yeah, we we had a proposal for improving the junction at, uh, into the link road. And I assume the minimization of traffic, which has been talked about by this applicant, is also related to the overall impact on the highway system. I think that's probably uh, going to be a question for the officers. But I, this is what I wanted to know. Is the applicant, because it's a developer, not a builder, who makes the contribution to that? Is that going to be a condition? Of hold, hold the thought on that one until we get back to the offices, okay? If that's okay, if you're, yeah? unless you are desperately wanting to answer that question. Okay, that's fine. Thank you very much.
All right. Sorry, I'm not, not trying to sort of cut you off, in it, but there are certain questions for the officers that it would be better because if they have asked for that improvement, which is a, an off-site improvement, that, that's something that they've really um, made some decision or recommendation about. I've just got a, a question for you before we finish uh, um, for this, this uh, question section. And I know that Councillor Carroll wanted to ask a question, but um, I'm going to keep the questions within the committee. I'm sorry to, to say that, but just to keep the thing a bit tight. So one of the big problems we have uh, in Rother is applicants coming forward, whether they're promoters or, or builders, and pro providing uh, policy compliant applications, and well done for that. I mean, we're, that's the starting point for everything. And then what we have in the, coming back at the second stage with uh, a uh, perhaps even a, a reserve matters which meets policy, and then we have an application for the variation of 106 because of the viability. And, and that is one of our great concerns, and uh, that's within the, the gift of the planning system, as you know. Uh, but uh, what we would like to know, I think, is that if you do come forward uh, with a, a viability assessment, would you be, and do you have the authority to, to actually agree this today, a, uh, to have a review mechanism uh, included in the conditions? Um, I suspected this might come up having viewed the last week's planning committee. Um, I understand that was quite a controversial application. Um, I can assure you that we are proposing 30% affordable housing, which will be secured through the 106, and we have no intention um, of, of reneging on that. Um, we, as I said earlier, we've done plenty of these schemes in the past, and we've, I don't think that we've ever had an instance where we've, we've had, or not, not many instances where we've ever had to go back and challenge viability, and we don't have any, sort of, any evidence uh, that this scheme would not be viable at all, so I wouldn't expect that to happen. So you're happy to commit to a review mechanism should that happen? Uh, yes. All right, thank you very much. We'll have to take you on your word at this point in time. Thank you for that. Yeah. that to the builder as opposed to the developer. But it would be included within the agreed conditions, uh, section 106, yeah. 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 And just one final one, and this is, you know, as uh, Councillor Ganley has said, it sort of goes over a little bit into where you might go, but you have shown on the plan the uh, three playing fields. But if you look at the land, it's probably unlikely that you'll be able to build any playing fields because of the slope of the land and the amount of cut it's built. So uh, are you, uh, how would you be prepared to deal with that at, uh, at Reserve Matters? You know, we're jumping over where we shouldn't jump to, but I'm just interested because it is showing what's on the policy. It makes it policy compliant, but it is highly unlikely that you would ever be able to deliver those sports pitches. Um, as officer said, the, the framework plan is indicative, so um, perhaps it was maybe misleading to show three pitches on there. Maybe we should have left it blank. Um, um, our proposal secured the land for outdoor sports facilities. Those, the precise nature of those facilities will be established at a later stage. Um, with regard to your comments about whether pitches can be accommodated on the site, we have looked at, at that, so we weren't just proposing three pitches um, sort of off the top of our heads, that we and um, they could be accommodated given taking into account the levels of the site um, and things like the required orientation and things like that. So we do have some comfort that some pitches could be uh, provided on the site, but as I said, the final decision as to the nature of those facilities will be determined at a later stage. And, uh, thank you very much. It's not for the discussion today, really, but it was something which sort of stuck out a little bit on the plan. Uh, all right, well, I think we're going to probably say thank you very much for, for answering those and, uh, and for yeah. coming and presenting, and we're going to see you a couple more times, so we won't say goodbye just yet, uh, and, uh, and we'll move into the discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, and firstly, we've got the two ward members who I'm sure wish to speak, so Councillor uh, Coleman first, or Carol, have you decided who wants to speak first? Yeah, Councillor um, Coleman, yeah. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, members of the committee. Uh, as a local uh, member for Sidley, I'm here on my community's behalf to urge you to think carefully about this outline application. Whilst I understand the need for more housing, there is a fear that this development would come at too great a cost to our community and to the environment. I will now outline the reasons why I believe, on balance, this development should not go ahead. Firstly, I would like to raise serious environmental concerns about this proposed development. The site is currently green space and natural land that is used by local wildlife, including badgers, uh, and according to the objectors, buzzards, thrush cuckoos, barn owls, tawny owls, and green parakeets. Many of these animals have already been displaced following nearby road building, and I fear they will have no place left to go 
if we do not preserve some of this countryside land. The Coombe Valley stream runs through the site, which is within flood zone 3A, while the applicant has proposed mitigations for flooding, the Environment Agency nonetheless expressed concerns about flood risk. With the impact of climate change, we cannot be certain that these measures will be sufficient to protect our community and the environment. Moreover, um, we know there is already a risk of foul, foul flooding from the sewer no network in the area. Secondly, there are significant issues with infrastructure and access that would arise from this development. There are 44 letters of objection including concerns about the lack of infrastructure, access, biodiversity issues, drainage issues, um, the effect on neighbouring properties uh, of, of road improvements uh, and more. The Town Council already, uh, also objects to this proposal, citing grave concerns about the lack of infrastructure. Uh, and Sidley already suffers from poor public transport and overstretched local services. This level of development should only be considered where there can be guarantees that the housing will be built to meet local need and local affordability standards. Thirdly, I want to highlight the lack of commitment to sustainability in this proposal. The applicant is proposing this electric car club with eight vehicles, but there is currently insufficient evidence and no scheme in a comparable location that can prove either way if it's likely to be successful. Extreme caution must be given to the car shown in this location as to its deliverability and viability over the long term. To me, this feels like greenwashing. Also, the eastern end of the site is outside of the development boundary and is considered countryside. Surely this is encroachment. In conclusion, while the provision of up to 250 dwellings may seem like a positive step forward, significantly boosting the supply of housing, any social and economic benefits of this proposal are outweighed by the negative impact it would have on our environment, infrastructure and community. Unless all of these issues can be resolved, and until there are plans that meet local need, this cannot be acceptable. And whilst previous appeals were weigh heavy on this committee, there is a, this is a different site, and so there is no reason to feel restricted by precedent. I urge you to have the courage to scrutinise this fully, to judge it as you see it, and I hope you see fit to reject this application. But I also wish to alert members to a potential need to defer this. Uh, it is clear from the extraordinary nature of this meeting that the applica applications have been rushed to committee. Whether it's the holding statements or the misspelling of Sidley in one of the reports, this all feels very last minute. Why, for example, did members only receive the latest row back from highways less than 24 hours ago? How can these changes be pro properly examined in such a short time? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Coleman. And uh, Councillor Carroll. Thank you, Jim. Um, my part is a bit of a history lesson. Uh, with the uh, road that comes into there, uh, uh, we at Sidley, uh, after the war, we had two um, estates built uh, that sorted things out for uh, Robert or uh, whatever the council was at the time. Um, uh, the 269 road um, was uh, not sufficient at the time and the traffic has got heavier and heavier. heavier. And one of the main uh, parts for Kitai is where they've widened the road, then they run out of money in the 60s. Uh, St Mary's Cottages, when we had the last uh, meeting uh, with Sea Change, we said, what about St Mary's Cottages? Are you going to make the road wider? And they said no. And for the last two weeks, St Mary's Cottages have got a flood. They've got um, bollards in front of them, and there's sandbags around the side. And uh, the, from what I can make out of it, the... the drains have collapsed. This part of the road has not been done in many years, and that's part of a higher ways council, whoever it is, but they've never addressed it. they spent lots of money, but they haven't spent it in the right areas. And we must sort that out first. I'm not against housing, I'm against how we do it, and we must do it correctly. Um, Sam has uh, said about the wildlife and everything, but um, we, we need to have a proper place Coming through there this morning, I had to let a lorry through for me. I don't know if any of you come down that road this morning. Uh, but the man was very graceful and thanked me for letting him through with his big lorry. I was second. But with um, that man, he wasn't frustrated. When you get frustrated, people, that's when accidents start. And that's St Mary's Lane. They call it wing mirror alley in lorry drivers because they keep losing their wing mirrors. But all these bits must be done before you can look at the housing. 
you're not sorting out, you're not putting the foundation down right and you've had lots of years to do it. And please make sure that this is done correctly and we don't come back. You're talking about bus stops. We want buses. Um, please um, uh, sort it out. But uh, you're the planning committee and I hope you come up with the right answer. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Councillor Carroll. We appreciate that. Um, so we're going to move on to uh, just qu firstly questions that have arisen for the uh, officers. And I know uh, Councillor Byrne and Councillor uh, uh, Barnes had a couple of questions. But this is more for questions as opposed to sort of statements, if we, if we could keep it to that. So uh, who'd like to? Councillor Byrne. Thank you, Chair. Um, the elephant in the room here is uh, why are we not considering access to the North Flexhill Access Road? Now, um, Jeff Pyro uh, outlined the policy that said they wanted this community to feel part of Bexhill and not isolated. This has access onto the end bar. We're talking about this site, and this site has access onto the end bar. This site has somewhat questionable access to the actual uh, Bar. Location of the access to the end bar. Yeah, we're talking about this application at the moment, which has access onto the end bar. But did you want to talk to the, um, the mm -hmm. officer about that? I think that rather winds into my later points, so I'll leave it there. Okay, that's all right. That's good, uh, Councillor Barnes. Yes, I, I want to understand a little more about the who is contributing to the improvement of the junction onto the link road um, because we have what is becoming quite customary these days, the split between developer and builder. Um, indeed, one would hope that all these sites would go to the same builder, but they almost certainly won't. Uh, so how are we securing that contribution to an off-site improvement? Thank you, Councillor. Um, as we explained, these, the off-site works, the A259, would be secured by legal agreement. Um, the applicant has explained they are a land promoter. The site would be sold on, so that obligation would be for the future developer um, to fund the off-site works. Councillor, I'm very conscious that a, a, a comment made glasses on by Councillor Drayson in terms of our concern about delivery, because planning is about that delivery process. And as we saw at the Friday's Way inquiry, the inspector actually cut back the time limit to make a reserve matter and get onto site, and the applicant has agreed to that. So effectively, if the scheme were to be determined, Reserve matters have to come forward within two years, and construction has to start within a year. Those are very tight deadlines set by the inspector because there is a need to initiate development. And I think those are important considerations, that it is in the interest of both the applicant and the landowner, to put it bluntly, get on with it, and to allow those contributions to come forward within that period of time. Two Chairman, years and one year. Chairman, that, if those are enforceable, that's helpful. Uh, but actually, what would worry me about an off-site contribution is if somebody came back with a viability assessment that said, pinning that on top of the cost of developing the site, which we know will have drainage problems, will make this unviable. How can we absolutely guarantee that that contribution will be made. Is it possible to make it legally binding on the builder? Yes, the, it, it will be legally binding well, by this section 106 obligation. Well, I, I think to be clear, come, let's, let's, let's be very clear, it is legally binding, but a, an application can be made to Varia 106, which could be refusable within the first five years, but uh, beyond that would be appealable. So uh, it's as binding as the law allows it to be binding, I think is the answer, and I think you know that that's the answer. Um, but I think the only thing that we can do is put a little extra pressure on and, 
and understand that, that a promoter is there to make money, and so they're going to try and move it, and, let, and, and we just hope that the developer, that the actual builder will, will build. I think that we're all very sensitive to this, uh, this very issue. Um, I, I do want to sort of pick up on one point. You know, the, the, the application process, and I'm not trying to defend anyone here, but the application process it has been relatively short, but it's certainly taken more than three months, and, and I, think the, I think the statutory period for de determining these are three months. So we, we complain when they go on for a long time, and then somebody complains when they, they're done quickly. I, I think it's a bit unfortunate the, 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 the highway's results have come in at, at the very last minute. Uh, that's the most difficult part here. Um, yes, Councillor Maidley. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Can, I'm, I'm not sure, actually, whether this relates to this particular application or, or all three, um, but um, uh, Matt explained about the London Road traffic light scenario, which, um, if I can raise that now, yeah? If I can have a bit of clarification there, Mark, because it's... it's unbelievably complicated now and certainly lacking in, in a lot of space to do what I think you want to do. So could you uh, explain that a little more fully, please? Bear with me a minute while I share the relevant plan. Yeah, because at the moment I think it's an accident waiting to happen. Can you, can you make that a bit bigger? Can you just sort of um, go to, well, full screen and also perhaps uh, and, mm. uh, put the um, <coughs> increased magnification or something? This is our reply shelf. Explain. So, can you see what that is? So, that in other words, there's a, a lane on the left-hand side which will be included, so that vehicles going from London Road onto the access lane will go onto that that feeder, as opposed to at the current situation, they come to the lights, wait at the lights to turn left. That's my explanation of it. I'm not sure. Yeah, if I can explain uh, something better. That's, that's how I read it. So the, the, these three lanes are existing. So that's the edge of the highway at the moment. So what they're proposing is this lane. So there would be some land take, uh, this, this area here. Um, it looks like, yeah, there's a substation in the, um, at the corner of the leisure park, leisure centre car park. Um, it looks what, like what they're proposing is a pavement extension, and then this is a road. Happy with that, yeah? Well, well that, this is what's proposed. So this is, what the, this, this, is, this is what's been asked for by the, the, the planners, I think this is county. Uh, by county. So county have asked for this as a, con as a part of a contribution um, Jeff, yeah, sorry, I didn't see you over there, Jeff. Sorry, sorry to cut in. It might be helpful that um, these, these proposals at this junction that wasn't, hasn't been derived by this applicant. This was actually derived in response to the Leisure Centre application. So you might remember when that came for uh, outline permission. Um, it was considered then, and it, and it was necessary to deliver that application. And this goes back to the point I made earlier about in the highway infrastructure needs of the whole town being considered in relation to the whole plans allocations and what National Highways said at that point was in order for the, all the development that was planned for to come forward in Bexhill, there need to be improvements to, to these junctions. So the first application that comes forward that sort of tips it over the edge, as it were, has to deliver the junction. So it's, this isn't a new proposal. This is something that's been agreed with National Highways for some time. Um, but it would be this applicant, if this scheme comes forward first, would need to deliver uh, thanks, Jeff. Um, I'm just going to yeah, I'll go, go to Councillor Trace and then to Councillor Arrington and then to Gray. It's just on this one, because I've got some points to make in a minute. Um, that's a giveaway land, though, isn't it? That's not a solid 
road in like you get on roundabouts. They will still have to wait if there's traffic coming through the traffic lights. So there's still going to be a queue there. It might be a smaller queue. Yes. <coughs> yes, there's a stop. There, there is a stop line before they join. Um, but yeah, it would be that to give way to traffic coming from the right. Do you have another question? It was going to be for further on. No, we'll wait. We'll, no, we'll wait. Uh, Councillor Errington. Thank you, Chair. Just to really echo what Councillor Coleman says um, and draw my colleague's attention to page 7, 1.4 on the car club proposal. I'm a bit confused now because my colleague, Councillor Gray, said there's one in Hastings, but there isn't. There is no scheme in comparable location that can prove either way if it's likely to be successful. I just think, and we shouldn't be drawing too much attention to that as advice, only limited positive weight can be attached to this perceived benefit. I car share on a regular basis when I come here, but I just wanted to make sure everybody wasn't too taken by this romantic notion of um, electric cars and car sharing. That's my first point. So if, if there isn't anything local... We kept, yeah, okay. My second point is on the additional papers that we got on Tuesday night. I mm. couldn't print these out until Wednesday morning. It says confirmation through agreement with Sea Change that two new bus stops can be divided on Havenbrook Avenue. Yeah. So my question goes back to Havenbrook Avenue. If it's still in control <coughs> of Sea Change until that is then handed over or adopted by East Sussex, Sea Change would still have the authority to say whether these bus stops are put there. Is that my understanding? Both ourselves and the applicants have had discussions with Sea Change. There is a legal process in terms of that becoming an adopted highway. But we are confident that effectively that adoption is, can either be delivered these bus stops through a private agreement or through effectively working with the county if, if it's adopted. So we've, we've addressed both options and, 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 and allowed for the securing of financial contributions to make those bus stops happen because it is a legal issue that is outside the gift of the applicants at the present moment. Therefore, we have made provisions in either way to address that concern. Before I go on to Councillor Gray, one issue that was discussed uh, the other day was whether a Certificate B had been served on Sea Change. Could you answer that one? I can, yes. I, I looked into that after our um, site inspections um, and had a chat with um, the applicant. They, in fact, submitted a revised application form um, a couple of days after the original, um, back in September, which included a revised Certificate B um, where notice was served on sea change. Um, Gladman have also provided us with um, a copy of the notice that was served on sea change. So um, ownership certificate-wise, everything procedurally good. correct. Okay, good, good, good. Councillor Gray. Thank you, Chair. Um, just quickly on the car share scheme, um, I accept that Hastings is a very different area. But I'm sure that the person who runs it would be happy to come and share her experience. Um, I um, share Councillor Coleman's concerns about the environmental impact. I think 250 houses in this beautiful area. I know that Brex Hill pays the price of 82% of Rother being A and B. And I do feel that the burden falls very heavily on Brex Hill. And I feel for the people that live in this area, they thought they were living in a small country lane, able to walk out to Catsfield Crow House, Battle. That's all gone, and we're building and building. 250 houses will mean at least 250 cars. The pollution is here. So my question, Peter, is you said that we need a significant reason to go against this. So I would say, can we say the climate emergency we know because David Attenborough told us that we live in one, one of the most nature depleted countries in the world. And we were given a, um, a red alert for humanity at the last IPC. So just on environmental grounds alone, I know we need houses. 
that I'm sure there are other places. Beachy Road, we don't need another supermarket. We've got six in Brexham already. Or um, the, where the school is, King Offer School. We're just taking away all our fields, and the loss is horrific. Uh, Councillor, I, I have sympathy with change. It, it, it is difficult. But as Jeff has, has presented, the local plan was adopted 2019, which allocated these sites because part of a planning authority's remit is to capture growth and, and plan for growth. We've all talked about the lack of infrastructure, but part of that local plan's remit is understanding where growth goes, not just about housing, but the infrastructure and the social infrastructure that comes with that. The local plan that was adopted by this committee recognized that these sites were suitable for development, allowing and understanding the impact it would have on the environment. And hence that cumulative policy was set out that wasn't just addressing um, physical infrastructure in terms of roads and access, it was forward thinking in terms of recognizing the need for pedestrian and cycling access, which has been addressed, and the impact on the local environment. So hence, there is a woodlands management strategy plan being put in place. There is a management strategy of the entire river. There's protection of ancient woodlands. All of these things were identified in policy to mitigate against the harm that was identified bringing these sites forward. We have sympathy with, with your comment, and we have sympathy with the local community. But we need to be very conscious that the local plan set out these sites to be allocated for development, and the applicant has responded to that allocation. And in our discussions over uh, the period that we've been involved with them, they have addressed all of those items in, in terms of the indicative plan that they put forward and through conditions and supporting evidence of how that local environment will not just be uh, um, kept, but effectively enhanced and protected. And we feel confident those, through working with them and the conditions, that those things can be assured. Uh, yes, sir, and I think we're sort of going to move on to, to just general discussion now as well. And, uh, and I think uh, Councillor, Gan uh, Councillor uh, Jason has his hand. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I'm not sure who I should be apologising to. Councillor Drayson. Uh, thank you. Um, Peter's last comment brings me on nicely to the points I was going to raise. Unfortunately, Bex 3A was actually quite carelessly and loosely constructed. And it refers that the proposed uh, will be permitted where some 250 dwellings. Mm. Some has become, well, it was not even up to, it was some. That seems to have been, become a firm 250 and everyone talks about 250. Presumably, if we approve this today on just access, that builds in the 250 as a number that we cannot go from because it's not up to and it's not some. It now says 250. But I want to see if we... Uh, Councillor, the, 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 um, the description of the proposal in front of you uh, says up to 250. Yeah, in the brackets. I think, I think you're, I mean, you're, you're, you're not wrong in what you're saying. There's another 30 houses already um, uh, approved, which so could be, you could be doing about 280, but ultimately at the reserved matters they have to demonstrate density and layout and all that sort of thing too, and, and it's, it's, um, it's an up to, and I agree with you, the policy is not, doesn't sit happily in that sense. Uh, Councillor Barnes. Yes, I think the lesson that all local communities need to learn from this is the importance of, and we're about to do a new local plan, the importance of the local community taking the local plan more seriously and objecting at that stage. We're beyond that. Uh, the problem is, in effect, outline has already been given. It's one of the quirks of planning law uh, that somehow allocating a site, although it concedes the whole principle of development, uh, you're left still considering the outline. But the outline is not about density, detail. 
all this stuff on this extremely nice plan that has been submitted is actually not relevant uh, because it's not binding. Not binding on anybody. Uh, we will have to make that binding at detailed stage. All we are considering today, and on this site, unlike the other two, we do have access onto a modern highway, and it looks to be a perfectly well-designed access. A total sympathy for the local people. Um, we are caught in a bind in Rolla. We have 90% of our area protected. It means that these highly arbitrary top-down targets have to be applied to 10% of our landmass. And we are attempting to do that within the confines of the new link road. And it does mean those areas are being sacrificed on the altar of housing need. Um, but we have a housing need. The access is acceptable. I reserve my position on the other two sites, but I have to say, on this one, I can't actually see that we can resist on access grounds. I should make a point, which would probably be an unpopular thing to say, is that, uh, as you know, we do also have to consider the financial aspects, which is, is a two-sided equation. One is the new homes bonus of approximately 1.6 million, and SIL, which could be something in the order of a couple of million, and of course, still for infrastructure could be applied uh, as decided by the, you know, the, the, um, the, the, the council to make further improvements. Uh, and the flip side of that is, uh, you know, if you refuse something like this, you would one not get the new homes bonus, and two, uh, as we've experienced, the fairly heavy costs of loss at appeal uh, on an allocated site. And I throw that in; that may be very unpopular to hear, but. Uh, it, it's, but, it's a, but it is a reality, and it's a reality also placed on us by government that we need to consider the financial aspects. Uh, Councillor Gandhi, did you want to speak? Yeah, I, well, I just wanted to agree. Uh, I express my sympathy with the people of uh, Sidley and Bexhill also. But I also uh, have great sympathy with the people, particularly the young people, who struggle to even rent affordable homes. Homes, uh, until they don't buy them. And, and the main reason why homes are so expensive and so sh in short supply is we don't build enough. And, and I would point out also that we're talking about 250 homes here, but the whole project, Northeast Bex Hill, consists of 3,100. So if you wanted about 250, uh, <laughs> I think it should be, I think it is. I may be wrong, maybe. Uh, all right, well, whatever. It's a lot more than 250. Yeah. Yes, uh, Councillor Mary Barnes, we might try and sort of move along then, yeah? Question was, my question was just about drainage, really. I was looking at the paragraph from Southern Water about um, uh, how they, uh, what conditions that they were put in, and... So they've gone for phased occupation of the sites. And one gets the feeling, read, reading paragraph 6132, that to a certain extent, um, they're going to make it up as, they go, uh, uh, as the need arises. Um, Southern Water at the moment does not have a fantastically good reputation. And I'm just concerned that somebody's going to keep an eye on this. So, for example, if we get these horrendous floods, which we have from time to time, and I hear Peter's argument about, you know, the clear water will go into the, into, the, into the stream and all that sort of thing. But are we absolutely sure that we will have um, a, a, an effluent safe uh, delivery system when the whole of that development is in? I think, Andy, to, to, to address the question, it, it doesn't really address an access <laughs> issue, but uh, I think to give you some comfort as to how that would happen or not happen. Go on. A, a councillor, a, a, in any application... Um, while it is up to 250 units, the only way you can plan, even if at outline, is to understand the full environmental and infrastructure impact. So they have done a study on circa 250 houses. That's generated a volume of water and waste, which is then planned 
for in terms of land take, requirements, pumping stations, etc. I think you need to read that word phased slightly differently. They have accommodated and allowed for the full capacity required out of this development, both in foul water and in storm water. It's just that some of those will only kick in at certain critical points of occupation. You might build out everything, or you might allow the provision for everything. So it's not done ad hoc. It is planned as if it is a total community, but it might be delivered in phases, just like you might deliver some of the roads in phases as you get occupation into the scheme. So um, we haven't assessed it as a, an ad hoc basis. We've assessed it in its totality to ensure that effectively there are conditions in place to enable that to happen. Okay. Where are we up to? Does anyone, well, there doesn't seem to be any questions at the panel. Does anyone want to put forward a proposal on this application? I think it's, uh, Councillor Ganley is moving approval. Would anyone like to second that? Uh, it feels stuck in the mud, uh, Chairman. Uh, and I think to move from approval is now another option. I feel uh, very sorry for the people of Sidley, but I think we've got to. Well, we hope for Councillor Gordon seconding that uh, uh, proposal for approval. And have a show of hands as those who uh, wish to support approval of this application. Thank you. My apologies. That's uh, ten votes. Uh, sorry, nine votes to two. Correct. Uh, no abstentions, and uh, for approval of that application. Now it's uh, twenty-five to twelve. Uh, I propose that we take a, uh, a break um, for twenty minutes. Yeah, happy with that? Twenty minutes. So that would be five to twelve. Five to twelve. You might want to get a. I will, we will work to it. <laughs> Thank you. Five to and I, I, I recognise that there's quite a few people in the in the gallery wait, you know, waiting for the next application. I'm sorry that these do take a little bit of time to come forward. Third of March, and we're going to do the second application, which is RR two hundred two two stroke one five eight four stroke P, which is land at Mayo Lane, Bex Hill, and I will hand over to the planning officer to present his report. Thank you, Chair. I will just share the PowerPoint display with you. So this application is relates to the Bex 3B allocation in the DASA. Um, the proposal is for 130 houses, 30% um, of which will be affordable, will be open space to the north of the site, um, sustainable drainage included, um, and we have got the detail of the access point. So the application site is to the west side of Watermill Lane, um, northwest of Mayo Lane and northeast of Ninfield Road. Vehicular access will be via Watermill Lane on the corner um, see where the cursor is. Um, I will get onto the detail of that a bit later. 
Um, as, as with BEX 3A, which we've just considered, um, the general infrastructure policy, BEX BEX 3, covers this site as well. Um, we've got similar proposals to BEX 3A in terms of drainage. Um, again, we've got an overall drainage strategy for BEX 3B, which has included monitoring works. Um, that's concluded infiltration probably won't be suitable um, and again they would use attenuation um, and limit discharge rates um, to the stream to greenfield rates um, that will all be subject to further consideration a condition is recommended um, and the lead local flood authority would be um, consulted on the further details, um, and they, they are happy with that approach. Foul water is much the same as BEX 3A. Um, Southern Water have identified capacity issues. Um, improvements are going to be required at some point. Um, they will need to work with the developer in the future to work out um, timings for that work and specific details. Um, We've got some broad outlines of like commencement, potential commencement dates. I think the developer said earlier, on average, they, on, from an outline comment, being granted, work on site typically, typically starts within two years. So improvement works would be secured by, there'd be a trigger point on you know, completion of the X number of, X number of dwellings this improvement will take place. Um, in terms of the highway network, um, and that's sort of linked in with access, um, I will get onto the details later. National highways didn't require any um, improvements to the strategic road network for this proposal, um, and they've raised no objection. Um, also, in the infrastructure policy, we've got reference to the Green Corridor. On BEX 3B, um, that is to the north of the site. This is a purely indicative plan only, but to the north you will see an open space with got attenuation ponds, um, greenery, which link, um, there would be a foot, footpath there, the existing public footpath would be utilised and that cycleway would be included and that would link into BEX 3A to the west. So that's, this is, this in, indicates one way that could be achieved. Moving on to the access, oh, no, before I do, sorry, in, in with the infrastructure policy, um, this site is also required to contribute towards the sports facilities on BEX 3A, so that would be a financial contribution. So, moving on to details of the access, um, I, I, yeah, I appreciate that. This, um, you'll see the north arrow in the top corner, te top left-hand corner. So the, the plan has been reorientated. Um, I can't tilt it 45 degrees to, to change that, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, but if you just imagine it reorientated, um, perhaps if I go back just to remind you, previous. So, if, if you can see this big red arrow, where my cursor is, you can point to it on the screen. This is Watermill Lane. This is Watermill Lane. And the access point to 3B, Bex 3B, 
is here where this red arrow is. The plan that I just showed you is tilted 45 degrees that way, so um, yeah, we'll go back to that. So as, as you will have observed on site, Watermill Lane is narrow, it is rural in character. Um, the VEX 3B site is at a higher level than the lane. Um, therefore, some excavation works will be required. Um, we, during the application process, we've looked at Watermill Lane in quite close detail with the um, applicant. Um, they have looked at land ownership. They've looked at various ways of how to improve access. Um, so I think, ideally, we'd have um, a lane or road that accommodates vehicles passing two ways. Um, in addition, you'd have a two-metre-wide footpath for pedestrians and cyclists. That isn't possible because of the constraints here. We have looked, um, and the, the constraint really, the main point, is between this proposed access and Mayo Lane um, to the south. It's that stretch where the, the banks are very steep. Um, to the east side, you've got, there are two issues. One is a land ownership issue, so it's in separate ownership. The other issue is that um, you've got ancient woodland there, um, and taking out ancient woodland is, um, well, it's got a very high level of protection at a national level, and really it's a very last resort, and then compensation things are needed. Anyway, to the, to the west side of the lane, the land is in separate ownership. Um, and again, if, if you're relying on land in separate ownership, um, you can't guarantee deliverability, and thus you can't, you know, that affects your housing land supply. Um, you, can't, you can't be reliant on it. So there's no, there's no avoiding the, um, the restrictions we're working against here. Um, what I would, what we have got is from an officer point of view, it's the best solution given the restraints. And what, what, what is proposed is this um, priority access arrangement between, between Mayo Lane and the proposed access where it will narrow to, um, it will only accommodate one vehicle at a time. Um, there will be road signage requiring vehicles to stop, um, but interestingly on the modelling, um, vehicles will only have to wait three to eight seconds, so that's, the anticipation is that only, you'd only have to wait for one vehicle at a time. There aren't going to be queues of traffic there, basically. Um, but what, narrowing the vehicular access allows for a pavement to be provided, which there isn't one at the moment. Um, Pavement width would, where possible, be two metres in width, but at this pinch point, um, it would reduce to 1.2 metres in width, um, which is not ideal, but it does allow an adult and a child to walk along. Um, on narrow pavements, I think, probably all walked along them. Sometimes you do have to just wait at the side um, while other people pass, and that, that's what would have to happen here. Like I say, not, not ideal, but it is the best solution given the, um, given the restrictions we're working, working against. I know Mayo Lane <coughs> has been... Um, raises an issue um, by locals um, 
there are concerns about its increased use, which um, I think we all appreciate um, and want to try and minimise as much as possible. Um, again, this is an issue that's been raised with the applicant and they've worked with us on looking at different options. Um, we looked at, was there a way of closing it off? Was there a way of closing one lane of it, so it was single access. But there were issues came about about vehicles turning and there were other, it would have had a knock-on highway safety effect um, if, if those options had, had been carried forward. What we have got is a potential solution here um, to introduce road markings um, to effectively reduce the width at each, each end. Um, yeah, some soft traffic calming measures, really, to try and put people off using it and direct people, really, towards using Watermill Lane, which I think the modelling for the road network suggests the majority of people would use Watermill Lane still, um, but further measures are required just to try and put more people off from using Mayo Lane. So, I think in summary, this is an allocated site for the 130, 130 houses. That is what is proposed. The policy compliant 30% affordable housing is proposed. Um, the infrastructure requirements such as drainage, um, the green corridor, um, provision of the sports facilities on the neighbouring site, off-site highway works, um, which in includes provision of bus stops and other improvements. All of that is um, acceptable from, from an officer's point of view. Consultees have raised no objection, um, subject to the imposition of conditions. Um, hence um, why the recommendation is to approve the proposal. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Matthew. Um, sorry, Councillor, could I just, just, uh, just clarify? Could we just go back one plan? I think it's important that we as officers take pedestrian safety and cycling safety very seriously. And, and it's paramount. You know, we do not want to be as a committee knowing that in, in approving this scheme, someone later dies on this road. So we've worked very hard with the applicant to ensure that even if there's a compromise in terms of the footpath along that road, there is a guaranteed other route through application site 3B to Mayo Rise, which will be of sufficient width of two metres to allow for pedestrian movement, cycle movement and disabled movement to access that route so that it minimises the amount of pedestrian traffic at this pinch point um, and that that route will be accessible to the other sites coming forward further north, i.e. the unallocated site and 3C. So effectively taking off as much pedestrian and cycling movement off this lane into the scheme itself onto the estate roads. The other important item is to note that this compromise and this plan in front of you has not been designed in isolation of this site only. The policy BEX 3 requires cumulative impact and understanding. So this has been modelled and is demonstrated here for 3B, but it does address the volume of traffic created for both the unallocated site and the allocated site 3C in terms of cumulative response and addressing that problem. So this should be recognised that it addresses the total volume of the development that would have to come along this lane. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Peter. Uh, we have uh, three um, people speaking against this application. The first one is uh, Kate Innes. If you'd like to come forward and uh, uh, you watch the process so you... Hopefully you know what to do. The key is to push the button when you're speaking and turn it off when you're not. 
and uh, well, just uh, that's okay. W whenever you're ready, thank you. Have I got that right first? Oh, yeah. Thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to speak today. The reason I am doing this is there are so many unresolved issues, compliance failures, and some substandard surveys, which you are being asked to set a precedent on making decisions on as well. Gladden have failed to demonstrate that the development meets the national planning criteria set out in paragraph 104 and 106. Specifically access, may arise cannot be used. The entrance of the gate walks straight onto private property. May arise finishes at number 10. The owner who is here today and will be speaking owns the section in front of number 12. A point that Gladman were made aware of, including Ms. Oliver, last year. We, and they, as a result, said we would never consider using Mayor Rise. It is not suitable. It is also the same thing that they wrote in the community statement. It's funny how the suitability has now come into the being. It would interfere with a protected species that cannot be moved, be disturbed by any form of low-level artificial lighting, or be subjected to vibration. The entrance is not feasible for anybody with walking disabilities, or wheelchair bound, it is so severe an incline if people got trapped there in the ice. There are confused statements. Sometimes you say it's for pedestrian only, sometimes now you're saying cyclists. There is also police have said that the residents must be no more traffic on that road. It is a dangerous police black spot. As part of the correspondence related to Mayor Rise suddenly being used, having said it wasn't, it was put in the 80 house development off Watermill Lane. It was not made accessible for the Mayor Rise people to see because that was in Mayor Lane. There are also the distances of may arise using those bus stops because one bus stop, by the way, I am a non-driver, I use your buses. That bus stop on the right is for one bus an hour. I have to walk to Mayo Lane to get more frequency bus and if I want to get to Conquest Hospital, which presumably we want to make accessible, they have to walk further. So what are the distances from the northern part? What are the distances that you're promoting people to use because they're not registered? Also, Gladman himself has turned around about the dangers of access from this point. We ourselves want to validate that. As a matter of public safety, it is absolutely imperative you know, do another traffic assessment survey. One done over three days, a bank holiday week, from a Friday to a Sunday, is so way below industry standard that in a recent planning thing, it got laughed out when I asked about a comparison. Your minimum should be 14 to 21 days with no public holidays, no school holidays, and that should be done properly. And if they can't be bothered to do it, then I'm sorry, it shouldn't be considered. they also now saying we should consider 360. They modelled on 190, which wasn't even the right amount then because they couldn't calculate it right. If you need to model it on 360, you model it on 360 and you do it properly because you are all being asked to make a decision on something that is not accurate. There's also a resident who lives on Linfield Road who's a barrister who specialises in road traffic. His vehicle movement rate was very different from Tetratrex. So even if we take the middle, it's still way off what's being said. The safety audit done for 80 houses was placed in for the 130 houses. There doesn't appear to be a 130 house safety, safety audit. I'd quite like to see it. But that says 1.5 is the minimum pavement, not 1.2. Even if you have it as a pinch point, if you are asking somebody to walk in the road, a mother with a child would say, sorry, you can have a house, but you can't be a mother with more than one child. I'm sorry, we can't do that. This is about access, and I am a person who uses pavements. We cannot not be inclusive at this point in time. I also wanted the opinion of somebody who knows this better, so I contacted a disabled person who is very fit, in fact, trying out for the Paralympics. He's an ex-soldier. He lost his legs through landmine. His response that was incomprehensible that anyone would consider building a location that was not fully accessible for those with any disability or mobility issue. As he says, we are isolated enough. We do not feel that we cannot get out into the community due to safety and accessibility issues. He also advised he does not want every journey to be about getting in a car. He wants to take his dog for a walk. You prevent him doing that. <coughs> doing what you're doing now prevents him. What happens when, exactly like now, Wilton Mill Lane is shut? They go down Mayor Lane. That's not something that you can control completely because it's going to happen. New homes will have easy access to service and facilities, public transport links. That's what Gladden said in January 2022, and I do not feel that they've delivered on that. Environment, little, sorry, is being said on the detrimental impact, and this is worrying me, because those surveys are so substandard, so old, and nature moves on very differently. 
They missed so many things. I have asked, I have literally asked 12 different people about these surveys and every single one of them said they're out of date, they're bad, so they're standard, they haven't done good benchmarks. So again, you're accepting something that is not accurate. Your own environmental policy has been going against. The higher biodiversity has increased. So the benchmark has changed. DEFRA call this a place of high spatial priority. But yet, Gladman are happily knocking out 20% natural habitat just on the first part of the build, let alone the rest of it. There's light pollution. Could you, this... finish, could you finish up soon? Oh, please? sorry. Basically, what I would just like to say is that we presented in 2022 the idea to reduce by 40, to create a gap in the settlements, create a natural wildlife corridor that would protect and do this. And this is supported by Gladman's original plan that actually had Mayole rise to the left with green sight. There is a lot we could do that make this better, and I'm sorry that I've taken over the thing space, because Gladman themselves say the 50-50 split in the 80 is the better practice. I'm sure there'll be questions for you. Yeah, you? sorry, I'm so sorry. No, that's all right. No, no, let's stay where you are. I know, well, you're going to, we're going to do it, do it like that. That's okay. That's all right. There'll be an opportunity for questions. I'm sure some of your issues will arise. Uh, is um, Debbie Shoesmith going to speak? Thank you. It's not unusual for when you practice something for it to take longer when you actually present it, so I appreciate that. Right, you're going to have to bear with me because I'm way out of my comfort zone on this. Um, I would like to represent the, the residents of Mayo Lane. My name is Debbie Shoesmith. I've been born and bred in Bexhill, and for the past 18 years I've lived in Mayo Lane at number 26, four houses up from the junction. We thought this was our forever home, but I don't know. In the last two years since Fyondry Meadow has been developed, the traffic on our semi-rural lane has increased dramatically, not just the volume of traffic, but the size of vehicles and the speed it travels. This was highlighted, and why I'm so passionate, my five-year-old granddaughter and I were involved in a near miss when a car was travelling behind us and an oncoming car driving with speed tried to pass. This resulted in us both ending up in the hedgerow. We have suffered abuse, abusive language and gestures from drivers as we attempt to drive out of our own driveways due to the nature of its lane and its visibility. It's compromised by hedges and trees. Um, and as you drive out, you're already in the path of oncoming traffic. We've had our, our own sleeper wall, which retains our shrubs and, and land, literally pushed with such force by cars that it's gone on to our next door's drive. And this is without a word of an eye. This morning, my son rang me to say that the wall that we've replaced it with this morning has been damaged. They did not stop. And on that note, I'm very upset about it. The lane is used constantly by dog walkers, horse riders, at least 15 horses that I'm aware who've been knocking on the door, and regular families and the school children, all of whom are at risk from this development, these developments. I myself walk my dog twice daily to fields in Watermill Lane and feel if the developers were to be permitted, I would not be safe to do so. Watermill Lane itself is a beautiful natural lane and in fact was a, an ancient sunken lane with wildlife either side of its hedgerows. If traffic uses the junction of Ninfield Road and Mayo, it's particularly an accident waiting to happen because the cars speed over the brow of the hill from Ninfield Road We've had police checks. You won't stop them doing that. It is a danger. I've read the reports on the traffic survey that Gladman have done, and I do not recognise the lane that you're talking about because I live in that lane. I'm there every day, seven days a week, and I can actually say that lane is not what is described by Gladman's report. It is much busier than they are claiming, and all our residents, without fail, would confirm this especially at times of the school runs, lunch times and home times, three to six is a nightmare. Many Bexhill High's pupils are using the lane at this point and they're walking home from school. One of our long-term residents has a very good proposal to limit the traffic in May Lane and I do have a diagram which I think actually would be beneficial for you to see. I would like to show planners, please don't compromise on safety. My other questions come flooding in with the extreme black ice that we had. Mayo Lane and Watermill Lane was impassable, which causes the residents of Boundary Meadow, Watermill Lane, Mayo Lane to move out of their lanes to go and park somewhere else so that they've got a chance of getting to, to uh, work. What roads 
will the relentless cons construction vehicles use and where will they park? Watermill Lane itself is a massive safety concern as cars are now parked due to the volume of cars and houses there. They're parked on the left past Redwill, you go down past Boundary Meadow, they're then parked on the right all the way up the hill, making this actually not a two-lane road, but it is in fact making it a single-lane road. And I, although I, I've listened about the cycles, I, I think amazing if anyone can get up our hills on bikes. Mail Lane is not designed to take excess traffic. Traffic calming measures will not be effective making signs on roads or even signs anywhere. That's been proved. We've even parked in the lane as a deterrent to try and slow the traffic down. It does not slow down, I can assure you. In the words of a team recently fitting broadband wires, it's like brands hatch up this lane. And that was their quote. On the subject of schools, with extra families moving to the proposed event, are you really telling me that they're going to be encouraged to go up in a car share? How can you even get two, two families in a car? The next thing is, what happens? Do they go up Watermill Lane at the bottleneck? If anybody's been to the bottleneck in the mornings when the school traffic is, I can assure you, you would not choose to go that way. You would choose to completely go up Mayo Lane and hit the transport, the traffic up, Mayo, up Ninfield Road. And we all know, anybody who's lived in this town, that placements in our primary schools are non-existent. There's... I can honestly say that being a grandparent and a parent and meeting lots of parents, due to work commitments of parents nowadays, they do not have the luxury of walking to school. Many have to drive in order to go to work after. And therefore, what I'm asking is please, please put safety and residence before all the money that other companies are making. I do agree that we do need housing, but is that going to come at a cost of pedestrians and the people of residence of Bexhill? I, I hope not. Thank you so, very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you for that. Uh, could I have uh, Joyce Hugh, please? Sorry, like, like Debbie, I don't, I've never done this before. Um, Take your time. Can I just point out, before I say anything else, I used to be a transport manager. I had my own trucks, and I was a truck driver. I've done site work with a skip lorry, and I have to say, I would not go near Mayo Lane or Watermill Lane with a barge pole. But my other issues are my own personal problems. I actually live partly in this site, the 130. My kitchen door opens with a one foot gap from this site. My bungalow is lower than the site you propose to build on, which means that even a fox can look in my windows, never mind a truck or other uh, or builders. Um, and um, I actually own the land outside my house. I purchased that in 2016. It's 40 foot square, uh, right up against the gate where they propose to bring the strike court and footpath. The other residents in Mayo Rise, um, number 10, own the grass verge opposite their house where they have planted fruit trees and there is a registered badger set I have registered that and I've spoken to the Badgers Protection who tell me that if anybody goes within 40 feet of it, I must dial 999, get a crime number and give it to them. Uh, the resident of number 8, Mayo Rise, owns three quarters of the road, but not the grass verge. The resident of number 6 owns the whole of his front garden across the road, including the road, and the grass verge. So how would you propose putting a cycle and footpath? And I am registered disabled. I can struggle to walk up that road. Uh, how, how are you going to put that in there? Um, 
The other thing to point out about the traffic on Mayo Rise and Mayo uh, Watermill Lane is sat navs don't understand narrow roads. Um, I agree with Councillor Carroll. I have been down, um, I think it's St Mary's Lane, I'm not a local girl, um, and I've had to reverse two miles in my car because there's a brick lorry going to the brickworks and it quite clearly says at the top, no, no large vehicles. Um, and um, yes, I think that everything else has been mentioned, the wildlife, um, I'll try not to repeat myself, but I, and have, have the councillors actually seen how many people are moving out of these areas where you propose to build? People keep telling me, local people, I used to drive the Bexhill bus, the 95 that went from Conquest Hospital down to Little Common. And I know a lot of ex-passengers and they say to me, I'm moving all of the south signs, I can't live. We have just had a conversation in this break, every one of us is going to move because we can't live there anymore. I'm 75, this was my final resting place. Now you're going to throw me out because I can't, I can't live for five years. It's not just the housing. I don't think people realise what's involved with construction. Thump, 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 day in, day out for five days while they put in sewers, electricity and all the other amenities before the houses are built. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Could I invite um, Kate Innes and Debbie, maybe if you just sort of bring your chairs forward, all three of you, yeah? Can you do that? Just, yeah, pull a chair, another chair forward. Yeah. So I'd uh, in invite uh, members to ask questions of these... Uh, Yes, I, I invite you to ask questions. Yes, Councillor Errington. Chair, I don't, don't know if it's appropriate, so stop me. Um, going back to what has been suggested in terms of narrowing the road, what, is that any way towards a good... What, what would be the best solution for you, apart from rejecting this site, which you understand it's, it's on the DASA, if we say no to it, then we're taken to appeal, we potentially lose, it, it costs taxpayers money, etc., etc. What would be your best solution? I drove down there yesterday, um, and I'd like to say it was a very different experience driving in car to driving on the planning bus, but what would be your best solution if this were to go ahead? What would make it more, more acceptable? Thank you. Can we answer this, two of us, because um, I'm a relatively new resident. I only moved in last September to here. Oh, just go shoot. Um, but I think there's two, the compromise that we suggested, which was that we were, that access was moved um, to the, you use the M-Bar road was one of the things that nobody seemed to understand why that wasn't being considered. But also that we created, we took 40 houses from, so we could reduce the amount of traffic because if you've got the 80 unallocated, sort of not in the local plan houses, if that is given permission, and I understand why that's put forward, if you take 40 off of that and you keep, you reduce the amount of traffic and you take it off Mayo Lane and Watermill Lane, but you must do profit, proper assessments for all of this because you're making judgments without knowing pavement widths. You cannot accept what's there because... It is an incredible, dangerous precedent to allow what's happening. So all we are asking for is that is a consideration in numbers, how you access it, e.g. via the NBAR road, but also that only, only done to the proper best practice standards, as Gladman themselves want to do with the 80 houses, that's want best practice. Right, I'd like to say, first of all, we've had the highways there. We've called tw twice, we've asked them to come. Um, the, plan, the Office of the Highways was very supportive and said, the only way you can ever get anything done by this is to have had fatal accidents in this lane and they're not been recorded. We've had no fatal accidents and I'm thanking everybody for that. But all I can say is if you're going to paint lines in Mayo Lane, I cannot see how that stops the traffic because everybody nowadays is in an absolute rush to get to their lives and various people who've moved into the area have no idea 
about walking in a lane that is with no pavements. They have no concept of it whatsoever. They're, I truly believe the only way that you can possibly stop the traffic on Mayo Lane is either to make it one way, which highways have already said they won't do, um, or to block the lane off, which is, is it would be a very expensive option, but I think it would be a safety a way of doing it. We've got lots of elderly residents also in Mayo Lane um, who, for their, their own mental health, I think, wouldn't want to be here. But they walk daily, all the time. They're actually going to be prisoners in their homes because how are they going to get out onto what's a, already a, a no, thank, busy no, road? Thank you, thank you for that. I think you're sort of nearly answered the question. So can you confirm that blocking off that road, making, in effect, Mayo Lane a cul-de-sac, would that be a favourable solution? But it's been discussed and it's not possible? It would be a favourable solution. Yeah. You know, because, to be honest, no, this is going to go on. I drove around yesterday, and to drive from one end of Mayo Lane to the other, round Watermill, Lane, it's over half a mile, so it's a very obvious shortcut. We're going to have people on this estate with no... Can we hold it to yeah. questions rather than... Okay, yeah. yeah, so that would be, have been your, your preferred option, to close it off, make it a cul-de-sac with no access, having to force everyone around Watermill Lane. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, other questions? For... Yes, Councillor Barnes. To the first object, uh, you referred to various traffic surveys having been done. Who, who, whose traffic surveys were they? They were Gladden commissioned a company called Tetra Tech. Tetra Tech, sorry. Um, they commissioned that, uh, and they did a survey, and it was... After it, they were called in by, I think Mr. Worsley called them, or no, the highways called them to do a second one because their first one was inadequate. They were called to do a second one with the combined development of 130 and 80, which they made add up to 190, which is a slight debatable point. But then it was done on the Friday after Easter. We get to the long weekend of Easter. They picked the Friday when most of the schools weren't back in this area. I did check. And it finished on the Sunday which is so against the policy of any form of traffic assessment. And so they basically, it was commissioned, and again, Tetratrek have been linked to the recent safety audits, which they are seemingly ignoring their own safety audits that have been done as well. And so the cumulative of the 360 now needs to be regarded as well over a 21-day period. Are there other questions? Uh, yes, <coughs> Councillor Stevens, yeah. In one of the comment letters that were sent in, it says here that there could be a new access in Havenbrook Road. Is that would that be acceptable? And I mean, I don't know the area well, but sorry, um, is that the Embar Road? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Havenbrook yes. Road. Yes. Got no, in, in yes. one of the letters yeah. here. I mean, that would be obvious answer. Yeah. And I, I speak as a long-term resident in Bexhill. When the consultation came up, although I query that, but um, when that came up, we were led to believe that although there was going to be development, it would go out onto that road. And if you ask most residents, especially in the northern time, they would confirm that, that we were led to believe that that would come out onto there. So the traffic would not be backlogged up Watermill Lane, Mayo Lane, Ninfield Road is a nightmare. And that's also... Oh, that would be more acceptable. It would, yes. Particularly if the sort of things like the bus routes, because, again, I am a bus user. And if the 300-metre minimum standard for buses that are under two, if there's less than two in every 12 minutes, it has to be 300 metres. And if they could do... It seems to me it makes sense that they could do that on that road as well, which they, they can't now. Right, thank you. Um, I have a question for you. Uh, you talked about... Uh, Councillor Gann in Barnes, are you... With us on this evening? Yes. Are you, are you, did you have a query about what was the end bar? Yeah, yeah, go on. Mayor Rise. Right. Okay, well, we can talk about that in a minute. Let's, let's talk. Uh, are, there, are there other questions? I'm going to ask a question in a minute. <laughs> no, no, you're there to ask, answer questions. Yeah, yeah. No, no, it sounds uh, good. Oh, yeah. oh. 
but I will, I will ask a question. Um, Mayo Rise, you've talked about the ownership of, of land on Mayo Rise, and the highways say that there is a right of access across Mayo Rise now in both, in both directions. Um, no, I don't live in Mayo Rise. I live, I live at the bottom of Mayo Rise, but Mayo Rise ends at number 10. I live in number 12, which used to be the back garden a 198 so you're saying are you saying the mayor rise is actually effectively blocked it's not a it yes. goes through yeah, it finishes at number 10 there's a 40 foot gap square okay. apart from my bungalow I own that too but the we'll 40, 40 foot we'll square of that. land which I cleared okay well we will at, okay I just wanted to not, get it's not no, thank you. Rise. no I, I thank you I'll, it's yeah. just to get the issue on the okay. table which the officers can address yeah. in a minute yeah. if, if they did want to we do have the map of the, the registered yes. deeds to demonstrate this, but may arise effectively ends at number ten. Well, I think there is a difference between having the deeds and if a right of way exists, but we'll we'll we'll, we'll ask the officers about that in a, in a moment, yeah, okay, because it's an issue that you. Were there other questions? I think. Having somebody pointed out to me. Uh, sorry, for, further questions? Further questions? No. All right, well, thank you very much. You've raised some issues which we will be discussing, okay? And I appreciate the, your, your time and the slightly different format, and hopefully it worked for you, okay? Um, and so we'll now have the uh, representative of the applicant who we met earlier, Sean Gulliver, if you could come forward. Thank you. Sean, sorry, my apologies. Sean? Hi, good afternoon. Hello again. Um, and thank you again for the opportunity to speak. Um, I don't want to repeat matters which we've discussed in detail and which officers have pre presented in uh, quite a lot of detail, so I'll try and focus on the key matters relating to this site. So starting with transport matters, which we are aware, obviously, is a key local concern, um, it is a requirement of policy VEX 3 that all developments off Watermill Lane provide an integrated approach to ensuring safe and convenient movement for pedestrians, cyclists and vehicles. We have extensively liaised with the Highways Authority and they are satisfied that the proposed access arrangements are safe and suitable for the level of development proposed. We have looked at whether access could be taken from the M-Bar, but, but it is not possible due to third-party land separating it and the site. We also investigated the possibility of providing a link from Watermill Lane onto the M-Bar and closing Watermill Lane south of the proposed access, but this had to be ruled out because of the difficulties with third-party land ownership and the difference in levels. And I'd also like to add that um, the traffic surveys that we carried out were as agreed with highways and in the correct survey periods. To ensure Watermill Lane is safe for pedestrians and cyclists, we have agreed an improvement scheme for the stretch of road between the site access and the Mayo Lane Junction, which the County Council's offices accept represents the best solution within the context of existing constraints. This improvement scheme, as well as traffic calming measures on Mayo Lane, will be secured in the Section 106 agreement. Following further investigation into the status of Mayo Rise, we are now also able to offer a pedestrian link through the site to the site's boundary with Mayo Rise, facilitating a direct link between the site and Linfield Road as required by policy VEX 3B. ESCC have confirmed that Mayo Rise is an unadopted highway that pedestrians have a right to pass and repass and this link will not encroach upon any third party land. Our proposals also offer the opportunity to enhance local bus travel through the provision of two new bus stops on the M-Bar, which has been agreed with Sea Change Sussex, and a financial contribution towards a new bus service on the M-Bar. Our proposals would also secure upgrades to bus stops on Ninfield Road in the vicinity of the Mayo Lane and Mayo Rise junctions, respectively. Other transport-related benefits of the proposals include a commitment to providing each new household with a cycle <coughs> voucher and charging facilities for electric vehicles on all properties, as per the other schemes before you today. New housing would lead to the creation of jobs during construction and increased expenditure within local services. We estimate around 800, 280 sorry, direct and indirect jobs would be um, generated in construction and related industries. 
and we have also agreed to a contribution from this scheme to, towards a local employment and skills plan. To clarify our role as site promoter and to address something brought up earlier, um, the site will be sold to a house builder having a full understanding of what is required of them in terms of Section 106 contributions and on-site facilities and will bid accordingly to ensure that the permission remains viable. The site will be sold at full market value, that is a, is a significant initial outlay for a house builder, so there is a huge incentive for them to deliver and sell the houses to recoup their initial investment. To address the point about how many units will be delivered on this and the other sites, we have agreed a condition requiring, requiring the Reserve Matters application to be in broad accordance with the Development Framework Plan, and as uh, Peter said previously, the description of development is for up to, which doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get 250. Um, that's a, a maximum. In summary, our proposals will provide up to 91 market and 39 affordable homes to boost the availability of much needed housing in a sustainable, accessible location on a site allocated in the district's principal settlement. We have worked collaboratively, collaboratively, I can never say that word, with offices to bring you this application today and fully endorse their recommendation and hope you can too. Thank you. Uh, thank you very, very much. And I'm sure you're going to have some questions now. Um, so would anyone like to ask a question? Could I just clarify, you've used the wrong unit number. You used the 3A. 250, but you should, you, we are application 3B, so if you could just clarify the unit numbers, please. Yes, sorry, that should have been up to 130, I think. <laughs> My brain was still in the uh, previous application. Well, no, we have to, to take into account all the sites down that lane because it's the, 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 the policy 3, isn't it? Uh, yes, I'm sure you're going to have some questions. <laughs> Would somebody like to start? Yes, John Bar. Yes, um, can you just elaborate a little on the discussions you had with highways about using the other end of Watermill Lane where it goes on to uh, the Havenbrook Road? I think there's a roundabout there. Is there? Um, yeah, we, we have explored that with highways, but unfortunately, as I said in, in my address, it's not possible due to third-party ownership constraints. Who, who is the third party? PJ. Uh, th this is not creating a problem for the access onto the end bar for the previous application that we saw. Sorry, would you mind if I, uh, Peter's got his hand up? <coughs> we, we have to recognise that sea change and others have to be guided by planning policy. So the planning policy gave access rights to the end bar for site 3A, but planning policy didn't give access rights to 3B and 3C and the unallocated sites. So we've got to be minded that C change and the applicant have to be guided by the policy in place. So the access for 3A is part of the planning policy. Continue with uh, Councillor Gordon, I think, uh, and then Erin. Yes, it's a great shame that we can't use the Northern Access, the A2691, because of third-party land. Is that not possible in bar at some point? Do they not uh, pass it, see, see change, rather? Do they not pass it across to public ownership at some point, or highways? Okay. We can explore yeah. a little bit more. So my question to you, basically, is yeah. your traffic assessment... How many days was that traffic <coughs> assessment for? All of our traffic assessments across all three sites were carried out in, in agreement with East Sussex Highways in accordance with the, um, with the standards. So as I understand it, that's three days of assessment from a Friday to a Monday, was that or something? Or? Um, I don't have those in front of me to refer to, but if you'd like us to look into that, we can. But I can assure you that everything was carried out as, as agreed with East Sussex Highways, and they have no objection. Because I, I must say, I find the traffic assessment over two or three days a bit ridiculous, really. It should be 40 to 21 days, I would have thought, personally. Thank you. Uh, we can try and get the officers to... Uh, <coughs> we, we can try and get the officers to confirm what, what it precisely was the period and, and, uh, and why it does cause some concern. Councillor Errington. 
Thank you. I'm not sure if this is for Sean or the officers. The, could you just explain the, the pedestrian access and Mayo Rise? It does say a pedestrian link through the BX3B site to abut Mayo Rise. So to me, that's going to run alongside it, not down Mayo Rise. And, but at some point, somebody's, there's got to be access between your... So have you got access straight onto Ninfield Road? This is what I don't understand. So our proposals, um, and this will be governed by a planning condition, include a pedestrian link through the site um, to the site's boundary with Mayo Rise. And we have had it confirmed by East Sussex that Mayo Rise is an unadopted highway that pedestrians have the right to pass and repass. So there will be that link that's facilitated between the two at the, at the site boundary. We're not creating a new footpath, no. Further questions? I mean, there does seem to be this issue on Mayo Rise. It seems to be uh, East Sussex saying one thing with yourselves and the, the owners of the adjacent land saying something different. And I'm struggling to know which is correct. I think we might have to ask the officers unless you can shed some light on that. Just to say, we're, we're not disputing ownership of, that, of any properties on Mayo Rise. It's, it's about rights to pass and repass, which we, we understand are... Are yes, that's the problem. The problem is, and I, I don't know how we address it, is defining Mayo Rise. If Mayo Rise historically only had 10 properties and has now been extended, uh, is, the, is that part of the highway adopted, unadopted? It's certainly not adopted. Is it now counted as unadopted, in which case there will be frontage uh, agreements uh, to help with maintenance? If, in fact, it's only the first 10 properties, you could well be in problems. I think we need to, to have some confirmation in a minute. We're <coughs> talking to officers about this. Um, so we'll just we'll hold the thought on Mayo Rise. And, uh, and challenge the uh, officers on this. It would have been a little more helpful having the highways here specifically to do that. Um, I'm going to ask you the same question that I asked for the last application, which was about viability. So you know the question is, uh, should, should this uh, come along later on uh, for a viability assessment? And we're pleased to know that most of yours don't, but should it do, uh, are you prepared to have a, a review mechanism built into the 106? Um, I did try to address that in my address just now, um, so if I can refer back to that, um, I may just reread it just because it's a bit clear, clearer. Um, so the site will be sold to a house builder and they will have a full understanding of what is required of them in terms of obligations under the Section 106, um, in terms of money and provision of on-site facilities. So they bid accordingly to ensure that the permission remains viable. They don't want to, they don't want to get themselves into any issues with that. Um, and the site will be sold at full market value, so obviously there's going to be a significant initial cost to them. Um, so there is incentive to deliver the houses. That doesn't actually answer the question, are you prepared to have a review mechanism built into the 106? Um, yes, I imagine we would be. Imagine or you will do? <laughs> yes. I'm sorry for being very specific, but it's a specific question. I'd like a clear answer. Um, Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Sorry to have to push you on the question. Were there some other questions in relation to this? Um, okay. Although we very much appreciate you coming forward again. We'll be talking to you again shortly. And, uh, and thank you very much for, for coming and speaking. So uh, we'll move right along. Uh, there have been some questions raised already, which I think it's best the officers uh, deal with immediately. Uh, the first one, I think, is to, to clarify the issue of uh, highways um, and, uh, if you like, I hate to use the word, minimum highway requirements versus use of the N-bar. Uh, and maybe more than one officer who wants to, to, to uh, comment on this. And also the issue of uh, ownership and right of way over Mayo Rise. And, and, what, and, and what constitutes the establishment that there is the right to pass and repass as set out in the highways report. Can you, can you deal with those? Yeah. I'm not sure who wants to deal with those, and Jeff might want to comment on the NBAR thing as well. Because I am aware that the, the, the issue here on the NBAR is that we're told that you can't 
the access would be difficult. But um, a couple of years ago, we approved the traveller site at the end, which requires travellers with their with, with, with uh, caravans of, of of any size to uh, to access the site, which is at the level or slightly above Enver. So I think we need a proper explanation as to why a small traveller site can accommodate that, but not um, this. Thank you, Chair. And, and I think if we start with Enbar, and, and, and I might bring Jeff back into this discussion, is that um, the, the applicant and the application in front of you is asking for conformity with planning policy. It's not asking to reinvent the wheel. And that's, that's an important consideration, that they are effectively uh, addressing the planning requirement as asked at present. And therefore, it is in planning policy in the local plan that all these sites would take off access along the lane down towards Sidley. If we want to change that policy, that's another whole discussion that comes into it. And whether that is then a more suitable solution is another debate, but we have to be conscious that we are asking the applicant to conform with planning policy as set out and adopted, and that was making the provision that access would be off the lane and further down to Mayo Rise and to Mayo Lane. Um, Jeff, I don't know if you want to come in on that, please. Well, to be honest, I think you said that really well, but yeah, that, that's the point. There's a, there's a policy, I've got it, you know, I've got it open here, we should already have the policy open, that's what they, the applicant's required to do. It says the access should be from Wind Water Mill Lane, the details of which will be subject to the findings of a transport assessment, um, with the expectation that a single access will be provided with sight lines that can be achieved. That's what they're providing. That's what the highway authority says. They support that. They say it's acceptable. Traffic management measures are introduced onto Water Mill Lane to calm traffic, and we've shown those details as well and ensure the safe movement of pedestrians and cyclists between the site and Sidley. Um, we've heard what's being said today. There's, that's a judgment to be made, but we, the Highway Authority, have confirmed that they believe that, that is achieved and that is, that is successful. So you can't... I mean, if an alternative was on the table to, to, to NBAR, you could, con you could consider that, but there isn't an alternative on the table. This is the proposal, and that complies with the policy. I.e., you have to judge the application in front of you and uh, if, if highways have designed a plan that they say is acceptable, it's, uh, it, that, that overcomes that particular objective, even though it appears to be minimum or unacceptable. Uh, I'll go to, to Councillor Harmer first and Councillor Barnes. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think everyone that lives in Bexhill know practically that lane is not suitable. Sorry, but it really isn't suitable. And at the same time, we all know that we have to abide by policy and law. Sarah and I, we've had a big lump built in Bexhill, West Bexhill. We know this learnt the hard way. Um, from, from where I see it, if everybody could have what they wanted going forward, wouldn't it be practical to defer this while more work were done on the uh, access to uh, uh, NBAR? Surely that everyone would be happy with that, and hopefully no one would sue us for taking a bit longer. Is that possible, Chair? Well, you can... Um, I, I think I would... I think I might ask Kirsty Cameron, actually, to, to make comment on that. Um, would you like to address the committee on that point? Could you repeat the question again? Uh, my question is, uh, is it possible to defer to give all sides um, involved more time to look at a preferred access route to Enbar. On the site visit, we all asked the question, oh, well, why isn't this the access? It is steep, we get that. But surely for everybody concerned, it'd be a lot safer. Um, and we've already heard from members of the public that that would be their compromise, so all sides <coughs> would be happy. And obviously it's within the member's remit to consider deferral, but for how long? Obviously the applicant um, wants the application determined as, as soon as possible, so how long would you be considering a deferral for? So could I ask at this point, Representative from Gladman, um, is it right that we do this here? Could we ask the person, would you be happy for that to happen? Then all sides may 
get what they want in the end. <laughs> Do you, do, you to, do you want to take the chair's position? Well, yeah. otherwise, <laughs> we know what happens when we get sued. I, sort of, I, think, I think you've got too much into your chairing role and you, you've fallen yeah. forward there. I, I'll, I'll, come to, I'll come to that in a second, though. I will, I promise you. I think she's got the idea, but we'll, we'll be asking a question. Uh, Councillor Barnes. Yes, I'd, I'd like a bit more clarity on the not just the traffic survey which was done by the developer, uh, but we will now have three sites potentially feeding onto Watermill Lane, all of them moving towards Sydney. How have we estimated the total number of traffic movements daily along that lane? Um, how, are, how has Highways done that? I'm sorry, Howes are not here to answer the question, but I, I'd like to know, and can we have a figure? How many movements will that be? Uh, thank you, Councillor. As part of policy BEX 3, the developer is asked for cumulative impact and the understanding of cumulative impact. So part of this study, they would have had to address the three sites collectively and individually to understand impact and their traffic modelling would account for that. As I said earlier, the model, the solution presented to you recognises the collective traffic movement. I don't have the figure in front of me. I'm sure we can find that, but it does address it effectively. That would be a 360 extra units to the north of Mayo Lane along um, Watermill Lane. Yes, I, I have to say I'm somewhat sympathetic to Councillor Harmer's point because without seeing that sort of traffic survey, those of us who know that lane well um, really can't judge whether it's going to take that amount of traffic. The highways have not come, uh, which seems to me outrageous when all the issues are, in fact, about traffic. If I have more confidence that they haven't just done a desk exercise, they have actually studied the site with engineers, I would be more confident. But I really, at this moment, I'm inclined to go for deferral. Well, uh, if I could sort of respond, I'm, I don't always say things were particularly popular. Um, <laughs> but I think I have to say it. So you have an application in front of you, and that's what you're being asked to judge. There's absolutely, uh, and I think, we could, I think we're probably all in agreement that, that it's a, uh, they're rubbish accesses for this site, and without jumping ahead, the next one, because it's, it's not the similar. And I think uh, the learning here is that when these plans came forward, there wasn't anyone who was challenging these things in a practical way, uh, whether it be uh, ward members or, or, or whatever. Um, and, uh, and I will ask the ward members to speak in a minute. Uh, and that's a problem for us, uh, because once a site has been given um, a, a approval through examination, it's gone, it's, you know, it's achieved certain bars, and it was it was considered the examination to be acceptable for access along Watermill Lane, as much as we don't like that, uh, and perhaps proper consideration by others who weren't here should, you know, or weren't there at the time should have been given. Um, and it's then up to the applicant at time of application to figure out the plan to make that happen. And if I was, a, if I was authority, and the word to really learn there is authority, says that meets an acceptable standard, minimum or whatever, then uh, it's, it becomes very challengeable if we, if we move away from that, even if we don't think it's the, the right solution. With it is really, I mean, it's a really you know, rock and a hard place sort of discussion. Um, so I'm just, I'm just saying that because uh, if, if, for example, and I'm not... And we do know that this is a, an applicant who's worked well through a PPA, but we also know it's an applicant who, who would be happy to go to non-determination of an application uh, where you, you, you do potentially lose control of the application. So just, I, and, and I don't want to, I'm, just, I'm saying these very undesirable things, but if I didn't say them, I wouldn't be doing my job, if you like. I've got... I, I'm just going to... Yes, but Chairman, can I just I know, I know. say, yes. yeah, because I know. Uh, I know. you have said a satisfactory solution. What Highways have actually said is 
the best solution within the constraints of this particular site. It's true. So just hold that thought. I'm going to do two things. Well, I did jump ahead of myself a little bit. I've got Jaspreet there, and I didn't, in between times, allow the two board members to speak, so I'm going to allow them to do that. So I'm going to hear from Jaspreet first. Jaspreet, you want to appear on the screen? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, members of the committee and members of the public. Um, I've heard uh, members refer to deferral, so um, just before you consider or, or make up your mind about that suggestion, should it be put on the table, in relation to a deferral to effectively redesign the application and, and use a different access, I would say that that's not something that um, we would be supported um, and may create a significant risk in relation to a non-determination appeal, simply because, as you yourself have mentioned, Chair, members must consider the application that's in front of them today. So I would caution against any attempt to redesign the application. In relation to deferring to seek more information, well, that may be something that you want to do. Having said that, again, I would I would warn um, members about the cost risks here, um, simply because, again, as you've, you've said, um, the application has the support of a statutory consultee um, and would does accord with policy, um, which would, would create significant cost risk if we should end up in an appeal. Um, I'm only saying these things because it's important for everyone to understand what considerations there are. Um, however, I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have based on my advice. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jasper. We might just come back to you in a minute, but I did, as I said, jump ahead and um, uh, admittedly forget to invite the ward members to speak at the most appropriate time. So not to be in their bad books, I am going to ask them to speak now. Uh, uh, Councillor Coleman. Thank you, Chair um, and Committee. What, whilst much of the concern towards this site does remain the same as the last, the impact will be worse and there are additional issues as well. I would first like to draw members' attention to the concerns and objections raised both by Bexhill Town Council and the objectors, particularly surrounding access. The Town Council strongly objects to this application on the grounds of highway safety. The current road structure is not sustainable for the number of dwellings proposed and the Town Council believes strongly that alternative access should be considered to avoid traffic issues. Access, traffic and the lack of accessibility to the site are major concerns for the residents as well. These concerns were supported by the deeply concerning comments from East Sussex Highways Inspector prior to this recent rowback um, after a conversation between civil servants. Uh, they had raised multiple concerns about the impact of the proposed development on the highways network, pedestrian facilities and accessibility of the site. I believe these issues remain even with the measures listed. The proposal would result in material increase in vehicular and pedestrian traffic onto Watermill Lane and, more worryingly, Mayo Lane, which, as you will have seen from your site visit and heard today, is in no way appropriate for the level of traffic this site and the next one will generate. You will have also seen the bends on Watermill Lane onto which both sites are proposed to have access from. Uh, and it is also clear that no mitigation can occur on Mayo Lane that is sufficient to actually avoid this without great detriment to the road itself or its residents. Residents don't want an obstacle course any more than they want traffic. The only access solution that could work to resolve this is to reopen Watermill Lane onto Havenbrook Avenue, providing an alternative exit for these two sites. And if there was a concern that that would then make Watermill Lane a cut-through, perhaps the part of Watermill Lane between the site entrance through to Mayo Lane could become pedestrian only, and covered with trees, stopping any rat run issues, encouraging alternative travel, and providing a safe green corridor for wildlife across the lane. However, the report suggests the applicant is not willing to consider opening up Watermill Lane um, because of the land ownership issues and the height differences. Um, sea Change, as I understand it, were a company where, with which local councils were involved and were meant to be considering their, their designs and their, their processes with, with the local need in mind, and I can't see why conversation with them couldn't occur um, to make a much better access route for these two sites. Um, but if that can't be, if that can't happen, and we've understood um, from the legal perspective today, surely that means acceptable access is therefore not possible. And if there's no possibility of access which this committee finds acceptable, the application should then be rejected. Furthermore, the report's findings on the ecological impact of the proposed development should not be ignored. The proposed development on this site is adjacent to an area of ancient woodland, which is a highly sensitive ecological area. 
and it's essential to ensure that any development does not harm this area in any way. The presence of bats, which use the site for foraging and commuting, is a significant concern. Foraging hotspots were recorded in the northern fields, with activity along the eastern boundary of the site. The presence of rarer species, like late leaslers, highlights the importance of protecting this green land. The pr proposed development would also result in loss of the on-site pond, which the report suggests is potentially home to great crested newts. It is also unknown if other amphibian species, such as toads, uh, where, which are a species of principal importance under Section 41 of the NERC Act, reside in that on-site pond. We must consider the long-term consequences of these actions. We cannot ignore the ecological impact of this development on the surrounding wildlife, particularly as some of these species are protected by law. The committee must, cons must consider the objections raised by the Town Council and residents regarding highway safety, ecological impact and accessibility. And I urge the Planning Committee, even more firmly than before, to reject this application. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Common, very much. Uh, and and Councillor Carroll, did you want to add anything to that? Thank you, Chairman. Um, Sam done a good talk about the area and everything. What I'd like to talk about is the um, uh, DASA report. I was involved in it at the beginning with David Marlowe, and uh, we had Walter Mill Lane sorted out, and it was very good. And where we had the Travellers' site, that was not a problem. It all had to come to Bex Hill. All of the other came to uh, Sidley. And it was okay because the road went through. There was no cul de sac then. And they've used that now to say about that. When this was all done and they told me it was set in stone, which I think now it's changed to putty a bit, they're using the rules to suit themselves. And I think that um, uh, the things they're saying here haven't been looked through correctly. The uh, DASA report is a very good thing, but they're using it to please themselves. Originally, there was a, a roundabout there. We all agreed to it. Then there was a bridge there. We agreed to that. Then all of a sudden, they put a cul-de-sac there. So we've been treated really badly. And it's the people of Sydney that are wearing this now. And it's all because of the DASA that we're using that's set in stone, and yet it's not working. That's enough from me. Yeah, thank you very much, and, and uh, I think a very hard lesson learned that when a, a, a policy document comes forward, reading the detail and understanding <coughs> it is critical, because once it's examined, uh, it is a, a set of rules for everyone to work to, and that's, uh, I think, uh, great learning there. Um, so we'll, the, your points are, are clear and taken. I, I do want to ask um, either Kirsty or Jasper, whoever feels more appropriate to answer the question about the issue of Mayo Rise and the highway's point of view and whether if it was, uh, if there was an impediment to access there, whether that is a planning issue or a civil issue. Did you want to come in on this one? Jasper, did you want to answer that? Yes, yes, sorry. Thank you, Chair. So, so fundamentally, um, if, if the a Mayo Drive is considered by the Highway Authority to be passable and be very passable um, by the public, then issues relating to its maintenance and um, whether um, our parties would be willing to sign an agreement fundamentally would tend to fall within private law considerations but that's dependent on it being passable and be repassable re by, um, you know, the public at large, because it's a, still a highway. It's just not a highway that's adopted and maintained by the local highway authority. So in the circumstances, if the local highway authority have taken a view um, in relation to something um, relating to the situation in, re in, in, in terms of rights to pass and repass, then you have to take that as a given in terms of what, what, how they view that situation. Okay, so if, um, uh, but it's not, a, I understand it's not actually a planning issue because if planning permission given that there was some issue with that access, that would be an issue that the applicant would have to overcome to implement the permission, correct or not correct? Yes, that's correct, yeah. Okay, and so should, should permission be given for this and there be an issue with the access, it would be up to the, the uh, owners of that land to uh, to challenge it through civil action, correct? 
Yes, effectively, yes. Chairs, okay. that's correct. Does everyone understand that? Does it need explanation? Yeah? Okay. Um, uh, yeah, go, yeah, go on. I think it's important that when this issue arose, we actually asked the county to take legal review of the issue. And if you don't mind, I'm going to read their response because we cut and pasted it into the report, which says, Mayor Rise is an unadopted highway. While privately owned and not maintained by the county, the public are permitted to pass and repass over the length of Mayor Rise, given its highway status. The highway rights would equally apply to the new residents of the development side who would be allowed to pass on foot to connect to the new footway on the site. And, and that comes effectively from the county in terms of addressing that issue. Yeah. I, just, I just have to say, I can't take any more comments from... I'm sorry, I can't, I'm, I'm bound that I can't. I don't put say last me, please. <laughs> Uh, uh, Councillor Barnes, and then Councillor Byrne. Yes, uh, I, I'd just like clarity on this DASA point. I, I'm struggling to remember. Uh, we're talking about 2019. I'm struggling to remember whether at that point Watermill Lane had been severed or not. There is a principle in international law called rebus ex santibus. In other words, that circumstances haven't changed. And what I need to know is what we assumed when we did the DASA. Did we assume that Watermill Lane was closed or did we assume it was open? I think we might get uh, Jeff to answer that. We, we knew it was closed, yeah. When, when the planning permission for NBAR was approved, that, that was when the decision was taken that a water lane will be closed to the south, and that was in 2015, I think. So we knew that all the way through the considerations of DASA policy. I have another question for, I think, Jasper. Yeah? Jasper, you, can you reappear? Yes, sir. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. So fundamentally, if, if the information, I mean, to take Councillor Barnes's point, if the application, if the information upon which the, uh, a conclusion has been drawn, is the same as it as now, then those conclusions are valid um, in relation to um, you know the the highways information that was supported in the in the DASA document. Okay, and another question for you: um, there is the issue of should this application be approved, uh, and in fact the next application may or may not be. Uh, but should they be approved, can the committee uh, include a condition to actually block Mayo Lane at one end or the other uh, to stop it being used as a rat run? Because it is a, you know, it's a residential road, not a... And the intention of the policy was that traffic goes down Watermill Lane. Now, that's sort of making a highways decision in a way. Uh, and they've thought about it, but they haven't really... Uh, bottomed it out, and they did say that they felt that the, uh, that the conditions that they were putting in gave some flexibility, but can we actually tighten that up so that it, it, it at least appeases the, the problems which already exist for residents in, in that lane and, and create an immunity issue for them? I think, I mean, going back to fundamental principles on conditions, as, you, as you'll all be aware from your training and experience, you can only impose a condition if it's necessary to make the development acceptable in planning terms. Now, usually um, we would rely on a statutory consultee's determination to kind of fill in the gap on what makes something necessary or not. I would be reluctant to impose a condition that hasn't been expressly requested um, by a statutory consultee. So my advice to you is, it's not something that I would suggest we should do because we don't have the evidence base to effectively say that it makes the application necessary in planning terms, unfortunately. So how do we achieve that? Ultimately, then you could only, well, you'd have to have a determination or, or some evidence upon which we could say that this condition is necessary to make development acceptable in planning terms. Um, and 
as you'll know, with all other conditions, they are based on either an assessment of evidence and um, an expert determination that the condition is necessary. So um, ultimately, without that um, conf confirmation, I don't think we really have any grounds because we, we would have to be standing in the shoes of an expert and making a determination that unfortunately we a don't have the evidence to make and b aren't qualified to make in the circumstances. So who would challenge that? Any challenge on that whether whether the condition is necessary or not would have to come would usually come from the developer themselves. Um, obviously, a member of the public may may choose to judicially review a decision that imposes an unnecessary condition. But in practical terms, it would be the developer more often than not who who would take an issue with the condition, and that is the one we've dis we're discussing right now. Uh, Councillor Barnes, thank you, Jess Bree. Chairman, the problem is that the Highways Authority is only <coughs> concerned with a limited range uh, around traffic safety. We, as a planning committee, are surely entitled to take the amenity of residents and their quality of life into consideration. These are indirect casualties of Adassa, um, and there is really no public interest in allowing people to use that lane for a purpose for which it was not designed. Um, either we could put it one way, and that would slightly incommode the residents, uh, but would actually uh, be workable, or we could turn it into a cul-de-sac which would look after the imminent of the residents. But it seems to me this is not a traffic safety issue. This is about the conditions in which those residents live, which is a planning issue. Uh, Councillor Byrne. Thank you, Chair. Um, picking up on the point of making decisions on information that may or may not have changed, we seem to have two holes so far in our evidence base. One is how long is Mayo Lane? We are talking about Mayo Lane as if we have a shared understanding of how long it is, where it starts and where it finishes. Mayo Rise, I beg your pardon, Mayo Rise. And we've heard from uh, one of our residents that uh, there is a pointed issue there as to where Mayo Rise actually starts and finishes. And I think we would need... Uh, we would need information back from county to say exactly what are they considering when they use the term may arise, because we may well find that they're considering may arise to be something it isn't. There's a second, uh, the, the, the second point of, of essentially the data that's input to this decision. We're told that the traffic survey that was carried out was carried out in accordance with highways parameters, and it was over three days. Are we absolutely sure that those parameters have been fully, uh, ah, yes, yes, fully adhered to? Because I, uh, as a committee member, I would really like to see, do they, do they really say three days and it doesn't matter if it, one of them's a Sunday or a Good Friday? Can I, I can't believe that that's actually yeah. the way it's worded. Can I just try and address them and the officers might want to? Please do. So the, the first one is the Mayor Rise one and the right of way, and highways have given their opinion on that, and they're, they're the authority. So you have to, as a committee, you, uh, accept what they say as an authority. If if it turned out that, they, that there was something which inhibited the right of passage over there, that that becomes a civil issue, right? That, that becomes a civil issue. So you know you can get planning permission on a piece of land that you don't own, right? And and but you can't build on it. And if it becomes an impediment, it's for the developer to overcome that through uh, whatever negotiation they might have, or they can't develop it. So that issue, whilst it may be an issue, it's not one for our decision. Yeah? As annoying what, as that is, and I'm annoyed what, by it as much as you are. What yeah. I was questioning was the definition of Mayo Rise. Well, it doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. It, it is irrelevant. I don't, don't mean to sort of be harsh with you, but it is irrelevant. If you can have planning permission on land that you don't own, yeah, and now if they if they ended up um, or, or planning position or, or the 
or it's an unadopted or adopted highway, whichever, it doesn't matter because they can't implement the permission until they resolve that issue, if, if that issue truly is the issue which, which would be resolved not through planning but through civil uh, action. And, and that's, the, that's the difficult part about that. It's not except, I mean, I, this comes up quite a lot, which is a, a constraint on the planning committee, yeah? Yes, Councillor Gowley, I think I've got... Um, Actually, I've got Councillor Drayson first and Councillor Maidley. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. We're only being asked today to uh, approve the access. <coughs> um, and the vehicle access plan is probably the best achievable under the policy as dictated to us by DASA. But surely the, the lack of due diligence prior to the publication of DASA shouldn't now mean that we have to ignore public safety. And if we don't find it safe, we should not actually approve it. If we have to simply go along with what I thought was a, not a great response from highways, and we cannot reflect the feelings of our residents who have to live with their decisions 24 hours a day, why are we here? I think we're going to have to refuse it if deferment isn't an option. Um, okay, uh, uh, Councillor uh, Maidley. Thank you, Chair. Uh, one point that hasn't, this is a statement, and not a question. Um, emergency services. Uh, Sussex Fire and Rescue actually had no comment, no comments have been received. Well, I, I guess I don't know whether they've, they've skirted round the, the problems that could arise, but has anybody thought what it would be like to try and get the emergency services through any of that area, including um, Watermill Lane in part, in full, with the increased traffic that the current application is going to need. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Ganley. Chairman, having reread County Highways comments, could it, am, I, am I right in thinking that Highways is content, or at least relatively content with this proposal? In that case, um, in my view, a refusal would be overturned on appeal by the planning inspectorate. Costs could be awarded against us. We would lose uh, close to a million in, <clears throat> in um, New Homes Warners, two million on uh, uh, Sill or thereabouts. We'll lose Sill. Payable regardless. The New Homes bonus would be lost, yes. But, we wouldn't lose still. Oh, yeah, of course, yes. Okay, okay, a million still. So, anybody who wishes to propose refusal should bear in mind how much it's going to cost us. And it would still be overturned, by the way. So, your decision would make no difference. The, the, the key issue here is, does, this is an allocated site, presumption of development, uh, and for access only. Access only, yeah. You know, highways have said it meets a, an acceptable standard, whether we think it does or it doesn't. <clears throat> and it's, 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 a, it's a faulty site. <laughs> yep. There's no question about that in terms of access. <clears throat> and anyone who's... And I've driven down there many times over the years, and as I've said, I've backed trailers into uh, driveways which are nearby there, and it is very dangerous. It is now cut off, so you don't have a flow in both directions because of the cul-de-sac, but <clears throat> um, it is... You know, highways have said what they've said, uh, and this is why the only thing that I can think of is, is, is appeasing the traffic on, on Mayo Lane. Now, I will ask the, the, the applicant, um, and I do occasionally ask the applicant something during the, the meeting, uh, and I will. Uh, would you, as the, as the applicant, uh, have any objection to um, agreeing as part of the highway's work, which is quite a lot. You've got to do a lot of work. So, it's, I mean, one way or the other, you're up for a pretty penny on highways work, would you have any objection to um, uh, blocking Mayo Lane, doing the works to do that? It's not, not very wide. So you can come forward again. <laughs> I'm, I'm asking a question of the, the applicant. Um, I think there are two points here. The first point is that um, when we did discuss the possibility of closing up Mayo Lane with um, highways, um, it was realised that if, if that was done, 
um, vehicles such as bin lorries wouldn't be able to turn around. They wouldn't have enough space to do that. So that was why, an, a reason why that was ruled out as an option. Um, with regard to a condition, therefore, I, d I don't think we could agree to that. However, we have agreed to a condition requiring um, traffic calming measures on Mayo Lane, which are not yet fixed and could be would be agreed through further discussion with highways. Um, I think what the committee, as we've heard, are discussing is the, the significant impact on the amenity of the, the people in that lane. I mean, they always it's always already recognised as a cut through, and. Uh, the, the committee clearly wants to do something to to alleviate that problem, uh, and it is a problem in real life. I mean, you know, beyond planning committees and the work that you do, uh, you know, we, we, we live in a world where uh, planning developments have an impact on existing residents. And so if we as a committee can do something to alleviate that and can work with you as a developer, and I think we've really tried hard, you know, through these, this application process to do that, uh, and I know that you have... Badminton has a reputation and a track record and all these sort of things, but we are working really hard to try and work with you on it. Uh, to, to have something more than painted roads, which actually doesn't stop the traffic, because you know, people who want to go fast down a road will go fast down a road. To some people, they're a challenge. You know, they, some people see a, a sign which flashes 30, and there it all shows you the speed and they actually challenge it to go faster and faster. So it is a real practical problem that faced by committees to try and to deal with allocations which they probably wouldn't have agreed with had they asked for in the first place, and we're trying to make the best of a bad, a bad lot. So uh, we would really seek your agreement to have something more, some more significant uh, features that would, would block traffic from using, through traffic, from using Mayo Lane, uh, you know, subject to work with highways on that issue. I mean, highways can stop anything they don't want to do, quite frankly. But uh, you know, they seemed in our in our informal discussion open to the idea of of something. Yes. Let, let, let Sean answer the question. Um, yeah, as I, as I said, um, the white lines was just the initial proposal. We are willing to explore alternative options. Would you be Would you be willing to to uh, Accept options which, uh, which provided physical barriers to stop Mayo Lane being used as a, as a through road. Um, potentially, but that would need to be agreed with East Sussex Highways. If East Sussex Highways were happy with that, would you be happy with that? Um, yes. All right. And, 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 and so I'm, I'm sort of banking that when you say yes. <laughs> you do realise that I am banking that. Well, we have agreed a condition which will obviously require further further discussion with East Sussex on this point. Anyway. I've already so taken your yes as the answer. I mean, <laughs> th there's no guarantee in what, what is going to come forward right now, obviously, but well, um, it will be discussed with East Sussex. That's all I can say, really. Um, if East Sussex it's not a fixed proposal at this point in time. No, so if East so Sussex are happy with a proposal that will, that will uh, block through traffic, which is just not a don't turn left sign, which doesn't really do much to people who want to turn left, um, which is a physical barrier, then you would be accepting of that. That's what I'm asking. Yes, if East Sussex are satisfied that that wouldn't have any knock-on impact. Or well, I, I, let's just say if they're, if they're satisfied that... that okay. Is it, I'm, I'm taking that as a yes, that, you, that, that if they're in agreement, you will be in agreement. Yes. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, just, no, just, uh, just bear uh, Chairman, while you're interrogating, Sean... Uh, Councillor Barnes. Yes, it, it seems to me if the only reason why East Sussex uh, were against this was because of the impact on turning refuse vehicles, the agreement we would really need from the developer is to provide a turning facility on site. Because that no, I think, the, I think the issue is, no, the issue, uh, Councillor Barnes, is, is, is if you have Mayo Lane blocked completely at one end for a, a, a refuse vehicle to turn around within Mayo Lane, that's the issue. Uh, Councillor Harmer. A much cheaper option 
a post so that Bill Lorris can turn round. So, I, I think, I think we will. I think what we have is a as, as best a commitment that a an applicant can give within the meeting, and they will be held morally to that. You know, whether they can be held legally to it is another question. Um, and uh, there may be, there may be that may be the, that that councillor Harmer may be a, a, a solution. So let us uh, let us work with the county highways. Now, county highways. Whilst whilst my colleague to the left has said that that, that the highways weren't interested in that, I, I, I remember them saying not being not being committed. I don't think they'd sort of really considered it fully. So I just. Bear with me, yes. Uh, so we, we have put a condition in which regards off-site works. It's, sorry, it's part of the 106, but, but read it as such. Um, for off-site works, and it's worded as follows. The provision of suitable measures to discourage the use of Mayo Lane by vehicle traffic and to improve pedestrian safety. This could include new gateway features either end of the lane and possible traffic calming measures to be agreed. So th there is that possibility to, con to, to effectively have that continued discussion. Okay. That, they're useful words, but they, they, uh, gateways are interesting visual features, as is traffic calming visual interesting features, but they don't actually stop people going down there. And we're just, we're just asking to go that little step further uh, and have that actually committed into the into the conditions to appease the impact you know, should this be approved. Um, just, I'll just go to uh, Jasper had his hand up a minute ago. Jasper, did you want to say something? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to make the committee aware that it, I know it seems like we are accepting that we can't um, legally enforce the closure that we'd be seeking in this in this format. And I just wanted to double check that because Fundamentally, altering the traffic structure of a road would require a traffic regulation order, which is a separate process. So I think it's acknowledged at this stage that um, parties will explore that, um, which I think is where we've landed, then that's something that, that would be acceptable. But we can, definitely can't impose a condition that effectively secures the closure of, of, of that particular turning, because it would require an approval under completely different legislation. And it's not something that we could apply today. So exploring that um, something that would seem that we really was included anyway from, from the um, text that Peter just read out, but requiring something that require, that will shut down a turning is not something that we can do today. No. What, we're, what we are seeking to achieve here uh, to um, bring forward approval is a... Um, uh, an, ob uh, a, an obligation to to uh, work with highways to bring forward um, physical features which would actually stop the use of Mayo Lane as a through foot and and a moral if nothing else obligation by the applicant uh, to achieve that in other words they don't immediately appear appear and object to it which is a, a, which, which, apart from anything, is building a relationship with the applicant for the future as well. Uh, and I think that's important because even though planning is surrounded by uh, law uh, and policy, uh, to work with applicants requires a level of trust between both parties. And I think that's the important thing that we're trying to also establish here um, because we all know that it's a problem and, uh, and, and, and law and policy is, get, can get in the way of or what is common sense sometimes. So in terms of that um, exploring the outcome that we're seeking to achieve, how, how will we suggest that we'd secure that today? Good question. You're the lawyer. Tell us. <laughs> well, I, I, I think um, if we've got the condition that requires a discussion to occur with um, with the uh, East Sussex Highway, which I think we have, have heard from the applicant that that's there, um, I think the only thing we can do is seek to expand the parameter of that discussion, um, and that's as far as we can go today in terms of um, altering the conditions that we have on the table. All right. Uh, well, we will use the scope under the delegated powers to, to, to do that okay. and, and the moral obligation given by uh, the, 
by Sean. We, we appreciate being here. Um, well, I've got all sorts of people wanting to speak here. Um, and, but I will ask Sean because she wants to respond to that then. You don't want to speak in I think. And I would just like to clarify that we don't object to the principle of stopping up Mayo Lane. It's just whether it practically works. So I just uh, wanted to make that clear. Thank you very much. I mean, we are really trying hard to work to, to find a solution that works for as best we can for what many see as a, 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 a bad job, really. Not, not your application as such. You are achieve, trying to achieve um, approval for a, an allocated site by meeting the requirements of the policy and and you and you are doing that and what we're trying to do is blend that with the needs of residents as best as we can so I, I don't want you to take this as a a slight on on you quite the opposite we'd like to to try and build those relationships so that there is less confrontation in planning councillor barnes yes, i think you used a word which if it could be incorporated in the condition would be useful the word was physical. Um, it, if you can build a gateway out, that doesn't prevent a refuse vehicle passing on the wrong side of the road out into Waterman Lane. So if we can explore physical measures, not it seems to me that would be a useful addition to the condition that's already suggested. I think Jasper has said that we can't do that, but the... the the, the condition is written with sufficient flexibility and and we will um, the the uh, the agreements will be uh, subject to, to site by at least myself and I will be asking for a meeting with highways with officers as well uh, and and perhaps at the same time the, the applicant and between all those people to uh, to really make sure that isn't passed away as a sort of all we, we thought about it afterwards we couldn't do it uh, my take on the offices the other day with the highways offices was, was was that there was there was room uh, yes uh, councillor Barnes I wonder chairman whether we could take on that very good idea of councillor Arrington to actually be able to say our deep concern as a committee even whatever the outcome so that in your consultations with the county um, that Whatever, whatever else happens, that we are incredibly concerned about the well-being of the residents. So whether that could somehow be mirrored in We can, we can, we can, we can <coughs> absolutely mirror that. Um, thank you, Sean. I don't want to keep you in the hot spot for any longer than necessary. Um, good. Well, we've, 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 yes, Councillor Ganley. Uh, we are asked to grant outline planning with delegated authority to the delegated officer to resolve the outstanding highway safety issue. I think there is a re revised um, recommendation, isn't there, Matthew? Didn't you tell me there was a revised recommendation? <coughs> what? I haven't seen it. I, I the oh, the update that was circulated on um, Tuesday oh. uh, yeah, yeah. updated the um, recommendation to remove further consultation with highways. Could you, but, re could you read it out? Just so we're all sure. Um, I, I was going to say, but... Um, we do still need to finalise conditions and the 106 wording as well, so off-site um, improvement works to the highway, i.e. Mayo, Mayo Lane, one of those. So um, let me just find the updates. So, recommendation, this is in the update on Tuesday, it'd be resolved to grant outline permission with delegated authority to the delegated officer to confirm the satisfactory resolution of conditions and the completion of the Section 106 agreement. The 106 would secure things like affordable housing, off-site highway works, um, management of ancient woodland, um, various other items, the bus stops, um, any financial contributions like the cycle doctor and um, bike vouchers, um, contributions towards public transport, um, 
contributions towards the um, sports facility. So th there's a long, long list of things that would be secured by the obligation, but one of those would be the improvement works to Mayo Lane, which could be investigated further if that's the wish. Okay, and so just to add to that, the, um, uh, I would like to add to the, the uh, resolution the addition of a, uh, a review mechanism. Yeah? yeah? Yes? Uh, and uh, in consultation with the chairman, yeah? So that we can just make sure that happens. Uh, so we are at that sort of point. Um, do I want to hear from anyone on this? Uh, yes, Councillor. No, I'll be very quick. I promise I'll be very quick. If anybody wants to come down to um, St Mark's and have a look at something which I think um, Chair, Councillor um, Harmer suggested in that we're not suggesting a permanent closure, but we have three bollards on one of the two access points to Rosa Park. So the big access is on the 259 where there's a lot of traffic. The emergent, one of the, there's an emergency access that had three bollards across the road, which the, either the emergency service have keys to, to, or you can physically lift them up and put them down. So that would enable the refuse cart to come along Linfield Road, turn right into Mayo Lane, put the bollards down and drive out of Watermill Lane, having lifted the bollards up and, and then we contain Mayo Lane for the residents. That's just if you'd like to come down. Real, real quick one and then we just need to wrap this up, please. I wanted to move just on to discussion a little. We've been talking a lot about Mayo Lane. I do find this substandard access, which you I think... It is substandard for, from our point of view, but it has been approved as accessible by highways, and it's, uh, it's undesirable by any means, but that is, that's the point at which we are. We, we are going to be remembered for agreeing a substandard access, oh, I, and I, highways will not be blamed. Uh, well, I think you, you might want to, to remember whoever wrote the policy in the first place, because they... They, they, they thought it was a good idea cutting, making a significant uh, earthworks into a, into a sunken lane, which I don't like either. Uh, but uh, but I'm, we, we are sort of, we are in the, between the rock and the hard place, if you like, as a committee. Um, I, I, will, I will do the undesirable thing of proposing the recommendation, as was just read out a few minutes ago with those two additions, if anyone would like to uh, second that. Uh, Councillor Gandhi is seconding that, so I'm going to ask for uh, those in favour of uh, that recommendation. That's uh, six, yeah? Those against that recommendation? Is that five? Four, no, five. Four. Is that right? Anyone who's abstaining? And one abstention. So that is, uh, that is approved, and uh, I think on that basis I'm going to have a 10-minute break, which will take us just up to 2 o'clock. Okay? The committee meeting of Thursday, the 23rd of March. Uh, Councillor Byrne and Ganley, if I could ask you to um, uh, concentrate. That's all right. Thursday, the 23rd of March. It's a yeah, yeah, Always important to blame it on Councillor Ganley. Uh, so it's the last application of today, which is uh, 2021 2545 P, and that's Watermill Lane. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to um, Matthew Worsley to present. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. This is the third application um, under consideration that's been submitted by Gladman. Um, this is not an allocated site. Um, however, it does adjoin the development boundary for Bexhill. Um, the proposal is for 80 houses. Again, 30% of which would be affordable, so 24 in total. Um, 
open space would be provided, um, a wildlife area towards the northwest, which I will show you. Um, but all the plans, again, are indicative apart from the access, and we've got some detailed access drawings that I will show you. Um, similar works, similar improvement works are proposed to Watermill Lane, um, as in the previous application for 3B, um, in the, on that, that stretch between the access to 3B and Mayo Lane, um, a pavement will be introduced um, in the road reduced in width to have this priority arrangement. Um, so there are two, in terms of, actually I'll, I'll leave that for now and get on to the details of the highways later. Um, so going back to the plans, um, the site is to the southern side of the North Bex Hill Access Road, or MVAR, or Havenbrook Avenue, um, and west of Watermill Lane. Um, there are a series of four fields at the moment. Um, which probably best to look at on this um, development framework plan um, before this, although this is indicative only, um, it's proposed that three of the fields would be, um, would, would have the housing built with the field to the northwest where you've got the woodland um, kept as a wildlife area, which is arguably the more sensitive part of the site, so you'd retain that buffer that was um, extend to the west. Um, in terms of the infrastructure for this site, um, I think Jeff and Peter touched on it earlier, that given the location of this site next to three other allocated sites, um, and that this site shares Watermill Lane, it was, from our point of view, officer point of view, it was appropriate that this unallocated site should also meet the requirements of BEX3. Um, so in terms of drainage, um, highway improvements, um, improvements to the footpath network, providing this green corridor um, and all the other infrastructure requirements. So. In terms of drainage, um, both foul and surface water, it's very much the same as the other two sites. Um, so both Southern Water and the Leaf Local Flood Authority raise no objection. Um, Southern Water, acknowledge, again, acknowledge um, capacity will have to be increased at some point. That is for further discussions. Um, surface water drainage, Attenuation, you can see attenuation plans, ponds, sorry, at the south side of the site, which makes sense because the fields slope that way towards the stream. Um, and again, uh, the, the likely solution here will be to attenuate surface water runoff um, and then release it at greenfield rates to the watercourse. In terms of of highway improvements, um, we have some further plans. So, so the access access to the site, and I will probably need to do the same as before because this has been reorientated. So, I'll just go. We'll do previous. Previous, so access to the site is proposed here. Um, the plan we have, the, the zoomed-in plan of the detail, has been 
reorientated. So just for you to be aware. So this is the particular access proposed with pavements either side. Um, I know when we were on site, we looked at the distance to the bend um, and it seemed rather close, which, which it is. Um, the, highway, the Highway Authority have been consulted on this and raised no objection subject to appropriate visibility displays being provided, which they advise are 43 metres. I have looked at our mapping system and the plans and from from the from the exit point down down to the corner is fifty meters. So the forty three meters is approximately in this blue area, which is, is the requirement for this road. Um, which fit fits in with the suggested condition from highway, the Highway Authority because they've said something along the lines of prior to the occupation of the development, the visibility displays shall be provided. We haven't got the exact detail of that in terms of um, where boundary treatments will have to be planted or whatever, but given given the measurements between the corner and where the access is, um, there is scope for an acceptable solution to be found. So if you looked at the access, in terms of off-site highway works, um, a pavement is proposed along the southern side of Watermill Lane. It will go round the corner and then it will continue south and link in with the allocated Bex 3B site. The applicant and Council officers um, appreciate that um, there's no guarantee which development would come forward first. So there are two options. In the event that um, this, in the event this is granted permission and then um, comes forward before the Bex 3B site, um, the improvement works to the highway to Watermill Lane would need to be completed in full. So that section between the proposed access on this site and the Bex 3B site would have to be provided together with all those improvements we discussed for the 3B allocation. So the inclusion of the um, priority junction, um, the improvements to Mayo Lane as well. So there are two, two options in terms of the highway <coughs> improvements. And this is the detail we saw earlier, which was discussed at length about Mayo Lane. Um, again, with this application, um, all consultees raise no objection subject to conditions being imposed or obligations secured by legal agreement. 80 houses are proposed here. 24 will be affordable. Um, we appreciate this is outside of the development boundary of Bexhill, but as Jeff um, explained earlier, this is next to three allocated sites. In landscape terms, when it was assessed, it was only moderate, 
there was moderate capacity here. It wasn't ruled out. It was, um, it was considered appropriate. But at that time, at the time of allocation, there was no requirement for this um, site to be allocated housing, and therefore it was left out. Moving forward, given the need for more houses, um, Jeff explained this, this site makes sense. Um, locationally and in landscape terms. You will have noted, noted on site, um, as we drove along the M bar, this site sits at a much lower ground level than, than the road. You read it sitting surrounded by three allocated sites. It, it has no wider landscape impact. You have to... It has to be accepted the character will change from open fields to housing. But that is the same for the other sites surrounding, surrounding this. Um, and in, in the indicative plans, there is a lot of greenery left. All the established woodland summation will be retained. The boundary trees and hedges will be retained. This green corridor along the stream will be retained and enhanced with better footpaths and cycleways improved, which will be a benefit to existing residents and future residents. This site will also contribute <laughs> towards the sports facilities on BEX 3A. Um, that will be a financial contribution. So there are many positive aspects that weigh in favour of this scheme. The only thing really against this scheme is the fact it sits outside the current development boundary to Bexhill. But as you know, we have a real shortfall in housing and we can only demonstrate the 2.78 years for five years supply at the moment. And in terms, in terms of policy, that means um, we have to have extremely good reasons to refuse schemes like this where they're otherwise policy compliant. Um, there are no reasons in officers' opinions and all consultees why permission should be refused for this. Um, and the benefits of the scheme as a whole far outweigh simply that it's outside of the development boundary, given we've got such a shortfall in housing. So that, in summary, is why the recommendation is to approve. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Uh, we have two people speaking against this application. Uh, and Debbie, would you want to come forward? Yeah. Debbie Shoesmith. I'm not totally sure what I'm going to say to you, if I'm honest, because all that I've said before applies to this, and that's been taken out of our hands. I will say, in your recommendation to use these fields, it, it probably doesn't. It probably does make sense to you guys. It might not to us who walk up that lane and see the green fields and everything all the time, and walk our dogs and such. Though. We've looked after that land, in actual fact, because the owners did not. Can I just say that it's so disappointing that we're once again talking about planning and more and more houses at that part because the impact, again, on Mayo Lane that everyone is talking about but nobody seems to be listening to us, really, is going to be phenomenal. And I just, I actually really don't know what to say to you all. I feel passionate about it. I love that lane. I've already rung my husband and told him, unfortunately, that it looks like it's going to go ahead and he said we need to talk later. I really thought that was our forever home, but I don't think so now. But for 80 houses, it could make a difference if we didn't build those 80 houses. It would make a difference to the traffic because we'd be possibly 160 cars less. So I'd like that to be considered. 
The other issue that I do have is the MVAR again. To, to somebody like myself, who's lived in Bexhill all my life, and I really don't understand all this, this is not my field. It's the most obvious answer. But why can't we seem to move on from that? And as for the, the, the other thing I don't understand, and I'll say it quite passionately, why did the highways voice all these concerns and then a few days ago suddenly change their mind? I don't understand that either. And I think the public at Bexhill will want to understand that too. And I, totally, I can't even begin to say anymore. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, do we have Joe Yusuf to speak? Yes, thank you, Joe. Good afternoon. I'm Joe Yusuf. I'm a resident of Mayo Lane. I live on the junction between Mayo Lane and Watermill Lane. I'm going to be repeating some things because obviously it's applicable to the uh, application we were looking at earlier. The access to this development will be via Watermill Lane. A shortcut for vehicles accessing Watermill Lane will be Mayo Lane. Just to reiterate, Mayo Lane is a narrow country lane. In places there's not enough room for two cars to pass. Residence drives open directly onto the lane. There are no pavements nor adequate space for safe pavements. Pedestrians, children and horse riders share the lane with their vehicles. At times this results in some terrifying near misses. Watermill Lane is also narrow in places and mostly attracts pedestrians and horse riders. Many local dog owners use Watermill Lane regularly. Watermill Lane, because of bends, is not an easy route to drive down. It's been suggested that pavements <coughs> be built on Watermill Lane and Mayo Lane. In my opinion, both lanes are too narrow to allow this. If space is left for vehicle use, then the pavement width would not be sufficient for a wheelchair or children's buggy to pass each other. With the existing route to the proposed development at Watermill Lane, then Mayo Lane will become a rat run for those who want to avoid driving towards Sidley. Potential extra cars coming down May and Waterloo Lane will change the character of both lanes. There is a solution in sight, or I thought there was earlier on, use N-Bar. This would bypass Mayo Lane and most of Waterloo Lane and entail less, di less disruption and less alteration of the existing lanes. During the consultation period for N-Bar, the developers explained that one of the main advantages was that access to the forthcoming Housing developments will be via NBAR, thus avoiding the precise problems that local residents are facing now. If you stand at the proposed building site, then you can almost lean forward and touch the new road. I and others have asked why work could not be done to accommodate an access point on that roundabout, that road. And we received explanations such as a third party owns a piece of land, C change Sussex, uh, Sussex owns nearby land and nothing can be done until the road is adopted. I haven't seen any documentation as to where the developers tried to contact C change or anyone to look at the alternative to uh, having the entrances on uh, Watermill Lane. I wrote to uh, ESCC, the uh, Transport Development Control, uh, who deal with new with the effects on roads of new new houses, who did give some points as to why the access to N Bar was not possible, but none of those problems seemed insurmountable. It made me wonder why couldn't the energy and work has gone on in trying to adapt Watermill Lane and Mayo Lane for a purpose they were never designed for, why was not some of that work done to look at the possibility of using the end bar as an access point? I don't agree that using end bar would lead to a disconnect with Sydney, with uh, Sydney, Sydney, probably with Sydney, with Sydney. Um, I can't see. I can't really see the connection. Really, that uh, we expect thousands of people just because we've got the uh, development there to walk down uh, Waterloo Lane. 
this is Italy. It makes no sense to ignore a possible access route which is metres away from the development that would entail little disruption to residents in the local area. At the very least, we should look at the costings or if it could be achieved before just dismissing it. I suppose the last thing I'm going to say is let common sense prevail. I can't believe decisions are made uh, when there's an existing road there, but its existence is ignored when the decision is made. It, it seems almost Python-esque. Keep the lanes, use the road. That's it. I'm finished. Yeah. Uh, do we have some questions for the, uh, for the speakers? Questions from the speakers? No questions from the speakers. What, uh, I'll ask you a question. Yeah. What, what, was, what is your reaction to, the sh should it be approved? Uh, there will be a lot of discussion about the site, I'm sure. Should it be approved that, uh, that, the, the, uh, the, that the highways changes uh, if, if we can uh, negotiate those be made? <coughs> Stop traffic coming, any traffic coming into the mayor lane. Obviously, I'd like traffic slowed down, stopped coming down mayor lane. And I'd quite like a public a residence involvement in it, really. Um, I mean, a, cons a proper consultation to ask residents what they feel before a decision is made. But yes, I agree, and I think it's a good idea. Right, can I just say something as well? Yes, you can. Add to that. As much as I want to protect my own lane, because I live there, if that was to happen, my, my concern also would be, what about the poor residents in Watermill Lane? Because they're not here, sadly, to represent them, but they're then going to get massive issues as yes. well. Yes. Because, in, as I've already said before, cars park there, cars park there, that does make this bit and that bit single lane. Yes, so thank, you for, thank you for that comment. Uh, other questions for other questions? Thank you very much. I, I can assure you, your your comments and what you've said have been taken very much to, to heart by this committee, and and and, and I hope that you'll uh, at least recognise that in the previous two decisions, uh, planning committees are highly constrained, more than you would expect them to be, particularly where it comes to statutory authorities like the Highways Authority. Uh, if they say yes, to challenge them is such a high bar that that you're nearly guaranteed loss at an appeal, which, which ha the impact of that loss is, uh, well, uh, one appeals cost us, I think, probably 170, 80,000 pounds, and that money comes out of the council tax <laughs> directly. I mean, it's a, there's a direct relationship between the two and the loss of significant new homes bonus, which we're, we're required to take into account. Uh, that, that's not a particularly, that, that's not a satisfying planning system that we work under and all I would say is that as you see the new um, local plan coming forward that is the time to, to, to really look at these plans and say that's right or that's wrong because that's the thing that constrains us years later I mean, these are, we're working against a, a, a DASA which you know that name now uh, which set the requirements six, seven years, eight years ago, something something like that, and uh, they are the constraints that the planning committee works to and moves away from at their, you know, at their peril, really. Mm. So uh, thank you for that, but I did want to say that because I know it can see the, it, it, it's easy to sort of say you, you should have made another decision, as you might have seen for the other applications, but the risks of doing so have been a harsh lesson to certainly the committee during the last four years, not necessarily all the same people you see here today. Uh, and uh, uh, and it's recognised. In fact, the in fact to the point. And I'm, I'll take this moment to say this because there are residents here that if, if if as a committee we refuse things that are then won at appeal, not only do we lose the new homes bonus, not only do we often take the cost, well there would be costs regardless. But if 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 uh, if twenty if twenty percent of twenty percent of the appeal, of appeals, yeah. So. 20% of appeals before we, we fall below the 10%, sorry. If we lose 10% of the appeals, major, major appeals, um, 
the government comes seriously asking questions and we've been in that position and had to go through significant sort of hoops to, to stop them basically taking over. Yeah? And when they take over, it's not a good situation. So I wanted to say that to, to you as the residents listening because uh, as a committee and as planning officers, uh, there are far more constraints. It is, it is very much a centrally, nationally, centrally driven system, even though it might appear sort of a lot of local control. And uh, that, that's, I just wanted to make that point for you. So thank you. Oh, and, and, we, and we appreciate the, the way that you have engaged. I say that, um, you know, from a, from a personal point of view, I would almost feel that um, because you have fallen foul and, and got fined, every planning com thing in Bexhill is going to be subject to, oh, my gosh, well, we might get fined, we might get fined. And it, it feels, that's how it feels to somebody who doesn't understand it very well. I that's, think that, that's how it feels to us, but I'm going to have to. I, I, I can't. I can't engage in further conversation on it. So appreciate that. But yeah, no, thank you for that. And I'm going to ask uh, uh, Sean Gulliver to come forward again. He's been waiting patiently. Thank you. Thank you and hello again and thank you again for the opportunity to speak. Um, as with the previous applications, I would like to firstly extend my thanks to officers for their professional consideration of this application. As officers said, whilst this site differs from BEX 3A and 3B in that it is not currently allocated for development, we have agreed with officers that it is appropriate to assess our proposals against policy BEX 3 and the site's position adjacent to those allocations makes it an undeniably logical location for growth. Moreover, in the context of a five-year housing land supply of just 2.7 years, equating to a significant shortfall of almost 2,000 homes, the delivery of up to 80 dwellings on this site, including 30% affordable, would make an important contribution to the Council's housing land supply. As set out in the report, there are no objections to the proposals from statutory consultees, and as fairly stated by the case officer, the development of the site should be considered in the context of the NDAR <coughs> and the surrounding allocated sites the development of which will permanently change the character of the area surrounding the site. As with the BEX 3B application, we have agreed an improvement scheme for Watermill Lane between the site access and the Mayo Lane Junction, which highway officers recognise represents the best solution with the within the context of constraints. Along with the traffic calming measures we had previously discussed on Mayo Lane, this will be secured through a Section 106 agreement. We have not set out with any fixed view on the off-site highway works. Our parameters are that the solution must be in accordance with planning policy, must be physically achievable within the adopted highway, and must not create disproportionate requirements based on the legal test for conditions and obligations. At this point, I'd like to mention again the MBAR, which has come up on this application, and the reason that we cannot propose access to the EMBA from either 3B or Watermore Lane is not just um, policy or ownership, it's also that um, SCC have advised that the levels won't work. There's quite a significant level increase from Watermore Lane up to the EMBA. Um, our proposals also offer the opportunity to enhance local bus travel through the provision of two new bus stops on the EMBA and again a financial contribution of £200,000 towards a bus service on that road. We're also looking to upgrade bus stops on Ninfield Road in the vicinity of Mayo Lane and Mayo Rise. The application also offers a commitment to providing each household with a cycle voucher contribution uh, and a contribution of £26,000 towards an electric vehicle car club and charging facilities for electric vehicles on all properties. The scheme will also provide a contribution towards the provision and maintenance of the outdoor sports facilities on Bex 3A. New housing would lead to the creation of jobs and increased spending within local services, and we estimate that this development would create around 150 jobs in construction and other industries. In addition, we have offered a financial contribution of £200 of dwelling towards the Council's input, support and monitoring of a local employment and skills plan. As officers have concluded, the proposals represent sustainable development in social, economic and environmental terms. And in the context of a five-year supply shortfall, the relevant test is whether any adverse impacts would significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits of granting planning permission when judged against the pre presumption in favour of sustainable development. We agree with officers that the provision of 80 dwellings, including 24 affordable properties, 
will make a valuable <coughs> contribution towards the district's housing land supply and should be afforded substantial weight in the planning balance. Officers have found that the conflict with out-of-date strategic policies would not significantly and demonstrably outweigh the benefits of, of our proposals. We fully support the officers' recommendation and hope you can too. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much again. And uh, a slightly different uh, application than the last ones. Do we have some questions for Sean? Yes, Councillor John Barnes. Yes, I, I have two questions. Um, the first is why you have located the access as close to the BEM when you own the whole site further towards the uh, other end of the cul-de-sac. Um, 50 metres is a very short distance when the vision spray is 47. It means the driver coming around that bend is going to have to react almost immediately. Um, the other question is slightly different um, because you've mitigated that by putting in a footpath. But I'm wondering why you've put the footpath by the side of the road rather than behind the hedge, uh, where it will be less visually intrusive and where you'd actually have physical separation between the traffic and the footpath. With regard to the um, position of the access, that has been established through um, a detailed access appraisal by our transport consultants and agreed with East Sussex Highways. As, as you say, the visibility displays um, would be adequate. Um, position of the footpath by the side of the road. Can I just clarify that you, which bit precisely you mean? Well, you could run a footpath along the line of the road, but inside the site boundary, Whereabouts? which will be visually uh, less intrusive and actually better for the pedestrians. I'm just wondering why you're running it along the side of the road. That's the existing track. You understand the question? Yes. Do you have, do you have the plan put up or something? Sorry? Do you have the plan put up on this? Um, yes, please. Could you put the plan up? Yeah. <coughs> yes, it's just a ruin for you. It's a dead lock. Yeah. Waiting for that. I, I am also interested in why the access. I, I know that it's, it's an acceptable access in all the terms that we've described, but it would make a lot more sense. I mean, you have internal roads which are parallel to the to the lane and it would it just seems it would make so much more sense in safety terms to achieve a higher level of safety having it further down and it just seemed to be a, a, a very unusual place to put it in perhaps the most dangerous place uh, whilst it might be acceptable although I find it hard to know that it would be acceptable uh, as when you could have had it further down the lane the access has been positioned to max uh, in the, in the in an agreed position with East Sussex Highways, and I think the, the geometry and land ownerships and constraints such as a, a culvert um, along Watermill Lane have, have all influenced the position of that access. I'm afraid I can't con comment in detail on those discussions about access as I'm not a, a highways engineer. What's the plan? You're, you're, Joel, I think you're talking about the... the, the um, footpath being on the inside of that yellow area. Yes. Yeah? Running along and then and then cutting back onto the road. Hmm. From a safety point of view, wouldn't that make a lot more sense? Yes. What you're saying, I believe. Actually, what I was saying. We'll ask both Sean and also, the officer. It would also the... safeguard the character of the road to some extent, which is currently a country lane. Don't think there'll this be much will of... be a much more suburban appearance. I don't think there'll be much left of the character of the road by the time they put that access in, I'm afraid. Could you uh, respond? Yeah, um, I think the reason for that is that um, we try to... Um, allow for pedestrian as much pedestrian access along Watermill Lane as possible. So the footpath um, comes out of the Watermill Lane access because it can then link to the footpath yeah. all the way up Watermill 
lane. Um, between Watermill Lane and Bex 3 B-Sides, there is a watercourse, so therefore the footpath could not, like, there would be no way to, to cross at that point um, if, you were, have, if you had the footpath within the site, hence, hence the, the exiting of the footpath onto Watermill Lane. I think we'll, we'll, we'll ask officers in a minute and a bit more. They might have a bit more detail on that. I suspect it might be to do with the green corridor. Questions? Other questions? Well, I've got the same questions as I asked before, so I'm sure you're fully prepared for them. <laughs> so the first question is, uh, are you prepared to have a review mechanism if a viability assessment is asked for at a later date? Yes, we Thank are. Thank you, that's a good answer. I don't need any further answer on that. And the second question is, are you amenable to, uh, to uh, road features in Mayo Lane uh, subject to East Sussex um, County Council Highways approval that would uh, effectively stop movement from these developments, this development, down mm -hmm. Mayo Lane? Um, yes, everything I said on the previous application applies to this. All right, thank you very much. Uh, other questions? Other questions? Well, thank you very much. I know you've been sitting there very patiently for many hours for just a few minutes speaking, and we do appreciate that. So thank you. Good. Uh, Councillor Carol Corman. We'll swap them around if you like. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, uh, yes, it's the same of the same. Uh, I looked at the, uh, the highways. They have an objection, uh, which is nice to see. Um, but there, we had a problem there a couple of years ago when a lady got knocked over, a, a lady that's um, born and bred in uh, the area, and um, uh, since this um, uh, thing, she was taken to hospital uh, because we're looking at safety in these areas, and um, uh, the family deteriorated from this accident, and I'd, I'd done her funeral earlier this month, and her husband now is in a nursing home. He has lost a lot of his abilities. And to see the highways with an objection is very nice. But these things do go on. And there's people, we're all talking about people that drive their cars nicely. These aren't the people that we've got around us, especially when they're going to work or finish work. So just take this in mind because there's going to be an accident. And you're the ones that are going to go for it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Carroll. Uh, I would say this to all councillors before Councillor Coleman comes on as a local plan comes forward as this one has done a few years ago I think it caught people by surprise but I think it is absolutely important that all members when these plans come for consultation really at a local level um, drill down and look at the detail and, and question the officers because I suspect that many of the discussions we're having today, we wouldn't be ha happening if that, that had happened. And I do appreciate that th these plans took people by surprise because it was the first time that really such development was happening. It's just a warning for the uh, future or advice for the future. Councillor Coleman. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, uh, I need, don't need to go over the previous issues raised on the other two applications, only to maintain that those issues of access infrastructure and wildlife, all of that still remains for this one. Likewise, the public opposition to this remains strong. Uh, and uh, as my colleague alluded to, I, I, I do believe these, the highway's concerns, though they have been changed after a discussion, um, should still be heeded because I think they are still very much re re relevant. However, there is the additional factor here, um, that is that this site is not allocated. And whilst the two previous sites were in the DASA, which, if we're being honest, was sort of drafted back in like 2015, um, albeit it was finally ratified in 2019, um, this site is not in the DASA, and so presumptions in favour of development should not be made as strongly as the report suggests, I don't think, just because it's proximate to the other sites. I mean, that's, that's textbook encroachment, isn't it? Um, it wouldn't be acceptable anywhere else in Rother, so it shouldn't happen in Sidley countryside especially as we have so little. The comparison yet again in the report to Friars Way seems to illustrate a fear of precedent, something perhaps wise from an officer's perspective, but not something that should prevent a planning committee from their determination to thoroughly scrutinise these applications, especially where there is so much concern. Obviously, I prepared my thoughts for today not knowing 
which direction committee would go with the other two applications or what last minute updates would be curveballed into the discussion. That said, the committee in any case needs to give special consideration to the issues on this site, even where they were dismissed on the previous two, as this is not allocated land, this is countryside. And this is not for its way either. This is a country lane whose users, whether they come by foot, hoof or poor, have already seen enough urban expansion happening around them. Build houses, yes, we've given outline permission for, for two sites nearby. Um, but don't do so at the expense of all of Sidley's remaining countryside. This is precious green space and I, I really hope you have the courage to protect it. And if I may just say one final thing, aside from planning, just on a more emotional aspect. What is, what is the point of this committee? What is the point of you guys being here today if you can listen to the emotions of, of residents, of local councillors? You all seem to agree mostly that this is not ideal. If you cannot somehow contextualise that in a planning form in a way that is acceptable to a planning inspector at appeal stage that is not acceptable in planning law, then what is the point? So please have courage, find those reasons. Find those reasons to, to, to object to this, because the people of Sydney will thank you and you will go down as a planning committee that has courage to take those local decisions. Please, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Sam, very much. And, and I'm, I'm just going to respond to a point there, because I, and I think it's really important, because people will often say, well, what is the point, you know? And, uh, and I think there are, I, I view it as three different types of applications. Those with presumption of development, allocated sites, and the, and the committee is, in that sense, is one more of review and challenge to officers to make sure everything, to, to make sure the policy has been um, applied correctly and in, in completely. The second is a, another application which may or may not be within a development boundary, and, uh, and they're ones of balance of decision, you know, balance of policy, and the planning committee has more flexibility within constraints of central government because when you fall below the, their five-year supply, of course, you, you, you revert in many senses to the NWPF and, and uh, those who live in the AMB, uh, as Councillor Barnes will uh, more often than not tells us, uh, have even further constraints to, to deal with or not to deal with. And, and the third type is, of course, ones where your judgment is completely subjective and they're, far more, they're much more limited and, and there you have a greater degree of freedom, and that's that. They are, but that's the way I see it, um, and and you have to work within that. So this one sits uh, uh, somewhere in the middle category, really, uh, and and that's where we are on that. So uh, sorry to sort of <laughs> have these little little things in the middle, but there we go. I'll go to Cathy Harmer first, and then to Brian. Thank you, Chair. <coughs> um, I echo Councillor Coleman's words. What on earth are we doing sat around this table if we can't do the, which has been mentioned a lot, the morally right thing? Um, nothing personal, but I think your organisation has been incredibly greedy. Um, it is business, I get that. But this last application, in my opinion, is just one too many. It's 80 houses, but it's at least 160 cars. And... Um, I personally would love to see people step up and reject this one. I think Gladman um, have got quite a lot already and maybe, hopefully in the future, if it's still on the table and we've managed to get this new access with the purpose-built link road, maybe you can come back to the party and have another look. But right now I think these people... Um, deserve a le at least a little bit of peace. And, and I don't know if it's doable, but in my opinion, um, it's overdevelopment. Uh, very much density, whether that's a thing that comes back in reserve matters and what have you. I think the access is dangerous and poor, um, and it isn't in the DASA. So whether we could scratch around with that lot, another reason, I don't know. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Dresden. Uh, thank you. This may sound remarkably similar to the last two people that spoke. Uh, first of all, I want to sympathise with the views by uh, Debbie Shoesmith and Joe Yusuf about who have to live there. Um, this site is not within the DASA, but we're being asked to allow this one because it's, well, it's close to it, isn't it? Imagine the uproar if somebody wanted to put something in the AOMB. Well, no, it's close to it, so we'll allow it. There would be uproar. 
So this is important. It must have been excluded for a reason. We don't know what that reason is, but it would be obvious looking at that map, you'd include that as well. But for some reason, it wasn't included. We put great stock by the first two today that they were in DASA. So we should actually be put in equal weight to the fact that this one isn't in the DASA report. Uh, 80 less houses could mean 160 less cars. Hey, that's, that's a help, isn't it, on that road? If we were of a mind to refuse this application, bearing the wording, does it have to be solely on the access, or is it the outline planning commission full stop that we can refuse? Would you like to take that question, please? Uh, yes, yes, thanks, <laughs> Councillor. <clears throat> and I, I think we have to consider that planning considers not just policy, so you're absolutely correct. This should be deemed outside the, the development boundary. It is. It is deemed countryside. But we do know from decisions against the council that count, a countryside can come forward for development if effectively you do not have a local plan that is delivering against the targets. And as we know from the last inquiry that we had, which was a outside the development boundary, it was countryside, the inspector heard our arguments but agreed that in terms of the five-year land supply, the site should come forward. As case officers, we've assessed both arguments in terms of it is out the boundary, it is countryside, but in terms of the policy position, we have to therefore bring the site forward. So it would comply with planning requirements to bring the site forward and hence we've allowed with the applicant to bring in policy BEX3, cumulative impact, to understand how the site comes forward. I think the other thing we need to just factor is that, yes, it might be 80 less units and 150 less cars, but I think we also have to acknowledge that the policy, and that's not here on the table, is that BEX3C will also still come forward. And that is 150 units, which is 300 cars. So whether we have 80 less units at all or not, we've had to assess this in cumulative impact, not only on this site here, but where do those other units go if we do not allow this development to occur? Because as a planning policy and as a planning committee, you have to drive that agenda for growth. And that would have impact on far more sensitive areas. Why was the site excluded? Because it was felt that the landscape had of some value, but not substantive value, that the landscape excluded development. In light of the surrounding development and the end bar effectively cutting the site off from the countryside, in planning terms, it's deemed totally suitable for development. And according to those criteria, we have judged that the site should come forward. Thank you. Uh, the Barnes, yeah? Oh, sorry. So I just like I say, I, I accept that. That's very well argued. I just think it will be a bit ironic in the future when we talk about biodiversity on a site when actually there's plenty there already and could be just left alone. Uh, Councillor, uh, you can come back in a second. Councillor Barnes, yeah. Yes, I, I want to test an argument that this is premature. Um, what is worrying me about this is we've talked a lot about the cumulative impact and uh, our planning officer quite properly has said and there is a further site coming online. All we've had as far as I've heard um, and I realise this is more for highways than us but I think we have to think of the impact on the immunity of the area and on safety. Um, We've had a three-day traffic survey over Easter. Um, I'm not sure that you can properly gauge the cumulative impact uh, from something as limited as that. And I really think we, it's not that I'm against the principle of de development here, uh, because I rather agree with uh, uh, Mr. Dykas, 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 uh, um, the principle probably 
ultimately is that Islam will go for development. But we don't need to rush on that um, because we've got uh, the existing sites in the DASA already agreed in effect in presumption. So it turns to my mind to some extent on uh, waiting a little measuring much more accurately the cumulative impact. And I'm strengthened in waiting because I really cannot see why the particular issue in front of us has been resolved in the way it is. Um, I just make three points. We're told the land levels preclude access uh, to the bypass. I have to remind you this lane originally continued uh, so on the other side, which comes into the roundabout, it is the existing lane. Presumably, therefore, this lane could link to the roundabout. I don't know, and I would want to see the engineering arguments against that, <coughs> since it was actually originally a continuous lane. The access seems to be almost willfully uh, close uh, to a bend. I know it's technically satisfactory, uh, but really, from the point of view of a driver coming to that bend, he would have to react almost instantly as he went round it, because you're almost onto the vision spray within 21, no, about 20, 23 feet. <coughs> That's not very long for a reaction time. Um, I really think I'd like to hear a lot more argument why you couldn't have gained a little more to the left. All that land appears to be in the applicant's ownership. Uh, there may be good engineering reasons, but it seems to me uh, that we haven't heard them today, and the applicant's representative couldn't answer that question. And then I really would, although this is probably a matter of detail, I think actually, again, we are suburbanizing this lane unnecessarily, when it would actually be visually less intrusive and better if the footpath was inside the hedge and not running along the roadside edge. I think all of these <coughs> things could be addressed, but I personally think there is a strong argument to say not that this application is wrong, but that it's premature. Here's a question for you. I'm not proposing anything either way. I'm placing a question to you. Which may be rhetorical, I'm not sure. It's outside the development boundary in a rural area. It's for access only, and the highways have said it meets whatever their minimum criteria is. So you are never going to win on an argument that says, I refuse this on access. I'm just simply, that's as simple as that. Don't, don't speak here. You aren't. You know, I, whether, and that's indisputable unless you have got, unless you can find a highways. Export expert that can um, jump over the highways authority's goal. So you then say, I, I feel this application is is premature, yeah, and uh, it's too much at one time. So uh, alternatively, the one on the opposite side might come forward, and that's an allocated site. So that could have happened at the same time, but from appeals. What would the what would an inspector say in this circumstance? What would they say? That's that's really more the question you've got to ask yourself. If I gave, I can't give the highways a reason as a refusal, even though I prefer the access to be on the N bar. You have to deal with the application that's in front of you. Is there another reason that I would give for refusal? It's not an allocated site. Is is the reason? And then you have to say I have a 2.7 year housing supply. And the NWPS says that there's a tilted balance. It's not in the AMB. So there's a tilted balance in favour of development. And like any access-only application, uh, frustratingly, you're not dealing with the detail to be able to say, well, I think there's a major ecological issue or, or whatever. And, and we've all, and you know this, this argument as, as much as anyone. So I put that question back to you because they're the questions that you need to, to answer to successfully uh, have a make a different decision, or you know, refuse it, approve. And that that's where you sit. I, I think I've got to say that because I, I I have the undesirable position of you know also having to um, 
uh, guide you in the risks you know, with these sort of applications. And I'm not proposing one way or the other. I must state that at the moment because I don't find it a particularly palatable application. Uh, if for no other reason, the one that you've pointed out, why on earth would you put there, put an access directly on a corner when you could have put it somewhere else? But that's, you know, that's, that's, that's where we are. So there we are. So it, it seems to me, though, Chairman, we have a right to challenge whether the Highways Authority has done an adequate job in assessing this entrance and the weight, cumulative weight of traffic. I've heard no evidence from the Highways Authority. All they do is give us a blanket assurance that this meets. It seems to me as a planning committee, where you have time, and we do have time here, because this is not a DASA site, we ought to actually challenge the Highways Authority uh, to come forward and explain their reasoning, explain the research they've done, explain why they are satisfied. Because at the moment, we are having to take as gospel truth uh, that they somehow think that any other access on this stretch of straight road uh, would be unacceptable. No reason given. Uh, all they've said is this just about accommodates our vision display, which they've, uh, I presume it's for a 40 mile an hour, because 47 metres is not very much. Uh, I'm going to ask, what, what, is the, what, is the, what is the speed on this road? Is it, is it? It's 30, is it? Definitely 30 all the way along. Yeah? No, no, what is, the, what is the speed limit on this road? Can you tell us the speed limit on this road? The Highway Authority have advised it's 30 miles per hour. Um, and that's the basis of their comments of requiring 43 metre visibility space. But just before you come in, Brian, do you and mind? And they can't make it 30. There are no street lights. Uh, I mean, that is contrary to traffic law. It's only we know what the speed limit on the road is. I did ask this question the other day. A 30 mile an hour has to be lit and the standards have to be a certain distance apart. Uh, you can't suddenly... Oh, uh, I think Miles just wants to say something. It's just on that point of prematurity, paragraph 50 of the MPPA, and I'll quote, uh, where planning permission is refused on grounds of prematurity, it's not premature, it's the local planning authority will need to indicate clearly how planning permission for the development concerned would prejudice the outcome of the plan-making process. So that's on prematurity. I'll well, draw a plan, attention a plan, to... A plan's not sufficiently far forward. No, exactly, but it was a planning decision, and that was a piece I quoted, and it did come up from, from Councillor Barnes. Um, the other thing I would uh, just refer to is paragraph 111, which is very personal here. And paragraph 111 says development should only be prevented or refused on highways grounds if there would be an unacceptable impact on highway safety or the residential cumulative impacts on the road network would be severe. So that is a very high bar. Also, think back to the appeals training, I think it was last May, about uh, getting the decision right, overturns for major applications and the very low success rate of defending appeals on highways grounds where they are overturned, major applications that committee. So just, just um, brought that to the table. Councillor Drayson, yeah? right. and then Councillor Gray. Thank you. Uh, two questions. One, I should know the answer, but as it's not in the DASA, this figure of 80 for houses has appeared from somewhere. Surely we're not constructed, constricted to that figure. We were in the other two, but this one just says 80. And if we say yes today, we up commit to, up to 80. 80. Up, to up to 80. Yeah, thank you. Well, let's have up to 40 then. Um, and, well, you know, it's a, it's a it's figure a plucked out of the air. It's determined in reserve matters as to the density and the lay of the land and what you can fit in. Yeah. yeah. I wonder how many applications there are that have ever been less than the figure that says up to. 
and they only ever go one way. Well, could, I, could I ask Mr. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Joyce? You're becoming uh, I very think, cynical in your old age. Um, actually, East Sussex Highways have actually been a little bit more involved in this, these applications than just putting a, a pen to paper. Uh, am I right in thinking that? Yes, there's a planning performance agreement on PPA that they were co-signatories to, and they've been working closely with the developer and ourselves. So the point of a planning performance agreement is to work together towards a common goal, which is to find a, a successful outcome as far as possible to a development scheme. Um, it doesn't always happen, but it is a good vehicle to actually have resource which is uh, put into that process on all sides. That's a great please, yeah. I don't think we should re I don't think we should refuse this on highway grounds. I think we should refuse it on biodiversity grounds. We've already lost a huge amount of the fields surrounding this. <laughs> well, because it's not in the dust now. And we need green fields. We need PTS. I know you said we need growth. But the endless growth is just destroying the planet. Councillor, could I, could I answer? Is, is, I think we have to, to have a look at what the harm versus the benefit of this scheme. This is private land. It's got no public access. So all those fields that we see are not accessible to the public. It's got a low ecological value because most of them are just grasslands. What you're getting in return in this scheme and I accept that visually it feels like countryside, but the reality is it will no longer be countryside. It's going to be built around it. And we have worked hard to ensure that the environmental integrity of the sites and the adjacent sites are still maintained. So considerable work in terms of creating space along the green corridor. The space, there's another stream that actually goes up towards the M-bar. That is expanded in the condition that there's a, cor a green corridor along that. There is protection against the ancient woodlands and funding to maintain that. And there's a, a, a contribution in terms of general landscape and biodiversity, all accessible to the public. So what we take in a private site, which appears to be countryside, and we are actually, in a strange way, actually enhancing the ecological dynamics of the site within the broader corridor. And if you look at the plans, the plans are particularly green because there's an awful lot of landscaping within the schemes themselves. So um, we have worked to try and address losing those fields, but there are other far more critical parts of Rother that really do need protection. And when we have a shortage in the housing supply, we have to manage that expectation of where that housing actually goes. And in reality, this will eventually become an urban site, a suburban site, and we have done our best to ensure that some of that green framework is still maintained in perpetuity around the site. Can I just say, I, I admire your ability to give such good answers. But, um, well, yes. <laughs> um, it, is there any way we can go to the government and say, look, we cannot meet this housing, you know, we cannot meet this level of housing? Because it's all falling on backside, and we are just losing all the countryside. And it does have a damaging effect. The people that live here, you know, their mental health. It's, it's just... That, that is the challenge of the next local plan. I'll come to you just in a, in a second, uh, Councillor Langmans. Um, the site in the, in the report, they, they haven't, at this point, even though they're not required to at this point, uh, found even a 10% gain in biodiversity, which by the time this comes forward, they would be ne needed to. But unfortunately, you can meet those uh, off-site as well by buying biodiversity units elsewhere and uh, and that's that, you know, that that's an unfortunate thing as well um, I'm, I'll go to councillor Langlands and I do want to ask Jasper a question after that yes just a quick question um, chair thank you very much uh, I'm wondering why they have not considered a single way in and a single way out of that site so that it actually does make it a little bit safer in terms of the comings and goings because it's incredibly narrow there. People passing in and out of that actual junction is going to be quite dangerous. I just wonder why there hasn't been a consideration for a one-way route round that area, that estate, when it gets established. Uh, when you 
and I'll ask the question again. Thank you, Councillor. That's, that's quite an inspired suggestion, but, and, and I mean that genuinely. But I, I think we have to recognise that the application in front of us is an outline planning application with access only for determination that the actual layout of the, of, of the scheme could come forward and could address maybe a single, single route through the scheme. But that's not for this council's determination at present. So, sorry, are you telling me then that access uh, and exit are not in the same consideration? I'm confused there because one way or another, once you're in, you've got to get out. A valid point. Uh, it, I'm, I'm thinking more of the internal estate roads um, could be a single route only, but at present the access point is for ingress and egress at the same point. I don't think I was meant to let you speak, Lynn, <laughs> as, you're, as you're being substituted today. You've slipped one in on me there. <laughs> um, Councillor Barnes. Yes, I have i just, we, we've gone off on a route which I think is not possible, which is around countryside, and I agree with everything the officer said on that, uh, nor am I actually denying that this site will eventually be developed, but we haven't yet had a satisfactory answer on how you deem this uh, road to be such a low speed and I'm just wondering whether they're in breach of their own traffic acts. Councillor, we, we have to be guided as planning officers by statutory consultees. Um, you know, Sorry. we have to take their advice. East Sussex Highways are the statutory authority on highways matters. And particularly on highway safety matters. I think we need to recognise that that is their obligation to give us the right advice. And they have done so. Um, even, they, even if they get it wrong? Uh, sir, I can't, I can't make a statement I on think, that. I, I, think what have been, I, I actually think what would have been a better thing for this application, and for the you know, earlier ones, um, and this is a, a difficult learning, is uh, earlier informal presentations to members on it. I actually do, because some of these issues could have been brought forward and pressed, if you like, before an application came forward, and, and the applicant may have respond, been able to respond. I mean, the applicant can't sit here and say, I'm going to move the, the thing, because you'd be dealing with a different application. So that, that's the thing where... But I do think that uh, if I was to say anything was... Uh, uh, could, have, could have been done differently is that as an informal presentation, as has happened before, to... Um, to, to uh, press some of these points which may have improved the access. And in fact, it, it may be that, that uh, some discussions could be had even after this to improve it, you know, to, to ask the applicant to come back and improve it. They may not, <laughs> they might. Um, you know, you can but try. Yeah, Councillor Byrne. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. We grudgingly uh, approved the previous application ba mainly based on the fact that uh, we would lose on appeal and that would be possible. However, this site is not in the DASA. Correct. Do officers feel that that would carry any weight or would we be just as likely still I think to lose Breed, on appeal? I think, I think I want to bring Jasper in, uh, in part on this. Jasper, you, could you... Um, yeah, that, thank you, Chair. Could you, I, I I just, mean, I'd like you to just sort of reflect on, it's, it's part of the planning, part of a legal issue, but the, the question yeah. is, would refusal of this outline application be likely to uh, win or lose at appeal, and what would be the, 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 the risk elements, the, like, the, the risks? Okay. So in terms of what you've got before you, you've got an application that's been presented with no statutory consulty um, objections. Um, however, it, on paper, it's not within the development boundary. However, that being said, um, it is directly adjacent. And as Peter quite eloquently pointed out, with uh, some similar applications in Friot's Way, it's been determined that 
that as a consideration that outweighs its lack of placement within the development boundary, unfortunately, is not something that would sustain a successful defence. So looking at it in the round, refusing it on the basis of its its, its absence from the DASA, as it were, is unlikely to be a reason for refusal that can outweigh all the other considerations you have in front of you, which are no statutory consulty um, objections um, and um, all the other elements that you've heard today, particularly in relation to um, the fact that similar appeals have been lost um, on similar grounds. So m my view is that one element that weighs against the application is unlikely to outweigh all the other elements that weigh in favour in this particular matter. And I've heard a reference to prematurity made um, in, by members. Um, and if I may, I'll just read out um, what the NPPF actually says about prematurity. It says, uh, refusal of planning commissions on grounds of prematurity will seldom be justified where a draft plan has yet to be submitted for an examination before the end of the local planning authority publicity period on the draft plan. Where a planning commission is refused on grounds of prematurity, the local planning authority will need to clearly indicate how granting planning permission for the development concerned would prejudice the outcome of the plan making process. Um, and ultimately, uh, arguments in relation to prematurity are also not likely to help uh, or be successfully sustained in any defence of a, a refusal in this matter. I mean, I'm happy to answer other questions on it, but fundamentally, no, I don't think the council would be able to sustain the defence of a refusal in this matter. Uh, Council Barnes again. If I can ask Jasper through you, Chairman. Um, we are drafting a new local plan. This site presumably will be looked at in the local plan, and we shall decide whether to include it or not. It seems to me that is a prima facie case where we could reserve judgment until we see the outcome uh, of the local well, plan. No, the, I think what, what Jasper just said, and I know this because I've actually won an appeal on prematurity myself, uh, so I'm very, very familiar with this particular concept. Your plan has to be at a sufficiently advanced stage, uh, and that will be beyond, I think it's probably beyond the Regulation 18, it's probably the Regulation 19 yeah. period. So, you know, you have to, it's beyond the sort of draft stage, uh, and when you're in that period, you have a, a reasonable chance at, at uh, prematurity. There aren't many cases won on prematurity, so um, it's we, we are way away from that possibility, and I'm fairly confident that this site has been, you know, has gone past the first stage of consideration in the uh, in the local plan uh, um, sort of um, review. Uh, you know, we can't sort of prejudice that discussion. Uh, so that's that's that. So you're, what you're what you're looking at is an application for access, and what you're, which is outside the boundary and not constrained by being allocated. And therefore, you're looking at what is the the, the um, you're looking at the tilted balance, effectively. Yeah. That is simply what you're looking at. The NWF says that if you don't have a five-year supply, and we have under three years, uh, the, the tilted balance is engaged. So you should, you should. Um, is the NWF speaking, please, not me. All right. You you, you should um, be approving rather than refusing. That's what it says, and that's what we're guided by here. Pretty, um, a pretty uh, difficult pill to swallow on that one. Uh, unfortunately, we, we have at least one. And I would say that if you look at the housing delivery test report, about, I, th I think it's half, the large sites that have been approved in Rother are non-allocated sites, won generally through appeal. Mm, very high number. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Arrington. Sorry, this should have come a lot earlier. I just wanted to check that um, page 87 of the report, point 6.2.3, the email from East Sussex on the 10th of March this year says um, we, need the, we need the RSAs, the road safety audits in particular, to come to a view on the proposals. So did they get those road safety audits between the 10th of March and they're changing their comments which came through on 
the 10th, uh, 20th of March. Just seems within 10 days did they get that information because there's no, I know it's a summary and I haven't got it in front of me, but in the summary of the objection, there's no reference to the road safety audits. Now, road safety audits, the traffic surveys that we were talking about, you know, within 10 days, it seems to be lovely again. Um, yeah. Can you just... I can expand, expand on that. So yeah. the updates that were circulated Tuesday, it was the summary from the Highway Authority saying no objection, and it was like the executive summary I gave you, um, along with the what off-site works were required and conditions and stuff. Um, I believe I did um, say... You know, you can read highway comments in full on the website if yeah. you have time, yeah. Yeah, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so within the full comments, um, there are comments on everything, including the road safety audits. They were provided, I believe, um, as additional information. And I, don't, I, I think this is where the three-day survey reference come in because um, if you look at the original highway reports um, <coughs> that were done early 2022 that was done using modeling um, and it was on that the highway authority requested more more information and to look at other stuff um, which is why this extra survey work get, got done um, and if that uh, if that was done at Easter that must have been the extra stuff that highways requested um, and they have raised no objection that's their official response on the website no objection subject to conditions and these off-site highway works thank you okay where are we we would be happier if we had highways here Explaining why they think this well, is yeah, but not. I'd be happy if I weren't considering the application. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd be happy if I was sitting where you are, not where I am. <laughs> but that's where we are. So let's try and bring it to a conclusion. Once again, that you're usually very good at uh, coming up with a recommendation of some kind. I always rely on you as the... Because you've obviously done something very bad in your life. <laughs> Move approval, Chairman. Oh. Councillor Cammy has uh, moved the recommendation. I should say, are you moving the recommendation with the requirement for a review mechanism uh, and the, the agreement of the applicant to uh, agree with any um, highways improvements to stop traffic in Mayo Lane, and also that these issues be, uh, uh, delegations be with the um, discussions with the chair. Yeah, is that correct? It is. It is. All right. Okay. Well, us agreeing to that, then we can, uh, the strength, if, if, do we have to say yes twice to get the right answer for Mayo Lane? No, it's in both applications. So, yeah, so, you know, it's... If one it's, goes ahead and one doesn't, we're not jeopardising no. what we've suggested. Thank you. Chair, Chairman... Can I suggest that we we also make our decision subject uh, to a check on the legality of this uh, vision display? I really we we seem to be relying on our officers interpreting what in fact has come from highways. I, I think the I think the. Um I think the condition here is subject to uh, it is subject to satisfactory um, visibility space. Is that correct? Am I correct? No, no, no. Because we've now got subsequent stuff to what's in our agenda, which arrived on Tuesday, and that sort of consideration has vanished. We've got a new recommendation in front of us.
Yeah. Show me the report. So read the, the correct recommendation, please. Read the correct recommendation, please. With those with those things that I've already mentioned included. You don't have to read them with included. We, they are included with whatever you read. So, from the update on Tuesday, recommendation, it be resolved to grant outline planning with delegated authority to the delegated officer to confirm the satisfactory resolution of conditions and the completion of a Section 106 agreement and with the review mechanism and Mayo Lane investigations agree agreements, all in, yeah, where, in agreement with, with the chair. Where's the, where's the part about the, where's the, where's, where's the, part about the, uh, the visibility space? I'm sure I read it within there that they had to be. Yeah, so, so that's, yeah, that's further up um, within the update. It's one of the recommended conditions. So suggested conditions from highways. Um, Fairly standard ones, provision and construction of vehicular access, provision of visibility displays measuring 2.4 by 43 metres, um, and then provision of parking, size of parking, which is really for the reserve matters stage. Can you add in the confirmation of the, the, uh, the, the audit? Is that an acceptable thing to add in? Because there does seem to be some degree of concern about the audit. Can, can we add in a condition that that's... Uh, Checked and confirmed, or something. The road safety order. Is that the road safety order? Yeah. So I mean, my worry is quite genuine. Here we are getting a vision display, which, as I understand it, is for relatively low speeds. But I'm not quite clear on why this road cannot be is not being treated as a country lane, which is subject to a 60 mile an hour. Says, they're saying it's, so. It's, it's subject to confirmation. Can we make it? Can it be subject to confirmation of the road audit? Uh, uh, and the, what perhaps 43 metres visibility displays really are appropriate for this. Yes, for uh, this we road. want to make sure that, these, that the speed audit was correct because it has been. That's like the question. If double, it is correct, it's correct. Yeah, check. If it's not, yeah. which will be checking the speeds, it will be checking the distances. Yeah and checking that that speed limit is actually correct in that area, I think. It may well be, but, but we need to, to thoroughly check it. Is that acceptable? Is that acceptable for those conditions to, to, to or those to be included in the conditions? I mean, if it's correct, it's correct, so there's no issue. Yeah? Is that right? I mean, it's a, it's a, it, it may be a, con, a non-condition, but if it is an issue, it should be resolved. Yeah, it's but, due process that the evidence is correct, yeah. so. So, you know, are we, is that, is that, um, all right? Okay. Are you seconding it on that basis, Councillor Barnes? Okay. All right. So does everyone understand what's been read out and what's been said or needs any clarification on that? Okay. I'll ask for a vote on that basis. So you've heard the recommendations with those additional things added in there. Those uh, in favour, whether hesitantly or not, please raise your hands. Seven, yes. Those against? That's three against. So that uh, that is carried, and that takes us to the end of the meeting. And I thank everyone for a very long uh, meeting. No, no, we're missing. There was an abstention. Oh, my apologies. Was there an was there an abstention? No, we're missing one member. Oh, it's council. Yeah, apologies. On that note, we finished the meeting, and I thank all the residents for coming and the applicant as well. So thank you very much. Next site visit. Uh, the next site visit I need to tell you about, well, I think we've probably already said that in the last meeting, is the 11th of April. Thank you very much. Oh, um, yeah, before, just my last committee. Oh, good, is it?